Section 1 of The Plain Speaker. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Bob Gonzalez. The Plain Speaker. Opinions on Books, Men, and Things by William Hazlitt. Section 1. On the Prose Style of Poets. Part 1 do you read or sing if you sing you sing very ill i have but an indifferent opinion of the prose style of poets not that it is not sometimes good nay excellent but it is never the better and generally the worse from the habit of writing verse poets are winged animals and can cleave the air like birds with ease to themselves and delight to the beholders but like those feathered two-legged things when they light upon the ground of prose and matter of fact they seem not to have the same use of their feet what is a little extraordinary there is a want of rhythmus and cadence in what they write without the help of metrical rules like persons who have been accustomed to sing to music they are at a loss in the absence of the habitual accompaniment and guide to their judgment their style halts, totters, is loose, disjointed, and without expressive pauses or rapid movements. The measured cadence and regular sing-song of rhyme or blank verse have destroyed, as it were, their natural ear for the mere characteristic harmony which ought to subsist between the sound and the sense. I should almost guess the author of Waverley to be a writer of ambling verses from the desultory vacillation and want of firmness in the march of his style. There is neither momentum nor elasticity in it. I mean as to the score or effect upon the ear. He has improved since in his other works. To be sure, he has had practice enough. Poets either get into this incoherent, undetermined, shuffling style, made up of unpleasing flats and sharps, of unaccountable starts and pauses, of doubtful odds and ends flirted about like straws in a gust of wind or to avoid it and steady themselves mount into a sustained and measured prose like the translation of ossian's poems or some parts of shaftesbury's characteristics which is more odious still and as bad as being at sea in a calm dr johnson's style particularly in his rambler is not free from the last objection. There is a tune in it, a mechanical recurrence of the same rise and fall in the clauses of his sentences, independent of any reference to the meaning of the text, or progress or inflection of the sense. There is the alternate roll of his cumbrous cargo of words. His periods complete their revolutions at certain stated intervals. Let the matter be longer or shorter, rough or smooth, round or square different or the same this monotonous and balanced mode of composition may be compared to that species of portrait painting which prevailed about a century ago in which each face was cast in a regular and preconceived mould the eyebrows were arched mathematically as if with a pair of compasses and the distances between the nose and mouth the forehead and chin determined according to a foregone conclusion and the features of the identical individual were afterwards accommodated to them how they could horne took used to maintain that no one could write a good prose style who was not accustomed to express himself viva voce or to talk in company he argued that this was the fault of addison's prose and that its smooth equable uniformity and want of sharpness and spirit arose from his not having familiarized his ear to the sound of his own voice, or at least only among his friends and admirers, where there was but little collision, dramatic fluctuation, or sudden contrariety of opinion to provoke animated discussion, and give birth to different intonations and lively transitions of speech. His style, in this view of it, was not indented, nor did it project from the surface. There was no stress laid on one word more than another. It did not hurry on or stop short, or sink or swell with the occasion. It was throughout equally insipid, flowing, and harmonious. It had the effect of a studied recitation, rather than of a natural discourse. 
this would not have happened so the member for old sarum contended had addison laid himself out to argue at his club or to speak in public for then his ear would have caught the necessary modulations of sound arising out of the feeling of the moment and he would have transferred them unconsciously to paper much might be said on both sides of this question but mr took was himself an unintentional confirmation of his own argument for the tone of his written compositions is as flat and unraised as his manner of speaking was hard and dry of the poet it is said by some one that he murmurs by the running brooks a music sweeter than their own on the contrary the celebrated person just alluded to might be said to grind the sentences between his teeth which he afterwards committed to paper and threw out crusts to the critics or bon mots to the electors of westminster as we throw bones to the dogs without altering a muscle and without the smallest tremulousness of voice or eye i certainly so far agree with the above theory as to conceive that no style is worth a farthing that is not calculated to be read out or that is not allied to spirited conversation but i at the same time think the process of modulation and inflection may be quite as complete or more so without the external enunciation and that an author had better try the effect of his sentences on his stomach than on his ear he may be deceived by the last not by the first no person i imagine can dictate a good style or spout his own compositions with impunity in the former case he will flounder on before the sense or words are ready sooner than suspend his voice in air and in the latter he can supply what intonation he pleases without consulting his readers parliamentary speeches sometimes read well aloud but we do not find when such persons sit down to write that the prose style of public speakers and great orators is the best most natural or varied of all others it has almost always either a professional twang a mechanical rounding off or else is stunted and unequal charles fox was the most rapid and even hurried of speakers but his written style halts and creeps slowly along the ground a speaker is necessarily kept within bounds in expressing certain things or in pronouncing a certain number of words by the limits of the breath or power of respiration certain sounds are observed to join in harmoniously or happily with others an emphatic phrase must not be placed where the power of utterance is enfeebled or exhausted etc all this must be attended to in writing and will be so unconsciously by a practised hand or there will be hiatus in manuscriptis the words must be so arranged in order to make an efficient readable style as to come trippingly off the tongue hence it seems that there is a natural measure of prose in the feeling of the subject and the power of expression in the voice as there is an artificial one of verse in the number and coordination of the syllables and i conceive that the trammels of the last do not where they have been long worn greatly assist the freedom or the exactness of the first again in poetry from the restraints in many respects a greater number of inversions or a latitude in the transposition of words is allowed which is not conformable to the strict laws of prose consequently a poet will be at a loss and flounder about for the common or as we understand it natural order of words in prose composition dr johnson endeavoured to give an air of dignity and novelty to his diction by affecting the order of words usual in poetry milton's prose has not only this drawback but it has also the disadvantage of being formed on a classic model it is like a fine translation from the latin and indeed he wrote originally in latin the frequency of epithets and ornaments too is a resource for which the poet finds it difficult to obtain an equivalent a direct or simple prose style seems to him bald and flat and instead of forcing an interest in the subject by severity of description and reasoning he is repelled from it altogether by the absence of those obvious and meretricious allurements by which his senses and his imagination have been hitherto stimulated and dazzled 
thus there is often at the same time a want of splendor and a want of energy in what he writes without the invocation of the muse in vita minerva it is like setting a rope dancer to perform a tumbler's tricks the hardness of the ground jars his nerves or it is the same thing as a painter's attempting to carve a block of marble for the first time the coldness chills him the colorless uniformity distracts him the precision of form demanded disheartens him so in prose writing the severity of composition required damps the enthusiasm and cuts off the resources of the poet he is looking for beauty when he should be seeking for truth and aims at pleasure which he can only communicate by increasing the sense of power in the reader the poet spreads the colors of fancy the illusions of his own mind round every object ad libitum the prose writer is compelled to extract his materials patiently and bit by bit from his subject what he adds of ornament what he borrows from the pencil must be sparing and judiciously inserted the first pretends to nothing but the immediate indulgence of his feelings the last has a remote practical purpose the one strolls out into the adjoining fields or groves to gather flowers the other has a journey to go sometimes through dirty roads and at others through untrodden and difficult ways it is this effeminacy this immersion in sensual ideas or craving after continual excitement that spoils the poet for his prose tasks he cannot wait till the effect comes of itself or arises out of the occasion he must force it upon all occasions or his spirit droops and flags under a supposed imputation of dullness he can never drift with the current but is always hoisting sail and has his streamers flying he has got a striking simile on hand he lugs it in with the first opportunity and with little connection and so defeats his object he has a story to tell he tells it on the first page and where it would come in well has nothing to say like goldsmith who having to wait upon a noble lord was so full of himself and of the figure he should make that he addressed a set speech which he had studied for the occasion to his lordship's butler and had just ended as the nobleman made his appearance the prose ornaments of the poet are frequently beautiful in themselves but do not assist the subject they are pleasant excrescences hindrances not helps in an argument the reason is his embellishments in his own walk grow out of the subject by natural association that is beauty gives birth to kindred beauty grandeur leads the mind on to greater grandeur but in treating a common subject the link is truth force of illustration weight of argument not a graceful harmony in the immediate ideas and hence the obvious and habitual clue which before guided him is gone and he hangs on his patchwork tinsel finery at random in despair without propriety and without effect the poetical prose writer stops to describe an object if he admires it or thinks it will bear to be dwelt on the genuine prose writer only alludes to or characterizes it in passing and with reference to his subject the prose writer is master of his materials the poet is the slave of his style everything showy everything extraneous tempts him and he reposes idly on it he is bent on pleasure not on business he aims at effect at captivating the reader and yet is contented with commonplace ornaments rather than none indeed this last result must necessarily follow where there is an ambition to shine without the effort to dig for jewels in the mine of truth the habits of a poet's mind are not those of industry or research his images come to him he does not go to them and in prose subjects and dry matters of fact and close reasoning the natural stimulus that at other times warms and rouses deserts him altogether he sees no unhallowed visions he is inspired by no daydreams all is tame literal and barren without the nine nor does he collect his strength to strike fire from the flint by the sharpness of collision by the eagerness of his blows he gathers roses he steals colors from the rainbow 
he lives on nectar and ambrosia he treads the primrose path of dalliance or ascends the highest heaven of invention or falls flat to the ground he is nothing if not fanciful i shall proceed to explain these remarks as well as i can by a few instances in point it has always appeared to me that the most perfect prose style the most powerful the most dazzling the most daring that which went the nearest to the verge of poetry and yet never fell over was burke's it has the solidity and sparkling effect of the diamond all other fine writing is like french paste or bristol stones in the comparison burke's style is airy flighty adventurous but it never loses sight of the subject nay is always in contact with and derives its increased or varying impulse from it it may be said to pass yawning gulfs on the unsteadfast footing of a spear still it has an actual resting place and tangible support under it it is not suspended on nothing it differs from poetry as i conceive like the chamois from the eagle it climbs to an almost equal height touches upon a cloud overlooks a precipice is picturesque sublime but all the while instead of soaring through the air it stands upon a rocky cliff clambers up by abrupt and intricate ways and browses on the roughest bark or crops the tender flower the principle which guides his pen is truth not beauty not pleasure but power he has no choice no selection of subject to flatter the reader's idle taste or assist his own fancy he must take what comes and make the most of it he works the most striking effects out of the most uncompromising materials by the mere activity of his mind he rises with the lofty descends with the mean luxuriates in beauty gloats over deformity it is all the same to him so that he loses no particle of the exact characteristic extreme impression of the thing he writes about and that he communicates this to the reader after exhausting every possible mode of illustration plain or abstracted figurative or literal whatever stamps the original image more distinctly on the mind is welcome the nature of his task precludes continual beauty but it does not preclude continual ingenuity force originality he had to treat of political questions mixed modes abstract ideas and his fancy or poetry if you will was engrafted on these artificially and as it might sometimes be thought violently instead of growing naturally out of them as it would spring of its own accord from individual objects and feelings there is a resistance in the matter to the illustration applied to it the concrete and abstract are hardly coordinate and therefore it is that when the first difficulty is overcome they must agree more closely in the essential qualities in order that the coincidence may be complete otherwise it is good for nothing and you justly charge the author's style with being loose vague flaccid and imbecile the poet has been said to make us heirs of truth and pure delight in endless lays not so the prose writer who always mingles clay with his gold and often separates truth from mere pleasure he can only arrive at the last through the first in poetry one pleasing or striking image obviously suggests another the increasing the sense of beauty or grandeur is the principle of composition in prose the professed object is to impart conviction and nothing can be admitted by way of ornament or relief that does not add new force or clearness to the original conception the two classes of ideas brought together by the orator or impassioned prose writer to wit the general subject and the particular image are so far incompatible and the identity must be more strict more marked more determinate to make them coalesce to any practical purpose every word should be a blow every thought should instantly grapple with its fellow there must be a weight a precision a conformity from association in the tropes and figures of animated prose to fit them to their place in the argument and make them tell which may be dispensed with in poetry where there is something much more congenial between the subject matter and the illustration like beauty making beautiful old rhyme 
End of section one. Recording by Bob Gonzalez, Tampa, Florida. Section two of The Plain Speaker. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Bob Gonzalez. The Plain Speaker. Opinions on Books, Men, and Things by William Hazlitt. Section 2. On the Prose Style of Poets. Part 2. What can be more remote, for instance, and at the same time more apposite, more the same, than the following comparison of the English Constitution to the proud keep of Windsor in the celebrated Letter to a Noble Lord? Such are their ideas, such their religion, and such their law. But as to our country and our race, as long as the well-compacted structure of our church and state, the sanctuary, the holy of holies of that ancient law, defended by reverence, defended by power, a fortress at once and a temple, shall stand inviolate on the brow of the British Zion, as long as the British monarchy, not more limited than fenced by the orders of the state, shall, like the proud keep of Windsor, rising in the majesty of proportion, and girt with the double belt of its kindred and coeval towers, as long as this awful structure shall oversee and guard the subjected land, so long the mounds and dikes of the low, fat Bedford level will have nothing to fear from all the pickaxes of all the levellers of France, as long as our sovereign lord the king and his faithful subjects, the lords and commons of this realm, the triple cord which no man can break, the solemn, sworn, constitutional, frank pledge of this nation, the firm guarantees of each other's being, and each other's rights, the joint and several securities, each in its place and order, for every kind and every quality of property and of dignity. As long as these endure, so long the Duke of Bedford is safe, and we are all safe together. The high from the blights of envy and the spoliations of rapacity, the low from the iron hand of oppression and the insolent spurn of contempt. Amen, and so be it, and so it will be. Dum domus inie capitoli immobile saxum acolet, imperiumque pater romanus habebit. Nothing can well be more impracticable to a simile than the vague and complicated idea which is here embodied in one. Yet how finely, how nobly it stands out, in natural grandeur, in royal state, with double barriers round it to answer for its identity, with buttress, frieze, and coin of vantage, for the imagination to make its pendant bed and procreant cradle, till the idea is confounded with the object representing it the wonder of a kingdom and then how striking how determined the descent at one fell swoop to the low fat bedford level poetry would have been bound to maintain a certain decorum a regular balance between these two ideas sterling prose throws aside all such idle respect to appearances and with its pen like a sword sharp and sweet lays open the naked truth the poet's muse is like a mistress whom we keep only while she is young and beautiful durante bene placito the muse of prose is like a wife whom we take during life for better for worse burke's execution like that of all good prose savours of the texture of what he describes and his pen slides or drags over the ground of his subject, like the painter's pencil. The most rigid fidelity and the most fanciful extravagance meet, and are reconciled in his pages. I never pass Windsor, but I think of this passage in Burke, and hardly know to which I am indebted most for enriching my moral sense, that, or the fine picturesque stanza in Gray, from Windsor's heights the expanse below of mead, of lawn, of wood survey, etc. 
I might mention that the so much admired description in one of the India speeches of Hyder Ali's army, I think it is, which now hung like a cloud upon the mountain, and now burst upon the plain like a thunderbolt, would do equally well for poetry or prose. It is a bold and striking illustration of a naturally impressive object. This is not the case with the Abbe Seyes's far-famed pigeonholes, nor with the comparison of the Duke of Bedford to the Leviathan tumbling about his unwieldy bulk in the ocean of royal bounty. Nothing here saves the description but the force of the invective, the startling truth, the vehemence, the remoteness, the aptitude, the perfect peculiarity and coincidence of the illusion. No writer would ever have thought of it but himself. No reader can ever forget it. What is there in common, one might say, between a peer of the realm and that sea-beast of those created hugest that swim the ocean stream. Yet Burke has knit the two ideas together, and no man can put them asunder. No matter how slight and precarious the connection, the length of line it is necessary for the fancy to give out in keeping hold of the object on which it has fastened, he seems to have put his hook in the nostrils of this enormous creature of the crown that empurples all its track through the glittering expanse of a profound and restless imagination. In looking into the iris of last week, I find the following passages in an article on the death of Lord Castlereagh. The splendor of majesty leaving the British metropolis, careering along the ocean, and landing in the capital of the north, is distinguished only by glimpses through the dense array of clouds in which death hid himself, while he struck down to the dust the stateliest courtier near the throne, and the broken train of which pursues and crosses the royal progress wherever its glories are presented to the eye of imagination. The same indefatigable mind, a mind of all work, which thus ruled the continent with a rod of iron, the sword, within the walls of the House of Commons, ruled a more distracted region, with a more subtle and finely tempered weapon, the tongue. And truly, if this was the only weapon his lordship wielded there, where he had daily to encounter, and frequently almost alone, enemies more formidable than Bonaparte, it must be acknowledged that he achieved greater victories than Demosthenes or Cicero ever gained in far more easy fields of strife. Nay, he wrought miracles of speech, outvying those miracles of song which Orpheus is said to have performed, when not only men and brutes, but rocks, woods, and mountains followed the sound of his voice and lyre. But there was a worm at the root of the gourd that flourished over his head, in the brightest sunshine of a court, both perished in a night, and in the morning that which had been his glory and his shadow covered him like a shroud, while the corpse, notwithstanding all his honours and titles and offices, lay unmoved in the place where it fell, till a judgment had been passed upon him which the poorest peasant escapes when he dies in the ordinary course of nature. This, it must be confessed, is very unlike Burke. Yet Mr. Montgomery is a very pleasing poet, and a strenuous politician. The whole is travelling out of the record, and to no sort of purpose. The author is constantly getting away from the impression of his subject, to envelop himself in a cloud of images, which weaken and perplex, instead of adding force and clearness to it. Provided he is figurative, he does not care how commonplace or irrelevant the figures are, and he wanders on, delighted in a labyrinth of words, like a truant schoolboy, who is only glad to have escaped from his task. He has a very slight hold of his subject, and is tempted to let it go for any fallacious ornament of style. How obscure and circuitous is the allusion to the clouds in which death hid himself to strike down the stateliest courtier near the throne! How hackneyed is the reference to Demosthenes and Cicero! And how utterly quaint and unmeaning is the ringing the changes upon Orpheus and his train of men, 
beasts, woods, rocks, and mountains in connection with Lord Castlereagh, but he is better pleased with this classical fable than with the death of the noble peer, and delights to dwell upon it to however little use. So he is glad to take advantage of the scriptural idea of a gourd, not to enforce, but as a relief from his reflections, and points his conclusion with a puling sort of commonplace, that a peasant who dies a natural death has no coroner's inquest to sit upon him. All these are the faults of the ordinary poetical style. Poets think they are bound, by the tenor of their indentures to the muses, to elevate and surprise in every line, and not having the usual resources in common or abstracted subjects, aspire to the end without the means. They make, or pretend, an extraordinary interest where there is none. They are ambitious, vain, and indolent, more busy in preparing idle ornaments, which they take their chance of bringing in somehow or other, than intent on eliciting truths by fair and honest inquiry. It should seem as if they considered prose as a sort of waiting-maid to poetry, that could only be expected to wear her mistress's cast-off finery. Poets have been said to succeed best in fiction, and the account here given may in part explain the reason. That is to say, they must choose their own subject in such a manner as to afford them continual opportunities of appealing to the senses and exciting the fancy. Dry details, abstruse speculations do not give scope to vividness of description, and as they cannot bear to be considered dull, they become too often affected, extravagant, and insipid. I am indebted to Mr. Coleridge for the comparison of poetic prose to the second-hand finery of a lady's maid, just made use of. He himself is an instance of his own observation, and what is even worse, of the opposite fault, an affectation of quaintness and originality. With bits of tarnished lace and worthless frippery, he assumes a sweeping oriental costume, or borrows the stiff dresses of our ancestors, or starts an eccentric fashion of his own. He is swelling and turgid, everlastingly aiming to be greater than his subject, filling his fancy with fumes and vapours in the pangs and throes of miraculous parturition, and bringing forth only stillbirths. He has an incessant craving, as it were, to exalt every idea into a metaphor, to expand every sentiment into a lengthened mystery, voluminous and vast, confused and cloudy. His style is not succinct, but encumbered with a train of words and images that have no practical and only a possible relation to one another, that add to its stateliness, but impede its march. One of his sentences winds its forlorn way obscure over the page like a patriarchal procession with camels laden, wreathed turbans, household wealth, the whole riches of the author's mind poured out upon the barren waste of his subject. The palm tree spreads its sterile branches overhead, and the land of promise is seen in the distance. All this is owing to his wishing to overdo everything to make something more out of everything than it is, or than it is worth. The simple truth does not satisfy him. No direct proposition fills up the moulds of his understanding. All is foreign, far-fetched, irrelevant, laboured, unproductive. To read one of his disquisitions is like hearing the variations to a piece of music without the score. Or, to vary the simile, he is not like a man going a journey by the stage-coach along the high road, but is always getting into a balloon and mounting into the air, above the plain ground of prose. Whether he soars to the Empyrean, or dives to the centre, as he sometimes does, it is equally to get away from the question before him, and to prove that he owes everything to his own mind. His object is to invent, he scorns to imitate. The business of prose is the contrary, but Mr. Coleridge is a poet and his thoughts are free. I think the poet laureate is a much better prose writer. His style has an antique quaintness with a modern familiarity. 
he has just a sufficient sprinkling of archaisms of allusions to old fuller and burton and latimer to set off or qualify the smart flippant tone of his apologies for existing abuses or the ready galling virulence of his personal invectives mr southey is a faithful historian and no inefficient partisan in the former character his mind is tenacious of facts and in the latter his spleen and jealousy prevent the extravagant and erring spirit of the poet from losing itself in fancy's endless maze he stoops to earth at least and prostitutes his pen to some purpose not at the same time losing his own soul and gaining nothing by it and he vilifies reform and praises the reign of george the third in good set terms in a straightforward intelligible practical pointed way he is not buoyed up by conscious power out of the reach of common apprehensions but makes the most of the obvious advantages he possesses you may complain of a pettiness and petulance of manner but certainly there is no want of spirit or facility of execution he does not waste powder and shot in the air but loads his piece takes a level aim and hits his mark one would say though his muse is ambidexter that he wrote prose with his right hand there is nothing awkward or circuitous or feeble in it the words of mercury are harsh after the songs of apollo but this would not apply to him his prose lucubrations are pleasanter than reading his poetry indeed he is equally practised and voluminous in both and it is no improbable conjecture that mr southey may have had some idea of rivalling the reputation of voltaire in the extent the spirit and the versatility of his productions in prose and verse except that he has written no tragedies but wat tyler to my taste the author of rimini and editor of the examiner is among the best and least corrupted of our poetical prose writers in his light but well-supported columns we find the raciness the sharpness and sparkling effect of poetry with little that is extravagant or far-fetched and no turgidity or pompous pretension perhaps there is too much the appearance of relaxation and trifling as if he had escaped the shackles of rhyme a caprice a levity and a disposition to innovate in words and ideas still the genuine master spirit of the prose writer is there the tone of lively sensible conversation and this may in part arise from the author's being himself an animated talker mr hunt wants something of the heat and earnestness of the political partisan but his familiar and miscellaneous papers have all the ease grace and point of the best style of essay writing many of his effusions in the indicator show that if he had devoted himself exclusively to that mode of writing he inherits more the spirit of steel than any man since his time lord byron's prose is bad that is to say heavy laboured and coarse he tries to knock some one down with the butt-end of every line which defeats his object and the style of the author of waverley if he comes fairly into this discussion as mere style is villainous it is pretty plain he is a poet for the sound of names runs mechanically in his ears and he rings the changes unconsciously on the same words in a sentence like the same rhymes in a couplet not to spin out this discussion too much i would conclude by observing that some of the old english prose writers who were not poets are the best and at the same time the most poetical in the favourable sense among these we may reckon some of the old divines and jeremy taylor at the head of them there is a flush like the dawn over his writings the sweetness of the rose the freshness of the morning dew there is a softness in his style proceeding from the tenderness of his heart but his head is firm and his hand is free his materials are as finely wrought up as they are original and attractive in themselves milton's prose style savours too much of poetry and as i have already hinted of an imitation of the latin dryden's is perfectly unexceptionable and a model in simplicity strength and perspicuity for the subjects he treated of end of section two recording by bob gonzalez 
Tampa, Florida. Section 3 of The Plain Speaker. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Martin Giessen. The Plain Speaker. Opinions on Books, Men and Things by William Hazlitt. Section 3 on dreams dr spurzheim in treating of the physiology of the brain has the following curious passage the state of somnambulism equally proves the plurality of the organs this is the state of incomplete sleep wherein several organs are watching it is known that the brain acts upon the external world by means of voluntary motion of the voice and of the five external senses now if in sleeping some organs be active dreams take place if the action of the brain be propagated to the muscles there follow motions if the action of the brain be propagated to the vocal organs the sleeping person speaks indeed it is known that sleeping persons dream and speak others dream speak hear and answer others still dream rise do various things and walk this latter state is called somnambulism that is the state of walking during sleep now as the ear can hear so the eyes may see while the other organs sleep and there are facts quite positive which prove that several persons in the state of somnambulism have seen but always with open eyes there are also convulsive fits in which the patients see without hearing and vice versa some somnambulists do things of which they are not capable in a state of watching and dreaming persons reason sometimes better than they do when awake this phenomenon is not astonishing etc there is here a very singular mixing up of the flattest truisms with the most gratuitous assumptions so that the one being told with great gravity and the other delivered with the most familiar air one is puzzled in a cursory perusal to distinguish which is which this is an art of stultifying the reader like that of the juggler who shows you some plain matter-of-fact experiment just as he is going to play off his capital trick the mind is by this alternation of style thrown off its guard and between wondering first at the absurdity and then at the superficiality of the work becomes almost a convert to it a thing exceedingly questionable is stated so roundly you think there must be something in it the plainest proposition is put in so doubtful and cautious a manner you conceive the writer must see a great deal farther into the subject than you do you mistrust your ears and eyes and are in a fair way to resign the use of your understanding it is a fine style of mystifying again it is the practice with the german school and in particular with dr spurzheim to run counter to common sense and the best authenticated opinions they must always be more knowing than everybody else and treat the wisdom of the ancients and the wisdom of the moderns much in the same supercilious way 
it has been taken for granted generally that people see with their eyes and therefore it is stated in the above passage as a discovery of the author imparted in dreadful secrecy that sleepwalkers always see with their eyes open the meaning of which is that we are not to give too implicit or unqualified an assent to the principle at which modern philosophers have arrived with some pains and difficulty that we acquire our ideas of external objects through the senses the transcendental sophists wish to back out of that as too conclusive and well-defined a position they would be glad to throw the whole of what has been done on this question into confusion again in order to begin de novo like children who construct houses with cards and when the pack is built up shuffle them all together on the table again these intellectual sisyphuses are always rolling the stone of knowledge up a hill for the perverse pleasure of rolling it down again having gone as far as they can in the direction of reason and good sense rather than seem passive or the slaves of any opinion they turn back with a wonderful look of sagacity to all sorts of exploded prejudices and absurdity it is a pity that we cannot let well done alone and that after labouring for centuries to remove ignorance we set our faces with the most wilful officiousness against the stability of knowledge the physiognomical system of doctors gall and spurzheim is full of this sort of disgusting cant we are still only to believe in all unbelief in what they tell us the less credulous we are of other things the more faith we shall have in reserve for them by exhausting our stock of scepticism and caution on such obvious matters of fact as that people always see with their eyes open we shall be prepared to swallow their crude and extravagant theories whole and not be astonished at the phenomenon that persons sometimes reason better asleep than awake i have alluded to this passage because i myself am or used some time ago to be a sleep-walker and know how the thing is in this sort of disturbed unsound sleep the eyes are not closed and are attracted by the light i used to get up and go towards the window and make violent efforts to throw it open the air in some measure revived me or i might have tried to fling myself out i saw objects indistinctly the houses for instance facing me on the opposite side of the street but still it was some time before i could recognize them or recollect where i was that is i was still asleep and the dimness of my senses as far as it prevailed was occasioned by the greater numbness of my memory this phenomenon is not astonishing unless we choose in all such cases to put the cart before the horse for in fact it is the mind that sleeps and the senses so to speak only follow the example the mind dozes and the eyelids close in consequence we do not go to sleep because we shut our eyes i can however speak to the fact of the eyes being open when their sense is shut or rather when we are unable to draw just inferences from it it is generally in the night-time indeed or in a strange place that the circumstance happens 
but as soon as the light dawns on the recollection the obscurity and perplexity of the senses clear up the external impression is made before much in the same manner as it is after we are awake but it does not lead to the usual train of associations connected with that impression for example the name of the street or town where we are who lives at the opposite house how we came to sleep in the room where we are etc all which are ideas belonging to our waking experience and are at this time cut off or greatly disturbed by sleep it is just the same as when persons recover from a swoon and fix their eyes unconsciously on those about them for a considerable time before they recollect where they are would any one but a german physiologist think it necessary to assure us that at this time they see but with their eyes open or pretend that though they have lost all memory or understanding during their fainting fit their minds act then more vigorously and freely than ever because they are not distracted by outward impressions the appeal is made to the outward sense in the instances we have seen but the mind is deaf to it because its functions are for the time gone it is ridiculous to pretend with this author that in sleep some of the organs of the mind rest while others are active it might as well be pretended that in sleep one eye watches while the other is shut the stupor is general the faculty of thought itself is impaired and whatever ideas we have instead of being confined to any particular faculty or the impressions of any one sense and invigorated thereby float at random from object to object from one class of impressions to another without coherence or control the conscious or connecting link between our ideas which forms them into separate groups or compares different parts and views of a subject together seems to be that which is principally wanting in sleep so that any idea that presents itself in this anarchy of the mind is lord of the ascendant for the moment and is driven out by the next straggling notion that comes across it the bundles of thought are as it were untied loosened from a common centre and drift along the stream of fancy as it happens hence the confusion not the concentration of the faculties that continually takes place in this state of half perception the mind takes in but one thing at a time but one part of a subject and therefore cannot correct its sudden and heterogeneous transitions from one momentary impression to another by a larger grasp of understanding thus we confound one person with another merely from some accidental coincidence the name or the place where we have seen them or their having been concerned with us in some particular transaction the evening before they lose and regain their proper identity perhaps half a dozen times in this rambling way nor are we able though we are somewhat incredulous and surprised at these compound creations to detect the error from not being prepared to trace the same connected subject of thought to a number of varying and successive ramifications or to form the idea of a whole we think that mr such a one did so and so then from a second face coming across us like the slides of a magic lantern it was not he but another then someone calls him by his right name 
and he is himself again we are little shocked at these gross contradictions for if the mind was capable of perceiving them in all their absurdity it would not be liable to fall into them it runs into them for the same reason that it is hardly conscious of them when made that which was now a horse a bear a cloud even with a thought the rack dislimbs and makes it indistinct as water is in water the difference so far then between sleeping and waking seems to be that in the latter we have a greater range of conscious recollections a larger discourse of reason and associate ideas in longer trains and more as they are connected one with another in the order of nature whereas in the former any two impressions that meet or are alike join company and then are parted again without notice like the froth from the wave so in madness there is i should apprehend the same tyranny of the imagination over the judgment that is the mind has slipped its cable and single images meet and jostle and unite suddenly together without any power to arrange or compare them with others with which they are connected in the world of reality there is a continual phantasmagoria whatever shapes and colours come together are by the heat and violence of the brain referred to external nature without regard to the order of time place or circumstance from the same want of continuity we often forget our dreams so speedily if we cannot catch them as they are passing out at the door we never set eyes on them again there is no clue or thread of imagination to trace them by in a morning sometimes we have had a dream that we try in vain to recollect it is gone like the rainbow from the cloud at other times so evanescent is their texture we forget that we have dreamt at all and at these times the mind seems to have been a mere blank and sleep presents only an image of death hence has arisen the famous dispute whether the soul thinks always on which mr locke and different writers have bestowed so much tedious and unprofitable discussion some maintaining that the mind was like a watch that goes continually though more slowly and irregularly at one time than another while the opposite party contended that it often stopped altogether bringing the example of sound sleep as an argument and desiring to know what proof we could have of thoughts passing through the mind of which it was itself perfectly unconscious and retained not the slightest recollection i grant we often sleep so sound or have such faint imagery passing through the brain that if we awake by degrees we forget it altogether we recollect our first waking and perhaps some imperfect suggestions of fancy just before but beyond this all is mere oblivion but i have observed that whenever i have been waked up suddenly and not always left to myself to recover from this state of mental torpor i have been always dreaming of something i e thinking according to the tenor of the question let any one call you at any time however fast asleep you may be you make out their voice in the first surprise to be like someone's you were thinking of in your sleep let an accidental noise the falling of something in the next room rouse you up you constantly find something to associate it with or translate it back into the language of your slumbering thoughts 
you are never taken completely at a non-plus summoned as it were out of a state of non-existence it is easy for any one to try the experiment upon himself that is to examine every time he is waked up suddenly so that his waking and sleeping state are brought into immediate contact whether he has not in all such cases been dreaming of something and not fairly caught napping for myself i think i can speak with certainty it would indeed be rather odd to awake out of such an absolute privation and suspense of thought as is contended for by the partisans of the contrary theory it would be a peep into the grave a consciousness of death an escape from the world of non-entity the vividness of our impressions in dreams of which so much has been said seems to be rather apparent than real or if this mode of expression should be objected to as unwarrantable rather physical than mental it is a vapour a fume the effect of the heat oppressed brain the imagination gloats over an idea and dotes at the same time however warm or brilliant the colour of these changing appearances they vanish with the dawn they are put out by our waking thoughts as the sun puts out a candle it is unlucky that we sometimes remember the heroic sentiments the profound discoveries the witty repartees that we have uttered in our sleep the one turn to bombast the others are mere truisms and the last absolute nonsense yet we clothe them certainly with a fancied importance at the moment this seems to be merely the effervescence of the blood or of the brain physically acting it is an odd thing in sleep that we not only fancy we see different persons and talk to them but that we hear them make answers and startle us with an observation or a piece of news and though we of course put the answer into their mouths we have no idea beforehand what it will be and it takes us as much by surprise as it would in reality this kind of successful ventriloquism which we practice upon ourselves may perhaps be in some measure accounted for from the short-sightedness and incomplete consciousness which were remarked above as the peculiar characteristics of sleep the power of prophesying or foreseeing things in our sleep as from a higher and more abstracted sphere of thought need not be here argued upon there is however a sort of profundity in sleep and it may be usefully consulted as an oracle in this way it may be said that the voluntary power is suspended and things come upon us as unexpected revelations which we keep out of our thoughts at other times we may be aware of a danger that yet we do not choose while we have the full command of our faculties to acknowledge to ourselves the impending event will then appear to us as a dream and we shall most likely find it verified afterwards another thing of no small consequence is that we may sometimes discover our tacit and almost unconscious sentiments with respect to persons or things in the same way we are not hypocrites in our sleep the curb is taken off from our passions and our imagination wanders at will when awake we check these rising thoughts and fancy we have them not in dreams when we are off our guard they return securely and unbidden 
we may make this use of the infirmity of our sleeping metamorphosis that we may repress any feelings of this sort that we disapprove in their incipient state and detect ere it be too late an unwarrantable antipathy or fatal passion infants cannot disguise their thoughts from others and in sleep we reveal the secret to ourselves it should appear that i have never been in love for the same reason i never dream of the face of any one i am particularly attached to i have thought almost to agony of the same person for years nearly without ceasing so as to have her face always before me and to be haunted by a perpetual consciousness of disappointed passion and yet i never in all that time dreamt of this person more than once or twice and then not vividly i conceive therefore that this perseverance of the imagination in a fruitless track must have been owing to mortified pride to an intense desire and hope of good in the abstract more than to love which i consider as an individual and involuntary passion and which therefore when it is strong must predominate over the fancy in sleep i think myself into love and dream myself out of it i should have made a very bad endymion in this sense for all the time the heavenly goddess was shining over my head i should never have had a thought about her if i had waked and found her gone i might have been in a considerable taking coleridge used to laugh at me for my want of the faculty of dreaming and once on my saying that i did not like the preternatural stories in the arabian nights for the comic parts i love dearly he said that must be because you never dream there is a class of poetry built on this foundation which is surely no inconsiderable part of our nature since we are asleep and building up imaginations of this sort half our time i had nothing to say against it it was one of his conjectural subtleties in which he excels all the persons i ever knew but i had some satisfaction in finding afterwards that i had bishop atterbury expressly on my side in this question who has recorded his detestation of sinbad the sailor in an interesting letter to pope perhaps he too did not dream yet i dream sometimes i dream of the louvre intus et in cute. i dreamt i was there a few weeks ago and that the old scene returned that i looked for my favourite pictures and found them gone or erased the dream of my youth came upon me a glory and a vision unutterable that comes no more but in darkness and in sleep my heart rose up and i fell on my knees and lifted up my voice and wept and i awoke i also dreamt a little while ago that i was reading the new eloise to an old friend and came to the concluding passage in julia's farewell letter which had much the same effect upon me the words are trop heureuse d'acheter au prix de ma vie le droit de t'aimer toujours sans crime et de te le dire encore une fois avant que je meure i used to sob over this passage twenty years ago and in this dream about it lately 
i seemed to live these twenty years over again in one short moment i do not dream ordinarily and there are people who never could see anything in the new eloise are we not quits end of section three Section 4 of The Plain Speaker. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Kirby Bonds. The Plain Speaker Opinions on Books, Men, and Things by William Hazlitt. On the Conversation of Authors. An author is bound to write well or ill, wisely or foolishly. It is his trade. But I do not see that he is bound to talk any more than he is bound to dance or ride or fence better than other people. Reading, study, silence, thought are a bad introduction to loquacity. It would be sooner learnt of chambermaids and tapsters. He understands the art and mystery of his own profession, which is bookmaking. What right has any one to expect or require him to do more to make a bow gracefully on entering or leaving a room, to make love charmingly, or to make a fortune at all? In all things there is a division of labor. A lord is no less amorous for writing ridiculous love letters, nor a general less successful for wanting wit and honesty. Why, then, may not a poor author say nothing, and yet pass muster? Set him on the top of a stagecoach. He will make no figure. He is mumchance while the slang wit flies about as fast as the dust, with the crack of a whip and the clatter of the horse's heels. Put him in a ring of boxers. He is a poor creature, and of his port as meek as is a maid. Introduce him to a tea party of Milner's girls, and they are ready to split their sides with laughing at him. Over his bottle he is dry. In the drawing room, rude or awkward, he is too refined for the vulgar, too clownish for the fashionable. He is one that cannot make a good leg, one that cannot eat a mess of broth cleanly, one that cannot ride a horse without spur-galling, one that cannot salute a woman and look on her directly. In courts, in camps, in town and country, he is a cipher or a butt. He is good for nothing but a laughing-stock or a scarecrow. You can scarcely get a word out of him for love or money. He knows nothing. He has no notion of pleasure or business, or of what he is going on in the world he does not understand cookery unless he is a doctor in divinity nor surgery nor chemistry unless he is a quidnunc nor mechanics nor husbandry and tillage unless he is as great an admirer of tull's husbandry and has profited as much by it as the philosopher of botley no nor music painting the drama nor the fine arts in general What the deuce is it, then, my good sir, that he does understand, or know anything about? Books! Vens! Books! What books? Not receipt books, Madonna, nor account books, nor books of pharmacy, or the veterinary art. They belong to their respective callings and handicrafts, but books of liberal taste and general knowledge. What do you mean by that general knowledge, which implies not a knowledge of things in general, but an ignorance, by your own account, of every one in particular, or by that liberal taste which scorns the pursuits and acquirements of the rest of the world in succession, and is confined exclusively, by way of excellence, to what nobody takes an interest in but yourself, and a few idlers like yourself? 
Is this what the critics mean by belletters and the study of humanity? Book knowledge in a word, then, is knowledge communicable by books. It is general and liberal for this reason, that it is intelligible and interesting on the bare suggestion that to which anyone feels a romantic attachment merely from finding it in a book must be interesting in itself that which he consistently forms a lively and entire conception of from seeing a few marks and scratches upon paper must be taken from the common nature that which the first time you meet with it seizes upon the attention of a curious speculation must exercise the general faculties of the human mind there are certain broader aspects of society and views of things common to every subject and more or less cognizable to every mind and these the scholar treats and founds his claims to general attention upon them without being chargeable with pedantry the minute descriptions of fishing tackle of baits and flies and walton's complete angler make that work a great favorite with sportsmen the alloy of an amiable luminanti and the modest but touching descriptions of familiar incidents and rural objects scattered through it have made it an equal favorite with every reader of taste and feeling montaigne's essays dilworth's spelling book and fern's treatise on continent remainders are all equally books but not equally adapted for all classes of readers the last two are of no use but to schoolmasters and lawyers but the first is a work we may recommend to any one to read who has ever thought at all or who would learn to think justly on any subject persons of different trades and professions the mechanic the shopkeeper the medical practitioner the artist etc may have great knowledge and ingenuity in their several vocations the details of which will be very edifying to themselves and just as incomprehensible to their neighbors but over and above this professional and technical knowledge they must be supposed to have a stock of common sense and common feelings to furnish subjects for common conversation or to give them any pleasure in each other's company it is to this common stock of ideas spread over the surface or striking its roots into the very center of society that the popular writer appeals and not in vain for he finds readers it is of this finer essence of wisdom and humanity ethereal mold sky tinctured that books of the better sort are made they contain the language of thought it must happen that in the course of time and the variety of human capacity some persons will have struck out finer observations reflections and sentiments than others these they have committed to books of memory have bequeathed as a lasting legacy to posterity and such persons have become standard authors we visit at the shrine drink in some measure of the inspiration and cannot easily breed in another air less pure accustomed to immortal fruits are we to be blamed for this because the vulgar and illiterate do not always understand us the fault is rather in them who are confined and cabined in each in their own particular sphere and compartment of ideas and have not the same refined medium of communication or abstracted topics of discourse bring a number of literary or of illiterate persons together perfect strangers to each other and see which party will make the best company verily we have our reward we have made our election and have no reason to repent it if we were wise but the misfortune is we wish to have all the advantages on one side we grudge and cannot reconcile it to ourselves that any one should go about to cozen fortune without the stamp of learning we think because we are scholars there shall be no more cakes and ale we do not know how to account for it that barmaids should gossip or ladies whisper or bullies roar or fools laugh or knaves thrive without having gone through the same course of select study that we have 
This vanity is preposterous, and carries its own punishment with it. Books are a world in themselves, it is true, but they are not the only world. The world itself is a volume much larger than all the libraries in it. Learning is a sacred deposit from the experience of ages, but it has not put all future experiences on the shelf, nor debarred the common herd of mankind from the use of their hands, tongues, eyes, ears, or understandings. Taste is a luxury for the privileged few, but it would be hard upon those who have not the same standard of refinement in their own minds that we suppose ourselves to have, if this should prevent them from having recourse, as usual, to their old frolics, coarse jokes, and horse-play, and getting through the wear and tear of the world, with such homely sayings and shrewd helps as they may. Happy it is that the mass of mankind eat and drink and sleep and perform their several tasks, and do as they like without caring nothing for our scribblings, our carpings, and our quibbles, and moving on the same in spite of our fine-spun distinctions, fantastic theories, and lines of demarcation, which are like chalk figures drawn on ballroom floors to be danced out before morning. In the field opposite the window where I write this, there is a country girl picking stones. In the one next it, there are several poor women weeding the blue and red flowers from the corn. Farther on are two boys tending a flock of sheep. What do they know or care about what I am writing about them, or ever will? Or what would they be better for it, if they did? Or why need we despise the wretched slave, who, like a lackey from the rise to the set, sweats in the eyes of Phoebus, and all night sleeps in Asylum? Next day after dawn doth writhe, and help a Pyrian to his horse, and follows so the ever-running year with profitable labor to his grave. Is not this life as sweet as writing ephemides? But we put that which flutters the brain idly for a moment, and then is heard no more, in competition with nature, which exists everywhere, and lasts always. We not only underrate the force of nature, but make too much of art, but we also overrate our own accomplishments and advantages derived from art. In the presence of clownish ignorance, or of persons without any great pretensions, real or affected, we are very much inclined to take upon ourselves, as the virtual representation of science, art, and literature, we have a strong itch to show off and do the honors of civilization for all the great men whose works we have ever read, and whose names our auditors have never heard of, as noblemen's lackeys in the presence of their master give themselves airs of superiority over every one else. But though we have read Congreve, a stage coachman may be an overmatch for us in wit. Though we are deep versed in the excellence of Shakespeare's colloquial style, a village beldam may outscold us. Though we have read Machiavel in the original Italian, we may be easily outwitted by a clown, and though we have cried our eyes out over the new Eloise, a poor shepherd lad who hardly knows how to spell his own name may tell his tale under the hawthorn in the dale and prove a more thriving wooer. What then is the advantage we possess over the meanest of the mean? Why this, that we have read Congreve, Shakespeare, Machiavel, and the new Eloise, not that we are to have their wit, genius, shrewdness, or melting tenderness. From speculative pursuits, we must be satisfied with speculative benefits. From reading, too, we learn to write. If we have had the pleasure of studying the highest models of perfection in their kind, and can hope to leave anything ourselves, however slight, to be looked upon as a model, or even a good copy in its way, we may think ourselves pretty well off without engrossing all the privileges of learning and all the blessings of ignorance into the bargain. It has been made a question, 
whether there have not been individuals in common life of greater talents and powers of mind than the most celebrated writers. Whether, for instance, such or such a Liverpool merchant or Manchester manufacturer was not a more sensible man than Montaigne, of a longer reach of understanding than the Viscount of St. Albans. There is no saying, unless some of these illustrious obscure had communicated their important discoveries to the world. But then they would have been authors. On the other hand, there is a set of critics who fall into the contrary error, and suppose that unless the proof of capacity is laid before all the world, the capacity itself cannot exist. Looking upon all those who have not commenced authors, as literally stocks and stones, and worse than senseless things. I remember trying to convince a person of this class that a young lady whom he knew nothing of, the niece of a celebrated authoress, had just the same sort of fine tact and ironical turn in conversation that her relative had shown in her writings when young. The only answer I could get was an incredulous smile, and the observation that when she wrote anything as good as Evelina or Cecilia, she might think herself as clever. I said all I meant was that she had the same family talents, and asked whether he thought that if Miss Burney had not been very clever as a mere girl before she wrote her novels, she would ever have written them. It was all in vain. He still stuck to his written text, and was convinced that the niece was a little fool compared to her aunt at the same age, and if he had known the aunt formerly, he would have had just the same opinion of her. My friend was one of those who have a settled persuasion that it is the book that makes the author, and not the author the book. That's a strange opinion for a great philosopher to hold, but he willfully shuts his eyes to the germs and indistinct workings of genius, and treats them with supercilious indifference, till they stare him in the face through the press, and then take cognizance only of the overt acts and published evidence. This is neither a proof of wisdom nor the way to be wise. It is partly pedantry and prejudice, and partly feebleness of judgment and want of magnanimity. He dare as little commit himself on the character of books as of individuals, till they are stamped by the public. If you show him any work for his approbation, he asks, whose is the subscription? He judges of genius by its shadow, reputation of the metal by the coin. He is just the reverse of another person whom I know, for, as Godwin never allows a particle of merit to any one, till it is acknowledged by the whole world, Coleridge withholds his tribute of applause from every person in whom any mortal but himself can decry the least glimpse of understanding. He would be thought to look farther into a millstone than anybody else. He would have others see with his eyes and take their opinions from him on trust in spite of their senses. The more obscure and defective the indications of merit, the greater his sagacity and candor in being the first to point them out. He looks upon what he nicknames a man of genius, but as the breath of his nostrils and the clay in the potter's hands. If any such inert, unconscious mass tender the fostering care of the modern Prometheus, is kindled into life, begins to see, speak, and move so as to attract the notice of other people, our jealous patronizer of latent worth in that case deserts his intellectual offspring from the moment they can go alone and shift for themselves. But to pass on to our more immediate subject, the conversation of authors is not so good as might be imagined, but such as it is, with rare exceptions, it is better than any other, the proof of which is that when you are used to it, you cannot put up with any other. That of mixed company becomes utterly intolerable. You cannot sit out a common tea and card party, at least, if they pretend to talk at all. 
you are obliged in despair to cut all your old acquaintances who are not au fait on the prevailing and most smartly contested topics, who are not imbued with the high gusto of criticism and virtue. You cannot bear to hear a friend, whom you have not seen for many years, tell you how much yard he sells his laces and tapes, and when he means to move into his next house, when he heard last from his relations in the country, whether trade is alive or dead, or whether Mr. Such-a-one gets to look old, this sort of neighborly gossip will not go down after the high-raised tone of literary conversation. The last may be absurd, very unsatisfactory, and full of turbulence and heartburning, but it has a zest in it which more ordinary topics of news or family affairs do not supply. Neither will the conversation of what we understand by gentlemen of men of fashion do after that of men of letters. It is flat, insipid, stale, and unprofitable in comparison. They talk much about the same things. Pictures, poetry, politics, plays, but they do it worse and at a sort of vapid second hand. They in fact talk out of newspapers and magazines what ice write there. They do not feel the same interest in subjects they affect to handle with an air of fashionable condescension, nor have they the same knowledge of them, if they were ever so much in earnest in displaying it. If it were not for the wine and dessert, no author in his senses would accept an invitation to a well-dressed dinner party, except out of pure good nature and unwillingness to disoblige by his refusal. Persons in high life talk most entirely by rote. There are certain established modes of address and certain answers to them, expected as a matter of course, as a point of etiquette. The studied forms of politeness do not give the greatest possible scope to an exuberance of wit and fancy. The fear of giving offense destroys sincerity and without sincerity there can be no true enjoyment of society, nor unfettered exertion of intellectual activity. Those who have been accustomed to live with the great are hardly considered as conversable persons in literary society. They are not to be talked with any more than puppets or echoes. They have no opinions but what will please, and you naturally turn away as a waste of time and words from attending to a person who just before assented to what you said, and whom you find the moment after, from something that unexpectedly or perhaps by design drops from him, to be of a totally different way of thinking. This bush fighting is not regarded as fair play among scientific men. As fashionable conversation is a sacrifice to politeness, so the conversation of a low life is nothing but rudeness. They contradict you without giving a reason, or, if they do, is a very bad one. Swear, talk loud, repeat the same thing fifty times over, get to calling names, and from words proceed to blows. You cannot make companions of servants, or persons in an inferior station of life. You may talk to them on matters of business, and what they have to do for you, as lords talk to bruisers on subjects of fancy, or country squires to their grooms on horse racing, but out of that narrow sphere, to any general topic, you cannot lead them. The conversation soon flags, and you go back to the old questions, or are obliged to break up the sitting for want of ideas in common. The conversation of authors is better than that of most professions. It is better than that of lawyers, who talk nothing but double entendre, than that of physicians, who talk of the approaching deaths of college, or the marriage of some new practitioner with some rich widow, than that of the divines, who talk of the last place they dined, than that of the university men, who make stale puns, repeat the refuse of London newspapers, and affect an ignorance of Greek and mathematics. It is better than that of players who talk of nothing but the green room, and rehearse the scholar, the wit, or the fine gentleman, like a part of the stage, 
or that of the ladies, who, whatever you talk of, think of nothing, and expect you to think of nothing but themselves, it is not easy to keep up a conversation with women in company. It is thought to be a piece of rudeness to differ from them. It is not quite fair to ask them a reason for what they say. You are afraid of pressing too hard upon them. But where you cannot differ openly and unreservedly, you cannot heartily agree. It is not so in France. There the women talk of things in general, and reason better than the men in this country. They are mistresses of the intellectual foils. They are adepts in all the topics. They know what is to be said for and against all sorts of questions, and are lively and full of mischief into the bargain. They are very subtle. They put you to your trumps immediately. Your logic is more in requisition even than your gallantry. You must argue as well as bow yourself into the good graces of these modern Amazons. What a situation for an Englishman to be placed in! The fault of literary conversation, in general, is its too great tenaciousness. It fastens upon a subject, and will not let it go. It resembles a battle rather than a skirmish, and makes a toil of a pleasure. Perhaps it does this from necessity, from a consciousness of wanting the more familiar graces, the power to sport and trifle, to touch lightly and adorn agreeably. Every view or turn of a question in passant as it arises. Those who have a reputation to lose are too ambitious of shining to please. To excel in conversation, said an ingenious man, one must not always be striving to say good things. To say one good thing, one must say many bad and more indifferent. The topics of metaphysical argument, having got into female society in France, is a proof how much they must have been discussed there generally, and how unfounded the charge is which we bring against them of excessive thoughtlessness and frivolity. The French, taken altogether, are a more sensible, reflecting, and better informed people than the English ones. This desire to shine without the means at hand often makes men silent. The fear of being silent strikes us dumb. A writer, who has been accustomed to take a connected view of a difficult question and to work it out gradually in all its bearings, may be very deficient in that quickness and ease which men of the world, who are in the habit of hearing a variety of opinions, who pick up an observation on one subject and another on another, and who care none about any farther than the passing away of an idle hour, usually acquire. An author has studied a particular point he has read. He has inquired. He has thought a great deal upon it. He is not contented to take it up casually in common with others, to throw out a hint, to propose an objection. He will either remain silent, uneasily and dissatisfied, or he will begin at the beginning and go through it to the end. He is for taking the whole responsibility upon himself. He would be thought to understand the subject better than others, or indeed would show that nobody else knows anything about it. There are always three or four points on which the literary novice, at his first outset in life, fancies he can enlighten every company and bear down all opposition. But he is cured of this quixotic and pugnacious spirit as he goes more into the world where he finds that there are other opinions and other pretensions to be adjusted besides his own. When this asperity wears off, and a certain scholastic precocity is mellowed down, the conversation of men of letters becomes more interesting and instructive. Men of the world have no fixed principles, no groundwork of thought. Mere scholars have too much an object, a theory always in view, to which they rest everything and not unfrequently common sense itself. By mixing with society, they rub off their hardness of manner and impractical offensive singularity, while they retain a greater depth and coherence of understanding. There is more to be learnt from them than from their books. This was a remark of Usso's, and it is a very true one. In the confidence and unreserve of private intercourse, they are more at liberty to say what they think 
to put the subject in different and opposite points of view, to illustrate it more briefly and pithily by familiar expression, by an appeal to individual character and personal knowledge, to bring in the limitation, to obviate misconception, to state difficulties on their own side of the argument, and answer them as well as they can. This would hardly agree with the prudery and somewhat ostentatious claims of authorship. Dr. Johnson's conversation in Boswell's life is much better than his published works, and the fragments of the opinions of celebrated men, preserved in their letters or in anecdotes of them, are justly sought after as invaluable for the same reason. For instance, what a fund of sense there is in Grimm's memoirs. We thus get at the essence of what is contained in their more labored productions, without the affectation or formality. Argument again is the death of conversation, if carried on in a spirit of hostility. But discussion is a pleasant and profitable thing, where you advance and defend your opinions as far as you can, and admit the truth of what is objected against them with equal impartiality. In short, where you do not pretend to set up for an oracle, but freely declare what you really know about any question, or suggest what has struck you as throwing a new light upon it, and let it pass for what it is worth. This tone of conversation was well described by Dr. Johnson, when he said of some party at which he had been present the night before, We had a good talk, sir. As a general rule, there is no conversation worth anything but between friends, or those who agree in the same leading views of a subject. Nothing was ever learnt by either side in a dispute. You contradict one another, will not allow a grain of sense in what your adversary advances, are blind to whatever makes against yourself, dare not look the question fairly in the face, so that you cannot avail yourself even of your real advantages, insist most on what you feel to be the weakest points of your argument, and get more and more absurd, dogmatical, and violent at every moment. Disputes for victory generally end to the dissatisfaction of all parties, and the one recorded in Gil Bias breaks up just as it ought. I once knew a very ingenious man, that whom, to take him by the way of common chit-chat, or fireside gossip, no one could be more entertaining or rational. He would make an apt classical quotation, propose an explanation of a curious passage in Shakespeare's Venus and Adonis, detect a metaphysical error in Locke, would infer the volatility of the French character, from the chapter in Stern, where the Count mistakes the feigned name of Yorick for a proof of his being the identical imaginary character in Hamlet. Et vous êtes Yorick? Thus, confounding words with things twice over, but let a difference of opinion be once hitched in, and it was all over with him. His only object from that time was to shut out common sense, and to be proof against conviction. He would argue the most ridiculous point, such as that there were two original languages, for hours together, nay, through the horologue, you would not suppose it was the same person. He was like an obstinate runaway horse that takes the bit in his mouth and becomes mischievous and unmanageable. He had made up his mind to one thing, not to admit a single particle of what anyone else said, for or against him. It was all the difference between a man drunk and sober, sane or mad. It is the same when he once gets the pen in his hand. He has been trying to prove a contradiction in terms for the last ten years of his life, viz. that the Bourbons have the same right to the throne of France that the Brunswick family have to the throne of England. Many people think there is a want of honesty or a want of understanding in this. There is neither. But he will persist in an argument to the last pinch. He will yield in absurdity to no man. This litigious humor is bad enough, but there is one character still worse, 
that of a person who goes into a company not to contradict, but to talk at you. This is the greatest nuisance in civilized society. Such a person does not come armed to defend himself at all points, but to unsettle, if he can, and throw a slur on all your favorite opinions. If he has a notion that anyone in the room is fond of poetry, he immediately volunteers a contemptuous tirade against the idle jingle of verse. If he suspects you have a delight in pictures, he endeavors, not by fair argument, but by sidewind, to put you out of conceit with so frivolous an art. If you have a taste for music, he does not think much good is to be done by this tickling of the ears. If you speak in praise of a comedy, he does not see the use of wit. If you say you have been to a tragedy, he shakes his head at this mockery of human misery and thinks it ought to be prohibited. He tries to find out beforehand what it is that you take a particular pride or pleasure in, that he may annoy your self-love in the tenderest point, as if he were probing a wound, and make you dissatisfied with yourself and your pursuits for several days afterwards. A person might as well make a practice of throwing out scandalous aspersions against your dearest friends or nearest relations by way of ingratiating himself into your favor. Such ill-timed impertinence is villainous and shows a pitiful ambition in the fool that uses it. The soul of conversation is sympathy. Authors should converse chiefly with authors, and their talk should be of books. When Greek meets Greek, then comes the tug-of-war. There is nothing so pedantic as pretending not to be pedantic. No man can get above his pursuits in life. It is getting above himself, which is impossible. There is a Freemasonry in all things. You can only speak to be understood. But this you cannot be, except by those who are in the secret. Hence an argument has been drawn to supersede the necessity of conversation altogether. For it has been said that there is no use in talking to people of sense, who know all you can tell them, nor to fools who will not be instructed. There is, however, the smallest encouragement to proceed when you are conscious that the more you really enter into a subject, the farther you will be from the comprehension of your hearers, and that the more proofs you give of any position, the more odd and out of the way they will think your notions. Coleridge is the only person who can talk to all sorts of people on all sorts of subjects without caring a farthing for their understanding of one word he says, and he talks only for the admiration and to be listened to. And accordingly, the least interruption puts him out. I firmly believe he would make just the same impression on half his audience if he purposely repeated absolute nonsense with the same voice and manner and inexhaustible flow of undulating speech. In general, wit shines only by reflection. You must take your cue from your company, must rise as they rise and sink as they fall. You must see that your good things, your knowing illusions, are not flung away like pearls in the adage. What a check it is to be asked a foolish question, to find that the first principles are not understood. You are thrown on your back immediately. The conversation is stopped like a country dance by those who do not know the figure. But when a set of adepts, of illuminati, get about a question, it is worth while to hear them talk. They may snarl and quarrel over it, like dogs but they pick it bare to the bone, they masticate it thoroughly. End of section 4 Recording by Kirby Bonds Section 5 of The Plain Speaker This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Kirby Bonds The Plain Speaker 
Opinions on Books, Men, and Things by William Hazlitt. Section 5. On the Same Subject Continued. This was the case formerly at Lamb's, where we used to have many lively skirmishes at their Thursday evening parties. I doubt whether the small coal man's musical parties could exceed them. Oh, for the pen of John Bunkle, to consecrate a petite souvenir to their memory. There was Lamb himself, the most delightful, the most provoking, the most witty and sensible of men. He always made the best pun, and the best remark in the course of the evening. His serious conversation, like his serious writing, is his best. No one ever stammered out such fine, piquant, deep, eloquent things in half a dozen sentences as he does. His jests scald like tears, and he probes a question with a play upon words. What a keen, laughing, hair-brained vein of home-felt truth! What choice venom! How often did we cut into the haunch of letters while we discussed the haunch of mutton on the table! How we skimmed the cream of criticism! How we got into the heart of controversy! How we picked out the marrow of authors! And, in our flowing cups, many a good name, and true, was freshly remembered. Ecollect, the most sage and critical reader, that in all this I was but a guest. Need I go over the names? They were but the old everlasting set, Milton and Shakespeare, Pope and Dryden, Steele and Addison, Swift and Gay, Fielding, Smollett, Stern, Eichardson, Hogarth Prince, Claude's Landscapes, and the cartoons at Hampton Court, and all those things that, having once been, must ever be. The Scotch novels had not then been heard of, so we said nothing about them. In general, we were hard upon the moderns. The author of The Rambler was only tolerated in Boswell's life of him, and it was as much as any one could do to edge in a word for Junius Lanib could not hear Gil Bias. This was a fault. I remember the greatest triumph I ever had was in persuading him, after some years' difficulty, that Fielderfig was better than Smollett. On one occasion he was making out a list of persons famous in history that one would wish to see again, at the head of whom were Pontius Pilate, Sir Thomas Brown, and Dr. Faustus but we blackballed most of his list. But with what a gusto would he describe his favorite authors, Dunn or Sir Philip Sidney, and call their most crabbed passages delicious. He tried them on his palate as epicure tastes olive, and his observations had a smack in them, like a roughness on the tongue. With what discrimination he hinted a defect in what he admired most as in saying that the display of the sumptuous banquet in Paradise Regained was not in true keeping, as the simplest fare was all that was necessary to tempt the extremity of hunger, and stating that Adam and Eve in Paradise Lost were too much like married people. He has furnished many a text to Coleridge to preach upon, and there was no fuss or cant about him, nor were his sweets or his sours ever diluted with one particle of affection. I cannot say that the party at Lamb's were all of one description. There were honorary members, lay brothers. Wit and good fellowship was the motto inscribed over the door when a stranger came in. It was not asked, has he written anything? We were above that pedantry, but we waited to see what he could do. If he could take a hand at Piquette, he was welcome to sit down. If a person liked anything, if he took snuff heartily, it was insufficient. He would understand by analogy the pungency of other things besides Irish blackguard or Scottish rapee. A character was good anywhere in a room or on paper, but we abhorred insipidity, affection, and fine gentlemen. There was one of our party, who never failed to mark two for his knob at cribbage, and he was thought no mean person. 
This was Ned Phillips, and a better fellow in his way breathes not. There was, who asserted, some incredible matter of fact as likely a paradox, and settled all the controversies by an ipse dictate, a fiat of his will, hammering out many a hard theory on the anvil of his brain, the Baron Munchausen of politics and practical philosophy. There was Captain Burney, who had you at an advantage by never understanding you. There was Jem White, the author of Falstaff's letters, who the other day left this dull world to go in search of more kindred spirits, turning like the latter end of a lover's lute. There was Ayrton, who sometimes dropped in, the wheel honeycomb of our set with Mrs. Ailes, who, being of a quiet turn, loved to hear a noisy debate. An utterly uninformed person might have supposed this a scene of vulgar confusion and uproar, while the most critical question was pending, while the most difficult problem in philosophy was solving, Phillips cried out, That's game! And Martin Burney muttered a quotation over the last remains of a veal pie at a side table. Once and once only, the literary interest overcame the general. For Coleridge was riding the high German horse, and demonstrating the categories of the transcendental philosophy to the author of The Road to Ruin, who insist on his knowledge of German and German metaphysics, having read the critique of pure reason in the original, my dear Holcroft, said Coleridge, in a tone of infinitely provoking conciliation, you really put me in mind of a sweet, pretty German girl, about fifteen, that I met with in the Hartz forest in Germany, and who one day, as I was reading the limits of the knowable and the unknowable, the profoundest of all his works, with great attention, came behind my chair, and leaning over, said, What you read, Kant? Why, I that am a German board don't understand him. This was too much to bear, and Holcroft, starting up, called Tut in no measured tone. Mr. Coleridge, you are the most eloquent man I ever met with, and the most troublesome with your eloquence. Phillips held the cribbage peg that was to mark him game, suspended in his hand, and the whist table was silent for a moment. I saw Holcroft downstairs, and on coming to the landing place at Mitre Court, he stopped me to observe that he thought Mr. Coleridge a very clever man with a great command of language but that he feared he did not always affix very precise ideas to the words he used. After he was gone, we had our laugh out, and went on with the argument on the nature of Eason, the imagination, and the will. I wish I could find a publisher for it. It would make a supplement to the Biographia Literaria, in a volume and a half octavo. Those days are over. An event, the name of which I wish never to mention, broke up our party like a bombshell thrown into the room, and now we seldom meet like angels' visits, short and far between. There is no longer the same set of persons, nor of associations. Lamb does not live where he did. By shifting his abode, his notions seem less fixed. He does not wear his old snuff-colored coat and breeches. It looks like an alteration in his style. An author and a wit should have a separate costume, a particular cloth. He should present something positive and singular to the mind, like Mr. Deuce of the museum. Our faith in the religion of letters will not bear to be taken to pieces and put together again by caprice or accident. Lay Hunt goes there sometimes. He has a Venus spirit about him and a tropical blood in his veins, but Lie is better at his own table. He has a great flow of pleasantry and delightful animal spirits, but his hits do not tell like lambs. You cannot repeat them the next day. He requires not only to be appreciated, but to have a select circle of admirers and devotees, to feel himself quite at home. 
he sits at the head of a party with great gaiety and grace, has an elegant manner and turn of features, is never at a loss aliquando sufflaminatus erat, has a continual sportive sallies of wit or fancy, tells a story capitally, mimics an actor or an acquaintance to admiration, laughs with great glee and good humor at his own and other people's jokes, understands the point of equivoque or an observation immediately, has a taste and knowledge of books, of music, of medals, manages an argument adroitly, is genteel and gallant, and has a set of by-phrases and quaint allusions always at hand to produce a laugh. If he has a fault, it is that he does not listen so well as he speaks, is impatient of interruption, and is fond of being looked up to without considering by whom. I believe, however, he has pretty well seen the folly of this neither in his ready display of personal accomplishment and variety of resources and advantage to his writing, they sometimes present a desultory and slipshod appearance, owing to this very circumstance. The same things that tell, perhaps, best to a private circle round the fireside are not always intelligible to the public, nor does he take pains to make them so. He is too confident and secure of his audience. That, which may be entertaining enough with the assistance of a certain liveliness of manner, may read very flat on paper, because it is abstracted from all the circumstances that had set it off to advantage. A writer should recollect that he has only to trust to the immediate impression of the words, like a musician who sings without the accompaniment of an instrument. There is nothing to help out or slubber over, the defects of the voice in the one case, nor of the style in the other. The reader may, if he pleases, get a very good idea of Leigh Hunt's conversation from a very agreeable paper he has lately published, called The Indicator, than which nothing can be more happily conceived or executed. The art of conversation is the art of hearing as well as of being heard. Authors in general are not good listeners. Some of the best talkers are, on this account, the worst company, and some who are very indifferent but very great talkers are as bad. It is sometimes wonderful to see how a person who has been entertaining or tiring a company by the hour together drops his countenance as if he had been shot or had been seized with a sudden lockjaw, the moment any one interposes a single observation. The best converser I know is, however, the best listener. I mean Mr. Northcote, the painter. Painters, by their profession, are not bound to shine in conversation. They shine the more. He lends his ear to an observation as if you had brought him a piece of news, and enters into it with as much avidity and earnestness as if it interested himself personally. If he repeats an old remark or story, it is with the same freshness and point as for the first time. It always arises out of the occasion, and has the stamp of originality. There is no parroting of himself. His look is a continual ever-varying history piece of what passes in his mind. His face is a book. There need no marks of interjection or interrogation to what he says. His manner is quite picturesque. There is an excess of character and naivete that never tires. His thoughts bubble up and sparkle like beads on old wine. The Fund of Anecdote the collection of curious particulars is enough to set any common retailer of jests that dines out every day. But these are not strung together like a row of galley slaves, but are always introduced to illustrate some argument or to bring out some fine distinction of character. The mix of spleen adds to the sharpness of the point, like poisoned arrows. Mr. Northcote enlarges with enthusiasm on the old painters, and tells good things of the new. The only thing he ever vexed me in 
was his liking in the catalogue Raisonny. I had almost as soon hear him talk of Titian's pictures, which he does with tears in his eyes and looking just like them, as see the originals. And I had rather hear him talk of Sir Joshua's than see them. He is the last of that school who knew Goldsmith and Johnson. How finely he describes Pope! His elegance of mind, his figure, his character were not unlike his own. He does not resemble a modern Englishman, but puts one in mind of a Roman cardinal or a Spanish inquisitor. I never ate or drank with Mr. Northcote, but I have lived on his conversation with undiminished relish ever since I can remember, and when I leave it, I come out into the street with my feelings lighter and more ethereal than I have at any other time. One of his tete-a-tetes would at any time make an essay, but he cannot write himself because he loses himself in the connecting passages, is fearful of the effect, and wants the habit of bringing his ideas into focus or view. A lens is necessary to collect the diverging rays, the refracted and the broken angular lights of conversation on paper. Contradiction is half the battle in talking, the being startled by what others say, and having to answer on the spot. You have to defend yourself, paragraph by paragraph, parentheses within parentheses. Perhaps it might be supposed that a person who excels in conversation and cannot write would better succeed in dialogue. But the stimulus, the immediate irritation, would be wanting, and the work would read flatter than ever from not having the very thing it pretended to have. Lively sallies and connected discourse are very different things. There are many persons of that impatient and restless turn of mind that they cannot wait a moment for a conclusion or follow up the thread of any argument. In the hurry of conversation, their ideas are somehow huddled into sense, but in the intervals of thought, leave a great gap between. Montesquieu said he often lost an idea before he could find words for it. Yet he dictated, by way of saving time, to an amanuensis. This last is, in my opinion, a vile method, a solecism in authorship. Home took, among other paradoxes, used to maintain that no one could write in good style who was not in the habit of talking and hearing the sound of his own voice. He might as well have said that no one could relish a good style without reading it aloud, as we find common people do to assist their apprehension. But there is a method of trying periods on the ear, or weighing them with the scales of the breath, without any articulate sound. Authors, as they write, may be said to Hear a sound so fine, there's nothing lives twixt it and silence. Even musicians generally compose in their heads. I agree that no style is good that is not fit to be spoken or read aloud with effect. This holds true not only of emphasis and cadence, but also with regard to natural idiom and colloquial freedom. Stern's was in this respect the best style that ever was written. You fancy that you hear the people talking. For a contrary reason, no college man writes a good style, or understands it when written. Fine writing is with him all verbiage and monotony, a translation into classical centos or hexameter lines. That which I have just mentioned is among many instances that I could give of ingenious absurdities advanced by Mr. Took in the heat and pride of controversy. A person who knew him well, and greatly admired his talents, said of him that he never, to his recollection, heard him defend an opinion which he thought right, or in which he believed to be himself sincere. He indeed provoked his antagonists into the toils by the very extravagance of his assertions, and the teasing sophistry which he rendered them plausible. 
His temper was prompter to his skill. He had the manners of a man of the world, with great scholastic resources. He flung everyone else off guard, and was himself immovable. I never knew anyone who did not admit his superiority in this kind of warfare. He put a full stop to one of Coleridge's long-winded prefatory apologies for his youth and inexperience by saying abruptly, Speak up, young man! and at another time silenced a learned professor by desiring an explanation of a word which the other frequently used, and which, he said, he had been many years trying to get at the meaning of. The copulative is. He was the best intellectual fencer of his day. He made strange havoc of Fuseli's fantastic hieroglyphics, violent humors, and oddity of dialect. Curran, who was sometimes of the same party, was lively and animated in convivial conversation, but dull in argument, nay, adverse to anything like reasoning or serious observation, and had the worst taste I ever knew. His favorite critical topics were to abuse Milton's Paradise Lost and Romeo and Juliet, Indeed, he confessed a want of sufficient acquaintance with books when he found himself in literary society in London. He and Sheridan once dined at John Kimball's with Mrs. Inchbald and Mary Wollstonecroft, when the discourse almost wholly turned on love. From noon to dewy eve, a summer's day. What a subject! What speakers and what hearers! What would I not give to have been there? had I not learned it all from the bright eyes of Amaryllis, and may one day make a table talk of it. Peter Pindar was rich in anecdote and grotesque humor, and profound in technical knowledge both of music, poetry, and painting. But he was gross and overbearing. Wordsworth sometimes talks like a man inspired on subjects of poetry, his own out of the question. Coleridge, well, on every subject, and Godwin on none. To finish this subject, Mrs. Montague's conversation is as fine-cut as her features, and I like to sit in the room with that sort of coronet face. What she says leaves a flavor, like fine green tea. Hunt's is like champagne, and Northcote's like anchovy sandwiches. Hayden's is like a game at trap ball, lambs like snapdragon, and my own, if I do not mistake the matter, is not very much like a game of nine pins. One source of the conversation of authors is the character of other authors, and on that they are rich indeed. What things they say, what stories they tell of one another, more particularly of their friends. If I durst only give some of these confidential communications, the reader may think the foregoing a specimen of them, but indeed he is mistaken. I do not know of any greater impertinence than for an obscure individual to set about pumping a character of celebrity. Bring him to me, said a Dr. Trokin, speaking of Rousseau, that I may see whether he has anything in him. Before you can take measure of the capacity of others, you ought to be sure that they have not taken measure of yours. They may think you a spy on them, and may not like their company. If you really want to know whether another person can talk well, begin by saying a good thing yourself, and you will have a right to look for a rejoinder. The best tennis players, says Sir Fopling Flutter, make the best matches, for wit is like a rest held up at tennis, which men do the best with the best players. We hear it often said of a great author or a great actress that they are very stupid people in private, but he was a fool that said so. Tell me your company, and I'll tell you your manners. In conversation, as in other things, the action and reaction should bear a certain proportion to each other. Authors may, in some sense, be looked upon as foreigners, who are not naturalized even in their native soil. Lamb once came down into the country to see us. 
he was like the most capricious poet ovid among the goths the country people thought him an oddity and did not understand his jokes it would be strange if they had for he did not make any while he stayed but when we crossed the country to oxford then he spoke a little he and the old colleges were hail fellow well met and in the quadrangles he walked gowned there is a character of a gentleman so there is a character of a scholar which is no less easily recognized the one has an air of books about him as the other has of good breeding the one wears his thoughts as the other does his clothes gracefully and even if they are a little old-fashioned they are not ridiculous they have had their day the gentleman shows by his manner that he has been used to respect from others the scholar that he lays claim to self-respect and to a certain independence of opinion the one has been accustomed to the best company the other has passed his time in cultivating an intimacy with the best authors there is nothing forward or vulgar in the behavior of the one nothing shrewd or petulant in the observations of the other as if he should astonish the bystanders or was astonished himself at his own discoveries good taste and good sense like common politeness are or are supposed to be matters of course one is distinguished by an appearance of marked attention to every one present the other manifests an habitual air of abstraction and absence of mind the one is not an upstart with all the self-important airs of the founder of his own fortune nor the other a self-taught man with the repulsive self-sufficiency which arises from an ignorance of what hundreds have known before him we must excuse perhaps a little conscious family pride in the one and a little harmless pedantry in the other as there is a class of the first character which sinks into the mere gentleman that is which has nothing but this sense of respectability and propriety to support it so the character of a scholar not unfrequently dwindles down into the shadow of a shade till nothing is left of it but the mere bookworm there is often something amiable as well as enviable in the last character i know one such instance at least the person i mean has an admiration for learning if he is only dazzled by its light he lives among old authors if he does not enter much into their spirit he handles the covers and turns over the pages and is familiar with the names and dates he is busy and self-involved he hangs like a film and cobweb upon letters or is like the dust upon the outside of knowledge which should not be rudely brushed aside he follows learning as its shadow but as such he is respectable he browses on the husk and leaves of books as the young fawn browses on the bark and leaves of trees such a one lives all his life in a dream of learning and has never once had his sleeps broken by a real sense of things he believes implicitly in genius truth virtue liberty because he finds the names of these things in books he thinks that love and friendship are the finest things imaginable both in practice and theory the legend of good woman to him is no fiction when he steals from the twilight of his cell the scene breaks upon him like an illuminated missile and all the people he sees are but so many figures in a camera obscura he reads the world like a favorite volume only to find beauties in it or like an edition of some old work which he is repairing for the press only to make emendations in it and correct the errors that have inadvertently slipped in he and his dog tray are much the same honest simple-hearted faithful and affectionate creatures if tray could but read his mind cannot take the impression 
of vice. But the gentleness of his nature turns gall to milk. He would not hurt a fly. He draws the picture of mankind from the guileless simplicity of his own heart, and when he dies, his spirit will take its smiling leave without having ever had an ill thought of others or the consciousness of one in itself. End of section 5. Recording by Kirby Bonds. Section 6 of The Plain Speaker. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Dave Gower. The Plain Speaker. Opinions on Books, Men, and Things by William Hazlitt. Section 6. On Reason and Imagination. I hate people who have no notion of anything but generalities and forms and creeds and naked propositions, even worse than I dislike those who cannot for the soul of them arrive at the comprehension of an abstract idea. There are those, even among philosophers, who, deeming that all truth is contained within certain outlines and common topics, if you proceed to add color or relief from individuality, protest against the use of rhetoric as an illogical thing, and if you drop a hint of pleasure or pain, as ever entering into this breathing world, raise a prodigious outcry against all appeals to the passions. It is, I confess, strange to me that men who pretend to more than usual accuracy in distinguishing and analyzing should insist that in treating of human nature, of moral good and evil, the nominal differences are alone of any value, or that in describing the feelings and motives of men, anything that conveys the smallest idea of what those feelings are in any given circumstances, or can by parity of reason ever be in any others, is a deliberate attempt at artifice and delusion, as if a knowledge or representation of things as they really exist, rules and definitions apart, was a proportionable departure from the truth. They stick to the table of contents, and never open the volume of the mind. They are for having maps, not pictures of the world we live in. As much as to say that a bird's eye view of things contains the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. If you want to look for the situation of a particular spot, they turn to a pasteboard globe on which they fix their wandering gaze, and because you cannot find the object of your search in their bald abridgments, tell you there is no such place, or that it is not worth inquiring after. They had better confine their studies to the celestial sphere and the signs of the zodiac, for they will meet with no petty details to boggle at or contradict their vague conclusions. Such persons would make excellent theologians, but are very indifferent philosophers. To pursue this geographical reasoning a little farther, they may say that the map of a country or shire, for instance, is too large and conveys a disproportionate idea of its relation to the whole. And we say that their map of the globe is too small, and conveys no idea of it at all. Quote, I the world's volume, our Britain shows as of it, but not in it. In a great pool a swan's nest. End quote. But is it really so? What, the country is bigger than the map at any rate. The representation falls short of the reality by a million degrees, and you would omit it altogether in order to arrive at a balance of power in the non-entities of the understanding and call this keeping within the bounds of sense and reason, and whatever does not come from within those self-made limits, is to be set aside as frivolous or monstrous. But there are more things between heaven and earth than were ever dreamt of in this philosophy. They cannot get them all in of the size of life, and therefore they reduce them on a graduated scale, till they think they can. So be it for certain necessary and general purposes, and in compliance with the infirmity of human intellect, but at other times, let us enlarge our conceptions to the dimensions of the original objects, nor let it be pretended that we have outraged truth and nature, because we have encroached on your diminutive mechanical standard. There is no language, no description that can strictly come up with the truth and force of reality. All we have to do is to guide our descriptions and conclusions by the reality. A certain proportion must be kept. We must not invert the rules of moral perspective. Logic should enrich and invigorate its decisions by the use of imagination, 
as rhetoric should be governed by its application and guarded from abuse by the checks of the understanding. Neither, I apprehend, is sufficient alone. The mind can conceive only one or a few things in their integrity. If it proceeds to more, it must have recourse to artificial substitutes, and judge by comparison merely. In the former case, it may select the least worthy, and so distort the truth of things by giving a hasty preference. In the latter, the danger is that it may refine and abstract so much as to attach no idea at all to them corresponding with their practical value or their influence on the minds of those concerned with them. Men act from individual impressions, and to know mankind, we should be acquainted with nature. Men act from passion, and we can only judge of passion by sympathy. Persons of the dry and husky class above spoken of often seem to think even nature itself an interloper on their flimsy theories. They prefer the shadows in Plato's cave to the actual objects without it. They consider men as nice in an air pump, fit only for their experiments, and do not consider the rest of the universe, or all the mighty world of eye and ear, as worth any notice at all. This is making short, but not sure work. Truth does not lie in vacuo, any more than in a well. We must improve our concrete experience of persons and things into the contemplation of general rules and principles, but without being grounded in individual facts and feelings, we shall end as we begun, in ignorance. It is mentioned in a short account of the last moments of Mr. Fox that the conversation at the house of Lord Holland, where he died, turning upon Mr. Burke's style, that noble person objected to it as too gaudy and meretricious, and said that it was more profuse of flowers than fruit, on which Mr. Fox observed that, though this was a common objection, it appeared to him altogether an unfounded one, that, on the contrary, the flowers often concealed the fruit beneath them, and the ornaments of style were rather an hindrance than an advantage to the sentiments they were meant to set off. In confirmation of this remark, he offered to take down the book and translate a page anywhere into his own plain, natural style, and by his doing so, Lord Holland was convinced that he had often missed the thought of having his attention drawn off to the dazzling imagery. Thus, people continually find fault with the colors of style as incompatible with the truth of the reasoning, but without any foundation whatever. If it were a question about the figures of two triangles, and any person were to object that one triangle was green and the other yellow, and to bring this to bear upon the acuteness or obtuseness of the angles, it would be obvious to remark that the color had nothing whatever to do with the question. But in a dispute whether two objects are colored alike, the discovery that one is green and the other yellow is fatal. So, with respect to moral truth as distinct from mathematical, whether a thing is good or evil, depends on the quantity of passion, of feeling, of pleasure and pain connected with it, and with which we must be made acquainted in order to come to a sound conclusion, and not in the inquiry whether it is round or square. Passion, in short, is the essence, the chief ingredient in moral truth, and the warmth of passion is sure to kindle the light of imagination on the objects around it. The words that glow are almost inseparable from the thoughts that burn. Hence, Logical reason and practical truth are disparates. It is easy to raise an outcry against violent invectives, to talk loud against extravagance and enthusiasm, to pick a quarrel with everything but the most calm, candid, and qualified statements of fact, but there are enormities to which no words can do adequate justice. Are we then, in order to form a complete idea of them, to omit every circumstance of aggravation, or to suppress every feeling of impatience that arises out of the details, lest we should be accused of giving way to the influence of prejudice and passion? This would be to falsify the impression altogether, to misconstrue reason, and fly in the face of nature. Suppose, for instance, that in the discussions on the slave trade, a description to the life was given of the horrors of the middle passage, as it was termed that you saw the manner in which thousands of wretches, year after year, were stowed together in the hold of a slave ship, without air, without light, without food, without hope, so that what they suffered in reality was brought home to you in imagination, till you felt in sickness of heart as one of them. Could it be said that this was a prejudging of the case, that your knowing the extent of the evil disqualified you from pronouncing sentence upon it, and that your disgust and abhorrence were the effects of a heated imagination? No. Those evils that inflame the imagination and make the heart sick ought not to leave the head cool. This is the very test and measure of the degree of the enormity, 
and it involuntarily staggers and appalls the mind. If it were a common iniquity, if it were slight and partial, or necessary, it would not have this effect. But it very properly carries away the feelings and, if you will, overpowers the judgment, because it is a mass of evil so monstrous and unwarranted as not to be endured even in thought. A man on the rack does not suffer the less because the extremity of anguish takes away his command of feeling and attention to appearances. A pang inflicted on humanity is not the less real because it stirs up sympathy in the breast of humanity. Would you tame down the glowing language of justifiable passion into that of cold indifference or self-complacent skeptical reasoning, and thus take out the sting of indignation from the minds of the spectator? Not, surely, till you have removed the nuisance by the levers that strong feelings alone can set at work, and have thus taken away the pang of suffering that caused it. Or say that the question were proposed to you, whether on some occasion you should thrust your hand into the flames, and were coolly told that you were not at all to consider the pain and anguish it might give you, nor suffer yourself to be led away by any such idle appeals to natural sensibility, but to refer the decision to some abstract technical ground of propriety. Would you not laugh in your adviser's face? Oh, no. Where our own interests are concerned, or where we are sincere in our professions of regard, the pretended distinction between sound judgment and lively imagination is quickly done away with. But I would not wish a better or more philosophical standard of morality than that we should think and feel towards others, as we should if it were our own case. If we look for a higher standard than this, we should not find it but shall lose the substance for the shadow. Again, suppose an extreme or individual instance is brought forward in any general question, as that of the cargo of six slaves that were thrown overboard as so much live lumber by the captain of a guinea vessel in the year 1775, which was one of the things that first drew the attention of the public to this nefarious traffic, or the practice of suspending contumacious negroes in cages to have their eyes pecked out and to be devoured alive by birds of prey. Does this form no rule, because the mischief is solitary or excessive? The rule is absolute, for we feel that nothing of the kind could take place or be tolerated for an instant in any system that was not rotten at the core. If such things are ever done in any circumstances with impunity, we know what must be done every day under the same sanction. It shows that there is an utter deadness to every principle of justice or feeling of humanity, and where this is the case, we may take out our tables of abstraction and set down what is to follow through every gradation of petty, galling, vexation, and wanton, unrelenting cruelty. A state of things where a single instance of the kind can possibly happen without exciting general consternation ought not to exist for half an hour. The parent, hydra-headed injustice, ought to be crushed at once with all its viper brood, practices the mention of which make the flesh creep and that affront the light of day ought to be put down the instant they are known, without inquiry and without appeal. There was an example of eloquent moral questioning connected to this subject given in the work just referred to, which was not the less solid and profound because it was produced by a burst of strong personal and momentary feeling. It is what follows, quote, The name of a person having been mentioned in the presence of Nambana, a young African chieftain, who was understood by him to have publicly asserted something very degrading to the general character of Africans, he broke out into violent and vindictive language. He was immediately reminded of the Christian duty of forgiving his enemies, upon which he answered nearly in the following words, If a man should rob me of my money, I can forgive him. If a man should shoot at me or try to stab me, I can forgive him. If a man should sell me and all my family to a slave ship, so that we should pass all the rest of our days in slavery in the West Indies, I can forgive him. But, added he, rising from his seat with much emotion, if a man takes away the character of the people of my country, I can never forgive him. Being asked why he would not extend his forgiveness to those who took away the character of the people of his country, he answered, if a man should try to kill me or sell me and my family for slaves, he would do an injury to as many as he might kill or sell. But if anyone takes away the character of black people, that man injures black people all over the world. And when he has once taken away their character, there is nothing which he may not do to black people ever after. That man, for instance, will beat black men and say, Oh, it is only a black man. Why should I not beat him? 
that man will make slaves of black people, for when he has taken away their character, he will say, Oh, they are only black people. Why should I not make them slaves? That man will take all the people of Africa, if he can catch them. And if you ask him, But why do you take away all these people? He will say, Oh, they are only black people. They are not like white people. Why should I not take them? That is the reason why I cannot forgive the man who takes away the character of the people of my country. End quote. I conceive more real light and vital heat is thrown into the argument by this struggle of natural feeling to relieve itself from the weight of a false and injurious imputation than would be added to it by twenty volumes of tables and calculations of the pros and cons of right and wrong, of utility and inutility, in Mr. Bentham's handwriting. In allusion to this celebrated person's theory of morals, I will here go a step further, and deny that the dry calculation of consequences is the sole and unqualified test of right and wrong, for we are to take into account, as well, the reaction of these consequences upon the mind of the individual and the community. In morals, the cultivation of a moral sense is not the last thing to be attended to, nay, it is the first, almost the only unsophisticated or spirited remark that we meet with in Paley's moral philosophy, is one which is always to be found in Tucker's Light of Nature, namely, that in dispensing charity to common beggars, we are not to consider so much the good it may do to the object of it, as the harm it will do to the person who refuses it. A sense of compassion is involuntarily excited by the immediate appearance of distress, and a violence and injury is done to the kindly feelings by withholding the obvious relief, the trifling pittance in our power. This is a remark, I think, worthy of the ingenious and amiable author from whom Paley borrowed it. So with respect to the atrocities committed in the slave trade, it could not be set up as a doubtful plea in their favor, that the actual and intolerable sufferings inflicted on the individuals were compensated by certain advantages in a commercial and political point of view. In a moral sense, they cannot be compensated. They hurt the public mind. They harden and scar the natural feelings. The evil is monstrous and palatable. The pretended good is remote and contingent. In morals, as in philosophy, de non apparentibus et non existentibus eadem est ratio. What does not touch the heart or come home to the feelings goes comparatively for little or nothing. A benefit that exists merely in possibility and is judged of only by the forced dictates of the understanding is not a set-off against an evil say of equal magnitude in itself, that strikes upon the senses, that haunts the imagination, and lacerates the human heart, a spectacle of deliberate cruelty, that shocks everyone that sees and hears of it, is not to be justified by any calculations of cold-blooded self-interest, is not to be permitted in any case, it is prejudged and self-condemned, necessity has been therefore justly called the tyrant's plea, it is no better than the mere doctrine of utility, which is the sophist's plea. Thus, for example, an infinite number of lumps of sugar put into Mr. Bentham's artificial ethical scales would never weigh against the pounds of human flesh or drops of human blood that are sacrificed to produce them. The taste of the former on the palate is evanescent, but the others sit heavy on the soul. The one are an object to the imagination, the others only to the understanding. But man is an animal compounded both of imagination and understanding, and in treating of what is good for man's nature, it is necessary to consider both. A calculation of the mere ultimate advantages, without regard to natural feelings and affections, may improve the external face and physical comforts of society, but it will leave it heartless and worthless in itself. In a word, the sympathy of the individual with the consequences of his own act is to be attended to, no less than the consequences themselves, in every sound system of morality, and this must be determined by certain natural laws of the human mind, and not by rules of logic or arithmetic. The aspect of a moral question is to be judged of, very much like the faces of a country, by the projecting points, by what is striking and memorable, by that which leaves the traces of itself behind, or casts its shadow before. Millions of acres do not make a picture, nor the calculation of all the consequences in the world, a sentiment. We must have some outstanding object for the mind, as well as the eye, to dwell on, and to recur to, something marked and decisive to give a tone and texture to the moral feelings. 
Not only is the attention thus aroused and kept alive, but what is most important as to the principles of action, the desire of good or hatred of evil, is powerfully excited. But all individual facts in history come under the head of what these people call imagination. All full, true, and particular accounts they consider as romantic, ridiculous, vague, inflammatory. As a case in point, one of this school of thinkers declares that he was qualified to write a better history of India from having never been there than if he had, as if the last might lead to local distinctions or party prejudices, that is to say, that he could describe a country better at second hand than from original observation, or that from having seen no one object, place, or person, he could do ampler justice to the whole. It might be maintained, much on the same principle, that an artist would better paint a likeness of a person after he was dead from description, or different sketches of the face, than from having seen the individual living man. On the contrary, I humbly conceive that the seeing half a dozen wandering Lascars in the streets of London gives one a better idea of the soul of India, that cradle the world, and, as it were, garden of the sun, than all the charts, records, and statistical reports that can be sent over, even under the classical administration of Mr. Caning. Ab uno disque omnes. One Hindu differs more from a citizen of London than he does from all other Hindus and by seeing the two first, man to man, you know comparatively and essentially what they are, nation to nation. By a very few specimens you fix the great leading differences, which are the same throughout. Any one thing is a better representative of its kind than all the words and definitions in the world can be. The sum total is indeed different from the particulars, but it is not easy to guess at any general result without some previous induction of particulars and appeal to experience. What can we reason but from what we know? Again, it is quite wrong. Instead of the most striking illustrations of human nature, to single out the stalest and tritest, as if they were the most authentic and infallible, not considering that from the extremes you may infer the means, but you cannot from the means infer the extremes in any cases. It may be said that the extreme and individual cases may be reported upon us. I deny it, unless it be with truth. The imagination is an associating principle, and has an instinctive perception when a thing belongs to a system, or is an exception to it. For instance, the excesses committed by the victorious besiegers of a town do not attach to the nation committing them but to the nature of that sort of warfare, and are common to both sides. They may be struck off the score of natural prejudices. The cruelties exercised upon slaves, on the other hand, grow out of the relation between master and slave, and the mind intuitively revolts at them as much. The cant about the horrors of the French Revolution is mere cant. Everybody knows it to be so. Each party would have retaliated upon the other. It was a civil war, like that for a disputed secession. The general principle of the right or wrong of the change remained untouched. Neither would these horrors have taken place except from Prussian manifestos and treachery within. There were none in the American and have been none in the Spanish Revolution. The massacre of St. Bartholomew arose out of the principles of that religion which exterminates with fire and sword and keeps no faith with heretics. If it be said that nicknames, party watchwords, bugbears, the cry of no popery, etc., are continually played off upon the imagination, with the most mischievous effect. I answer that most of these bugbears and terms of vulgar abuse have arisen out of abstruse speculation or barbarous prejudice, and have seldom had their root in real facts or natural feelings. Besides, are not general topics, rules, exceptions, endlessly bandied to and fro and balanced against the other by the most learned disputants? Had not three-fourths of all the wars, schisms, heart-burnings in the world begun on mere points of controversy? There are two classes whom I have found given to this kind of reasoning against the use of our senses and feelings in what concerns human nature, viz. knaves and fools. The last do it because they think their own shallow dogmas settle all questions best without any farther appeal, and the first do it because they know that the refinements of the head are more easily got rid of than the suggestions of the heart, and that a strong sense of injustice, excited by a particular case in all its aggravations, tells more against them than all the distinctions of the jurists. Facts, concrete existences, are stubborn things, 
and are not so soon tampered with or turned about to any point we please as mere names and abstractions. Of these last it may be said, a breath can mar them whom a breath has made, and they are liable to be puffed away by every wind of doctrine or baffled by every plea of convenience. I wonder that Rousseau gave into this cant about the want of soundness in rhetorical and imaginative reasoning, and was so fond of this subject as to make an abridgment of Plato's rhapsodies upon it, by which he was led to expel poets from his commonwealth. Thus, two of the most flowery writers are those who have exacted the greatest severity of styles from others. Rousseau was too ambitious of an exceedingly technical and scientific mode of reasoning, scarcely attainable in the mixed questions of human life, as may be seen in his social contract, a work of great ability but extreme formality of structure, and it is probable that he was led into this error in seeking to overcome his too great warmth of natural temperament, to indulge merely the impulses of passion. Burke, who was a man of fine imagination, had the good sense, without any of this false modesty, to defend the moral uses of the imagination, and is himself one of the grossest instances of its abuse. It is not merely the fashion among philosophers. The poets also have got into a way of scouting individuality as beneath the sublimity of their pretensions and the universality of their genius. The philosophers have become mere logicians and their rivals mere rhetoricians. For as these last must float on the surface and are not allowed to be harsh and crabbed and recondite like the others, by leaving out the individual, they become commonplace. They cannot reason and they must declaim. Modern tragedy in particular is no longer like a vessel making the voyage of life and tossed about by the winds and waves of passion, but is converted into a handsomely constructed steamboat that is moved by the sole expansive power of words. Lord Byron has launched several of these ventures lately, if ventures they may be called, and may continue in the same strain as long as he pleases. We have not now a number of dramatis personae affected by particular incidents, and speaking according to their feelings, or as the occasion suggests, but each mounting the rostrum and delivering his opinion on fate, fortune, and the entire consummation of things. The individual is not of sufficient importance to occupy his own thoughts or the thoughts of others. The poet fills his page with grand pensée. He covers the face of nature with the beauty of his sentiments and the brilliancy of his paradoxes. We have the subtleties of the head instead of the workings of the heart, and the possible justifications instead of the actual motives of conduct. This all seems to proceed on a false estimate of individual nature and the value of human life. We have been so used to count by millions of late that we think the units that compose them nothing and are so prone to trace remote principles that we neglect the immediate results. As an instance of the opposite style of dramatic dialogue, in which the persons speak for themselves and to one another, I will give by way of illustration a passage from an old tragedy in which a brother has just caused his sister to be put to violent death. Bosola. Fix your eyes here. Ferdinand. Constantly. Bosola. Do you not weep? Other sins only speak. Murther shrieks out, The elements of water moistens the earth, but blood flies upward and bedews the heavens. Ferdinand, cover her face, mine eyes dazzle, she died young. Basola, I think not so, her infelicity seemed to have years too many. Ferdinand, she and I were twins, and should I die this instant, I have lived, her time to a minute. How fine is the constancy, with which he first fixes his eye in the dead body, with a forced courage, and then as his resolution wavers, how natural is his turning his face away, and the reflection that strikes him on her youth and beauty and untimely death, and the thought that they were twins, and his measuring his life by hers up to the present period, as if all that were to come of it were nothing. Now I would fain to ask whether there is not in this contemplation of the interval that separates the beginning from the end of life, of a life too so varied from good to ill, and of pitiable termination of which the person speaking has been the willful and guilty cause, enough to give the mind pause. Is not that revelation as if it were of the whole extent of our being, which is made by the flashes of passion and stroke of calamity, a subject sufficiently staggering to have place in legitimate tragedy? 
Are not the struggles of the will with untoward events and the adverse passions of others as interesting and instructive in the representation as reflections on the mutability of fortune or in the inevitableness of destiny or in the passions of men in general? The tragic muse does not merely utter muffled sounds, but we see the paleness on the cheek and the lifeblood gushing from the heart. The interest we take in our own lives, in our successes or disappointments, and the home feelings that arise out of these, when well described, are the clearest and truest mirror in which we can see the image of human nature. For in this sense, each man is a microcosm. What he is, the rest are. Whatever his joys and sorrows are composed of, theirs are the same, no more, no less. One touch of nature makes the whole world kin. But it must be the genuine touch of nature, not the outward flourishes and varnish of art, the spouting, oracular, didactic figure of the poet no more answers to the living man than the lay figure of the painter does. We may well say to such a one, Thou hast no speculation in those eyes, that thou dost glare with, thy bones are marrowless, thy blood is cold. Man is, so to speak, an endless and infinitely varied repetition, and if we know what one man feels, we so far know what a thousand feel in the sanctuary of their being. Our feeling of general humanity is at once an aggregate of a thousand different truths, and it is also the same truth a thousand times told. As is our perception of this original truth the root of our imagination, so will the force and richness of the general impression proceeding from it be. The boundary of our sympathy is a circle which enlarges itself according to its propulsion from the center, the heart. If we are imbued with a deep sense of individual weal or woe, we shall be awestruck at the idea of humanity in general. If we know little of it but its abstract and common properties, without their particular application, their force or degrees, we shall care just as little as we know either about the whole or the individuals. If we understand the texture and vital feeling, we then can fill up the outline, but we cannot supply the former from having the latter given. Moral and poetical truth is like expression in a picture. The one is not to be attained by smearing over a large canvas, nor the other by bestriding a vague topic. In such matters, the most pompous skillists are accordingly found to be the greatest contemners of human life. But I defy any great tragic writer to despise that nature which he understands, or that heart which he has probed, with all its rich bleeding materials of joy and sorrow. The subject may not be a source of much triumph to him, from its alternate light and shade, but it can never become one of supercilious indifference. He must feel a strong reflex interest in it, corresponding to that which he has depicted in the characters of others. Indeed, the object and end of playing, both at the first and now, is to hold the mirror up to nature, to enable us to feel for others as for ourselves, or to embody a distinct interest out of ourselves by the force of imagination and passion. This is summed up in the wish of the poet, to feel what others are, and to know myself a man. If it does not do this, it loses both its dignity and its proper use. End of section 6. Recording by Dave Gower. Section 7 of The Plain Speaker. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Nicole Lee. The Plain Speaker. Opinions on books, men, and things by William Hazlitt. Section 7. On Application to Study. No one is idle who can do anything. It is conscious inability, or the sense of repeated failure, that prevents us from undertaking, or deters us from the prosecution of any work. Wilson, the painter, might be mentioned as an exception to this rule, for he was said to be an indolent man. After bestowing a few touches on a picture, he grew tired and said to any friend who called in, 
Now let us go somewhere. But the fact is that Wilson could not finish his pictures minutely, and that those few masterly touches, carelessly thrown in of a morning, were all that he could do. The rest would have been labour lost. Morland has been referred to as another man of genius, who can only be brought to work by fits and snatches. But his landscapes and figures, whatever degree of merit they might possess, were mere hasty sketches, and he could produce all that he was capable of in the first half hour, as well as in twenty years. Why bestow additional pains without additional effect? What he did was from the impulse of the moment, from the lively impression of some coarse but striking object, and with that impulse his efforts ceased, as they justly ought. There is no use in labouring in vita minerva, nor any difficulty in it, when the muse is not averse. The labour we delight in physics pain. Denner finished his unmeaning portraits with a microscope, and without being ever weary of his fruitless task, for the essence of his genius was industry. Sir Joshua Reynolds, courted by the graces and by fortune, was hardly ever out of his painting-room, and lamented a few days at any time spent at a friend's house or at a nobleman's seat in the country, as so much time lost. That darkly illuminated room to him a kingdom was. His pencil was the sceptre that he wielded, and the throne on which his sitters were placed, a throne for fame. Here he felt indeed at home. Here the current of his ideas flowed full and strong. Here he felt most self-possession, most command over others, and the sense of power urged him on to his delightful task, with a sort of vernal cheerfulness and vigour, even in the decline of life. The feeling of weakness and incapacity would have made his hand soon falter, would have rebutted him from his object, or had the canvas mocked and been insensible to his toil, instead of gradually turning to a lucid mirror in which nature saw all her reflected features, he would, like so many others, have thrown down his pencil in despair, or proceeded reluctantly, without spirit and without success. Claude Lorraine, in like manner, spent whole mornings on the banks of the Tiber, or in his study, eliciting beauty after beauty, adding touch to touch, getting nearer and nearer to perfection, luxuriating in endless felicity, not merely giving the salient points, but filling up the whole intermediate space with continuous grace and beauty. What further motive was necessary to induce him to persevere? But the bounty of his fate? What greater pleasure could he seek for than that of seeing the perfect image of his mind reflected in the work of his hand? But as is the pleasure and the confidence produced by consummate skill, so is the pain and the desponding effect of total failure. When for the fair face of nature we only see an unsightly blot issuing from our best endeavours, then the nerves slacken, the tears fill the eyes, and the painter turns away from his art as the lover from a mistress that scorns him. Alas! How many such have, as the poet says, begun in gladness, whereof has come in the end despondency and madness. Not for want of will to proceed, oh no, but for lack of power. Hence it is that those often do best, up to a certain point of commonplace success, who have least knowledge and least ambition to excel. Their taste keeps pace with their capacity, and they are not deterred by insurmountable difficulties, of which they have no idea. I have known artists, for instance, of considerable merit, and a certain native rough strength and resolution of mind, who have been active and enterprising in their profession, but who never seemed to think of any works but those which they had in hand. They never spoke of a picture 
or appeared to have seen one. To them, Titian, Raphael, Rubens, Rembrandt, Correggio, were as if they had never been. No tones, mellowed by time to soft perfection, lured them to their luckless doom. No divine forms baffled their vain embrace. No sound of immortality rang in their ears, or drew off their attention from the calls of creditors, or of hunger. They walked through collections of the finest works, like the children in the fiery furnace, untouched, unapproached. With these true terrae filii, the art seemed to begin and end. They thought only of the subject of their next production, the size of their next canvas, the grouping, the getting of the figures in, and conducted their work to its conclusion, with as little distraction of mind, and as few misgivings, as a stage-coachman conducts a stage, or a carrier delivers a bale of goods, according to its destination. Such persons, if they do not rise above, at least seldom sink below themselves, they do not soar to the highest heaven of invention, nor penetrate the inmost recesses of the heart. But they succeed in all that they attempt, or are capable of, as men of business and industry in their calling. For them the veil of the temple of art is not rent asunder, and it is well, one glimpse of the sanctuary, of the holy of the holies, might palsy their hands and dim their sight for ever after. I think there are two mistakes common enough on this subject, viz. that men of genius, or of first-rate capacity, do little except by intermittent fits or per saltum, and that they do that little in a slight and slovenly manner. There may be instances of this, but they are not the highest, and they are the exceptions, not the rule. On the contrary, the greatest artists have in general been the most prolific or the most elaborate, as the best writers have been frequently the most voluminous as well as indefatigable. We have a great living instance among writers that the quality of a man's productions is not to be estimated in the inverse ratio of their quantity, I mean in the author of Waverley, the fecundity of whose pen is no less admirable than its felicity. Shakespeare is another instance of the same prodigality of genius, his materials being endlessly poured forth with no niggard or fastidious hand, and the mastery of the execution being, in many respects at least, equal to the boldness of the design. As one example among others that I might cite of the attention which he gave to his subject, it is sufficient to observe that there is scarcely a word in any of his more striking passages that can be altered for the better. If any person, for instance, is trying to recollect a favourite line, and cannot hit upon some particular expression, it is in vain to think of substituting any other so good. That in the original text is not merely the best, but it seems the only right one. I will stop to illustrate this point a little. I was at a loss the other day for the line in Henry V, nice customs curtsy to great kings. I could not recollect the word nice. I tried a number of others, such as old, grave, etc. They would none of them do, but seemed all heavy, lumbering, or from the purpose. The word nice, on the contrary, appeared to drop into its place and be ready to assist in paying the reverence required. Again, a jest's prosperity lies in the ear of him that hears it. I thought in quoting from memory of a jest's success, a jest's renown, etc. I then turned to the volume, and there found the very word that of all others expressed the idea. Had Shakespeare searched through the four quarters of the globe, he could not have lighted on another to convey so exactly what he meant, a casual, hollow, sounding success. I could multiply such examples, but that I am sure the reader will easily supply them himself and they show sufficiently that Shakespeare was not, as he is often represented, a loose or clumsy writer. The bold, happy texture of his style, in which every word is prominent, and yet cannot be torn from its place without violence, any more than a limb from the body, is, one should think, the result either of vigilant painstaking, or of unerring intuitive perception, and not the mark of crude conceptions, and the random blindfold blows of ignorance.
there cannot be a greater contradiction to the common prejudice that genius is naturally a truant and a vagabond than the astonishing and on this hypothesis unaccountable number of chefs d'oeuvre left behind them by the old masters the stream of their invention supplies the taste of successive generations like a river they furnish a hundred galleries and preclude competition not more by the excellence than by the number of their performances take raphael and rubens alone there are works of theirs in single collections enough to occupy a long and laborious life and yet their works are spread through all the collections of europe they seem to have cost them no more labour than if they had drawn in their breath and puffed it forth again but we know that they made drawings studies sketches of all the principal of these with the care and caution of the merest tyros in the art and they remain equal proofs of their capacity and diligence the cartoons of raphael alone might have employed many years and made a life of illustrious labour though they look as if they had been struck off at a blow and are not a tenth part of what he produced in his short but bright career titian and michelangelo lived longer but they worked as hard and did as well shall we bring in competition with examples like these some trashy caricaturist or idle dauber who has no sense of the infinite resources of nature or art nor consequently any power to employ himself upon them for any length of time or to any purpose to prove that genius and regular industry are incompatible qualities in my opinion the very superiority of the works of the great painters instead of being a bar to accounts for their multiplicity power is pleasure and the pleasure sweetens pain a fine poet thus describes the effect of the sight of nature on his mind the sounding cataract haunted me like a passion the tall rock the mountain and the deep and gloomy wood their colours and their forms were then to me an appetite a feeling and a love that had no need of a remoter charm by thought supplied or any interest unborrowed from the eye so the forms of nature or the human form divine stood before the great artists of old nor required any other stimulus to lead the eye to survey or the hand to embody them than the pleasure derived from the inspiration of the subject and propulsive force of the mimic creation the grandeur of their works was an argument with them not to stop short but to proceed they could have no higher excitement or satisfaction than in the exercise of their art and endless generation of truth and beauty success prompts to exertion and habit facilitates success it is idle to suppose we can exhaust nature and the more we employ our own faculties the more we strengthen them and enrich our stores of observation and invention the more we do the more we can do not indeed if we get our ideas out of our own heads that stock is soon exhausted and we recur to tiresome vapid imitations of ourselves but this is the difference between real and mock talent between genius and affectation nature is not limited nor does it become effete like our conceit and vanity the closer we examine it the more it refines upon us it expands as we enlarge and shift our view it grows with our growth and strengthens with our strength the subjects are endless and our capacity is invigorated as it is called out by occasion and necessity he who does nothing renders himself incapable of doing anything but while we are executing any work we are preparing and qualifying ourselves to undertake another the principles are the same in all nature and we understand them better as we verify them by experience and practice it is not as if there were a given number of subjects to work upon or a set of innate or preconceived ideas in our minds which we encroached upon with every new design the subjects as i said before are endless and we acquire ideas by imparting them our expenditure of intellectual wealth makes us rich we can only be liberal as we have previously accumulated the means by lying idle as by standing still we are confined to the same trite narrow round of topics by continuing our efforts as by moving forwards in a road we extend our views and discover continually new tracts of country genius like humanity 
rusts for want of use. Habit also gives promptness, and the soul of dispatch is decision. One man may write a book or paint a picture, while another is deliberating about the plan or the title page. The great painters were able to do so much because they knew exactly what they meant to do and how to set about it. They were thoroughbred workmen and were not learning their art while they were exercising it. One can do a great deal in a short time if one only knows how. Thus an author may become very voluminous who only employs an hour or two in a day in study. If he has once obtained, by habit and reflection, a use of his pen with plenty of materials to work upon, the pages vanish before him. The time lost is in beginning, or in stopping after we have begun. If we only go forward with spirit and confidence, we shall soon arrive at the end of our journey. A practised writer ought never to hesitate for a sentence, from the moment he sets pen to paper, or think about the course he is to take. He must trust to his previous knowledge of the subject, and to his immediate impulses, and he will get to the close of his task without accidents or loss of time. I can easily understand how the old divines and controversialists produced their folios. I could write folios myself, if I rose early and sat up late at this kind of occupation, but I confess I should soon be tired of it, besides wearing the reader. In one sense, art is long, and life is short. In another sense, this aphorism is not true. The best of us are idle half our time. It is wonderful how much is done in a short space, provided we set about it properly, and give our minds wholly to it. Let any one devote himself to any art or science ever so strenuously, and he will still have leisure to make considerable progress in half a dozen other acquirements. Leonardo da Vinci was a mathematician, a musician, a poet, and an anatomist, besides being one of the greatest painters of his age. The prince of painters was a courtier, a lover, and fond of dress and company. Michelangelo was a prodigy of versatility of talent, a writer of sonnets, which Wordsworth has thought worth translating, and the admirer of Dante. Salvatore was a lutenist and a satirist. Titian was an elegant letter-writer and a finished gentleman. Sir Joshua Reynolds' discourses are polished and classical, even than any of his pictures. Let a man do all he can in any one branch of study. He must either exhaust himself and doze over it, or vary his pursuit, or else lie idle. All our real labour lies in a nutshell. The mind makes, at some period or other, one Herculean effort, and the rest is mechanical. We have to climb a steep and narrow precipice at first, but after that the way is broad and easy, where we may drive several accomplishments abreast. Men should have one principal pursuit, which may be both agreeably and advantageously diversified, with other lighter ones, as the subordinate parts of a picture may be managed, so as to give effect to the centre group. It has been observed by a sensible man, that the having a regular occupation, or professional duties to attend to, is no excuse for putting forth an inelegant or inaccurate work. For a habit of industry braces and strengthens the mind, and enables it to wield its energies with additional ease and steadier purpose. Were I allowed to instance in myself, if what I write at present is worth nothing, at least it cost me nothing, but it cost me a great deal twenty years ago. I have added little to my stock since then, and taken little from it. I unfold the book and volume of the brain, and transcribe the characters I see there, as mechanically as any one might copy the letters in a sampler. I do not say they came there mechanically. I transfer them to the paper mechanically. After eight or ten years' hard study, an author, at least, may go to sleep. I do not conceive rapidity of execution necessarily implies slovenliness or crudeness. On the contrary, I believe it is often productive both of sharpness and freedom. The eagerness of composition strikes out sparkles of fancy and runs the thoughts more naturally and closely into one another. There may be less formal method, but there is more life and spirit and truth. In the play and agitation of the mind, it runs over, and we dally with the subject as the glass-blower rapidly shapes the vitreous fluid. A number of new thoughts rise up spontaneously, and they come in the proper places, because they arise from the occasion. They are also sure to partake of the warmth and vividness of that ebullition of mind from which they spring. 
spiritus precipitandus est in these sort of voluntaries in composition the thoughts are worked up to a state of projection the grasp of the subject the presence of mind the flow of expression must be something akin to extempore speaking or perhaps such bold but finished draughts may be compared to fresco paintings which imply a life of study and great previous preparation but of which the execution is momentary and irrevocable i will add a single remark on a point that has been much disputed mr cobbett lays it down that the first word that occurs is always the best i would venture to differ from so great an authority mr cobbett himself indeed writes as easily and as well as he talks but he perhaps is hardly a rule for others without his practice and without his ability in the hurry of composition three or four words may present themselves one on the back of the other and the last may be the best and right one i grant thus much that it is in vain to seek for the word we want or endeavour to get it at second hand or as a paraphrase on some other word it must come of itself or arise out of an immediate impression or lively intuition of the subject that is the proper word must be suggested immediately by the thoughts but it need not be presented as soon as called for it is the same in trying to recollect the names of places persons etc we cannot force our memory they must come of themselves by natural association as it were but they may occur to us when we least think of it owing to some casual circumstance or link of connection and long after we have given up the search proper expressions rise to the surface from the heat and fermentation of the mind like bubbles on an agitated stream it is this which produces a clear and sparkling style in painting great execution supplies the place of high finishing a few vigorous touches properly and rapidly disposed will often give more of the appearance and texture even of natural objects than the most heavy and laborious details but this masterly style of execution is very different from coarse daubing i do not think however that the pains or polish an artist bestows upon his works necessarily interferes with their number he only grows more enamoured of his task proportionately patient indefatigable and devotes more of the day to study the time we lose is not in overdoing what we are about but in doing nothing rubens had great facility of execution and seldom went into the details yet raphael whose oil pictures were exact and laboured achieved according to the length of time he lived very nearly as much as he in filling up the parts of his pictures and giving them the last perfection they were capable of he filled up his leisure hours which otherwise would have lain idle on his hands i have sometimes accounted for the slow progress of certain artists from the unfinished state in which they have left their works at last these were evidently done by fits and throws there was no appearance of continuous labour one figure had been thrown in at a venture and then another and in the intervals between these convulsive and random efforts more time had been wasted than could have been spent in working up each individual figure on the sure principles of art and by a careful inspection of nature to the utmost point of practicable perfection some persons are afraid of their own works and having made one or two successful efforts attempt nothing ever after they stand still midway in the road to fame from being startled at the shadow of their own reputation this is a needless alarm if what they have already done possesses real power this will increase with exercise if it has not this power it is not sufficient to ensure them lasting fame such delicate pretenders tremble on the brink of ideal perfection like dewdrops on the edge of flowers and are fascinated like so many narcissuses with the image of themselves reflected from the public admiration it is seldom indeed that this cautious repose will answer its end while seeking to sustain our reputation at the height we are forgotten shakespeare gave different advice and himself acted upon it perseverance dear my lord keeps honour bright to have done is to hang quite out of fashion like a rusty mail in monumental mockery take the instant way for honour travels in a strait so narrow where one but goes abreast keep then the path for emulation hath a thousand sons that one by one pursue if you give way or hedge aside from the direct forthright like to an entered tide 
they all rush by and leave you hindmost or like a gallant horse fallen in first rank lie there for pavement to the abject rear o'errun and trampled on then what they do in present though less than yours in past must o'ertop yours for time is like a fashionable host that slightly shakes his parting guest by the hand and with his arms outstretched as he would fly grasps in the comer welcome ever smiles and farewell goes out sighing o oh, let not virtue seek remuneration for the thing it was for beauty wit high birth vigour of bone desert in service love friendship charity are subjects all to envious and calumniating time one touch of nature makes the whole world kin that all with one consent praise new-born gods though they are made and moulded of things past and give to dust that is a little guilt more lord than guilt o'er dusted the present eye praises the present object i cannot very well conceive how it is that some writers even of taste and genius spend whole years in mere corrections for the press as it were in polishing a line or adjusting a comma they take long to consider exactly as there is nothing worth the trouble of a moment's thought and the more they deliberate the further they are from deciding for their fastidiousness increases with the indulgence of it nor is there any real ground for preference they are in the situation of ned softly in the tatler who was a whole morning debating whether a line of poetical epistles should run you sing your song with so much art or your song you sing with so much art these are points that it is impossible ever to come to a determination about and it is only a proof of a little mind ever to have entertained the question at all there is a class of persons whose minds seem to move in an element of littleness or rather that are entangled in trifling difficulties and incapable of extricating themselves from them there was a remarkable instance of this improgressive ineffectual restless activity of temper in a late celebrated and very ingenious landscape painter never ending still beginning his mind seemed entirely made up of points and fractions nor could he by any means arrive at a conclusion or a valuable whole he made it his boast that he never sat with his hands before him and yet he never did anything his powers and his time were frittered away in an importunate uneasy fidgety attention to little things the first picture he ever painted when a mere boy was a copy of his father's house and he began it by counting the number of bricks in the front upwards and lengthways and then made a scaler of them on his canvas. This literal style and mode of study stuck to him to the last. He was put under Wilson, whose example, if any could, might have cured him of this pettiness of conception. But nature prevailed, as it almost always does. To take pains to no purpose seemed to be his motto, and the delight of his life. He left, when he died not long ago, heaps of canvases with elaborately finished pencil outlines on them and with perhaps a little dead colouring added here and there in this state they were thrown aside as if he grew tired of his occupation the instant it gave a promise of turning to account and his whole object in the pursuit of art was to erect scaffoldings the same intense interest in the most frivolous things extended to the common concerns of life to the arranging of his letters the labelling of his books and the inventory of his wardrobe Yet he was a man of sense, who saw the folly and the waste of time in all this, and could warn others against it. The perceiving our own weaknesses enables us to give others excellent advice, but it does not teach us to reform them ourselves. Physician, heal thyself, is the hardest lesson to follow. Nobody knew better than our artist that repose is necessary to great efforts, and that he who is never idle labours in vain. Another error is to spend one's life in procrastination and preparations for the future. Persons of this turn of mind stop at the threshold of art and accumulate the means of improvement till they obstruct their progress to the end. They are always putting off the evil day and excuse themselves for doing nothing by commencing some new and indispensable course of study. Their projects are magnificent but remote and require years to complete or to put them in execution fame is seen in the horizon and flies before them like the recreant boastful knight in spencer they turn their backs on their competitors to make a great career 
but never return to the charge. They make themselves masters of anatomy, of drawing, of perspective. They collect prints, casts, medallions, make studies of heads, of hands, of the bones, the muscles, copy pictures, visit Italy, Greece, and return as they went. They fulfil the proverb, when you are at Rome, you must do as those at Rome do. This circuitous, erratic pursuit of art can come to no good. It is only an apology for idleness and vanity. Foreign travel especially makes men pedants, not artists. What we seek, we must find at home or nowhere. The way to do great things is to set about something, and he who cannot find resources in himself or in his own painting-room will perform the grand tour or go through the circle of arts and sciences and end just where he began. The same remarks that have been here urged with respect to an application to the study of art will in a great measure, though not in every particular, apply to an attention to business. I mean that exertion will generally follow success and opportunity in the one, as it does confidence and talent in the other. Give a man a motive to work, and he will work. A lawyer who is regularly feed seldom neglects to look over his briefs. The more business, the more industry. The stress laid upon early rising is preposterous. If we have anything to do when we get up, we shall not lie in bed to a certainty. Thompson the Purge was found late in bed by Dr. Burney and asked why he had not risen earlier. The Scotchman wisely answered, I had no motive, young man. What indeed had he to do, after writing the seasons, but to dream out the rest of his existence, unless it were to write the Castle of Indolence? End of section 7「Section number eight of the Plain Speaker. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Patrick Wallace. The Plain Speaker: Opinions on Books, Men and Things by William Hazlitt. Section eight on Londoners and Country People, Part One. I do not agree with Mr. Blackwood in his definition of the word Cockney. He means by it a person who has happened at any time to live in London and who is not a Tory. I mean by it a person who has never lived out of London and who has got all his ideas from it. The true Cockney has never travelled beyond the purlieus of the metropolis, either in the body or the spirit. Primrose Hill is the ultima thule of his most romantic desires. Greenwich Park stands him instead of the vales of Arcady. Time and space are lost to him. He is confined to one spot and to the present moment. He sees everything near, superficial, little, in hasty succession. The world turns round in his head with it, like a roundabout at a fair, till he becomes stunned and giddy with the motion. Figures glide by as in a camera obscura. There is a glare, a perpetual hubbub, a noise, a crowd about him. He sees and hears a vast number of things and knows nothing. He is pert, raw, ignorant, conceited, ridiculous, shallow, contemptible. His senses keep him alive, and he knows, inquires, and cares for nothing further. He meets the Lord Mayor's coach, and without ceremony treats himself to an imaginary ride in it. He notices the people going to court or to a city feast, and is quite satisfied with the show. He takes the wall of a lord, and fancies himself as good as he. He sees an infinite quantity of people pass along the street, and thinks there is no such thing as life or a knowledge of character to be found out of London. Beyond Hyde Park all is a desert to him. He despises the country, because he is ignorant of it, and the town, because he is familiar with it. He is as well acquainted with St. Paul's as if he had built it, and talks of Westminster Abbey and Poet's Corner with great indifference. The King, the House of Lords and Commons are his very good friends. He knows the members for Westminster or the city by sight, and bows to the sheriffs or the sheriff's men. He is hand and glove with the chairman of some committee. He is, in short, a great man by proxy and comes so often in contact with fine persons and things that he rubs off a little of the gilding and is surcharged with a sort of second-hand vapid tingling troublesome self-importance 
his personal vanity is thus continually flattered and perked up into ridiculous self-complacency, while his imagination is jaded and impaired by daily misuse. Everything is vulgarised in his mind. Nothing dwells long enough on it to produce an interest. Nothing is contemplated sufficiently at a distance to excite curiosity or wonder. Your true cockney is your only true leveller. Let him be as low as he will. He fancies he is as good as anybody else. He has no respect for himself, and still less, if possible, for you. He cares little about his own advantages, if he can only make a jest at yours. Every feeling comes to him through a medium of levity and impertinence. Nor does he like to have this habit of mind disturbed by being brought into collision with anything serious or respectable. He despairs in such a crowd of competitors of distinguishing himself, but laughs heartily at the idea of being able to trip up the heels of other people's pretensions. A cockney feels no gratitude. This is a first principle with him. He regards any obligation you confer upon him as a species of imposition, a ludicrous assumption of fancied superiority. He talks about everything, for he has heard something about it, and understanding nothing of the matter, concludes he has as good a right as you. He is a politician, for he has seen the Parliament House. He is a critic, because he knows the principal actors by sight, has a taste for music, because he belongs to a glee club at the West End, and is gallant, in virtue of sometimes frequenting the lobbies at half price. A mere Londoner, in fact, from the opportunities he has of knowing something of a number of objects, and those striking ones, fancies himself a sort of privileged person, remains satisfied with the assumption of merits so much the more unquestionable as they are not his own, and from being dazzled with noise, show and appearances, is less capable of giving a real opinion or entering into any subject than the meanest peasant. There are greater lawyers, orators, painters, philosophers, poets, players in London than in any other part of the United Kingdom. He is a Londoner, and therefore it would be strange if he did not know more of law, eloquence, art, philosophy, poetry, acting, than anyone without his local advantages and who is merely from the country. This is a non sequitur, and it constantly appears so when put to the test. A real cockney is the poorest creature in the world, the most literal, the most mechanical, and yet he too lives in a world of romance, a fairyland of his own. He is a citizen of London, and this abstraction leads his imagination the finest dance in the world. London is the first city on the habitable globe, and therefore he must be superior to everyone who lives out of it. There are more people in London than anywhere else, and though a dwarf in stature, his person swells out and expands into ideal importance and borrowed magnitude. He resides in a garret or in a two pair of stairs back room. Yet he talks of the magnificence of London, and gives himself airs of consequence upon it, as if all the houses in Portman or in Grosvenor Square were his by right or in reversion. He is owner of all he surveys. The Monument, the Tower of London, St. James's Palace, the Mansion House, Whitehall, are part and parcel of his being. Let us suppose him to be a lawyer's clerk at half a guinea a week. But he knows the Inns of Court, the Temple Gardens and Gray's Inn Passage, sees the lawyers in their wigs walking up and down Chancery Lane, and has advanced within half a dozen yards of the Chancellor's chair. Who can doubt that he understands by implication every point of law, however intricate, better than the most expert country practitioner? He is a shopman, and nailed all day behind the counter. But he sees hundreds and thousands of gay, well-dressed people pass, an endless phantasmagoria, and enjoys their liberty and gaudy, flattering pride. He is a footman, but he rides behind beauty, through a crowd of carriages and visits a thousand shops. Is he a tailor, that last infirmity of human nature? The stigma on his profession is lost in the elegance of the patterns he provides and of the persons he adorns. And he is something very different from a mere country botcher. Nay, the very scavenger and nightman thinks the dirt in the street has something precious in it, 
and his employment is solemn, silent, sacred, peculiar to London. A barker in Monmouth Street, a slop-seller in Ratcliffe Highway, a tapster at a night-seller, a beggar in St. Giles's, a drab in Fleet Ditch, live in the eyes of millions, and eke out a dreary, wretched, scanty, or loathsome existence, from the gorgeous, busy, glowing scene around them. It is a common saying among such persons that they had rather be hanged in London than die a natural death out of it anywhere else. Such is the force of habit and imagination. Even the eye of childhood is dazzled and delighted with the polished splendour of the jewellers' shops, the neatness of the turnery ware, the festoons of artificial flowers, the confectionery, the chemist's shops, the lamps, the horses, the carriages, the sedan chairs. To this was formerly added a set of traditional associations. Whittington and his cat, Guy Fawkes and the gunpowder treason, the fire and the plague of London, and the heads of the Scotch rebels that were stuck on Temple Bar in 1745. These have vanished, and in their stead the curious and romantic eye must be content to pore in pennant for the sight of old London wall, or to peruse the sentimental milestone that marks the distance to the place where Hicks's Hall formerly stood. Editor's Footnotes Pennant's account of London, of which there were several editions, was formerly in esteem as the best modern and popular description of the metropolis. It has long been superseded. And Hicks's Hall was built by Sir Baptist Hicks, first Viscount Camden. The Cockney lives in a go-cart of local prejudices and positive illusions and when he is turned out of it, he hardly knows how to stand or move. He ventures through Hyde Park Corner as a cat crosses a gutter. The trees pass by the coach very oddly. The country has a strange blank appearance. It is not lined with houses all the way, like London. He comes to places he never saw or heard of. He finds the world is bigger than he thought for. He might have dropped from the moon for anything he knows of the matter. He is mightily disposed to laugh, but is half afraid of making some blunder. Between sheepishness and conceit, he is in a very ludicrous situation. He finds that the people walk on two legs, and wonders to hear them talk a dialect so different from his own. He perceives London fashions have got down into the country before him, and that some of the better sort are dressed as well as he is. A drove of pigs or cattle stopping the road is a very troublesome interruption. A crow in a field, a magpie in a hedge, are to him very odd animals. He can't tell what to make of them or how they live. He does not altogether like the accommodation at the inns. It is not what he has been used to in town. He begins to be communicative, says he was born within the sound of Bow Bell, and attempts some jokes at which no one laughs. He asks the coachman a question, to which he receives no answer. All this is to him very unaccountable and unexpected. He arrives at his journey's end, and instead of being the great man he anticipated among his friends and country relations, finds that they are barely civil to him, or make a butt of him, have topics of their own which he is as completely ignorant of as they are indifferent to what he says, so that he is glad to get back to London again where he meets with his favourite indulgences and associates, and fancies the whole world is occupied with what he sees and hears. A cockney loves a tea garden in summer, as he loves the play or the cider cellar in winter, where he sweetens the air with the fumes of tobacco, and makes it echo to the sound of his own voice. This kind of suburban retreat is a relief to the close and confined air of a city life. The imagination long pent up behind a counter or between brick walls, with noisome smells and dingy objects, cannot bear at once to launch into the boundless expanse of the country. But shorter excursions tries, coveting something between the two, and finding it at White Condit House or the Rosemary Branch or Bagnage Wells. Editor's footnotes, White Condit House at Islington, see a description of it in Braley's Londiniana and there were several rosemary branches of old, one at Camberwell. The landlady is seen at a bow window in near perspective, with punch bowls and lemons disposed orderly around. The lime trees or poplars wave overhead to catch the breezy air, 
through which, typical of the huge dense cloud that hangs over the metropolis, curls up the thin, blue, odoriferous vapour of Virginia and Orinoco. The benches arranged in rows, the fields and hedgerows spread out their verdure. Hampstead and Highgate are seen in the background, and contain the imagination within gentle limits. Here the holiday people are playing ball. Here they are playing bowls. Here they are quaffing ale, there sipping tea. Here the loud wager is heard, there the political debate. In a sequestered nook, a slender youth with purple face and drooping head, nodding over a glass of gin toddy, breathes in tender accents. There's naught so sweet on earth as love's young dream. While Rosy Anne takes its turn, and Scots were here where Wallace bled, is thundered forth in accents that might wake the dead. In another part sit carpers and critics, who dispute the score of the reckoning or the gain, or cavil at the taste and execution of the would-be Brahms and Durisets. Of this latter class was Dr. Goodman, a man of other times, I mean those of Smollett and Defoe, who was curious in opinion, obstinate in the wrong, great in little things, and inveterate in petty warfare. I vow he held me an argument once an hour by St. Dunstan's clock, while I held an umbrella over his head, the friendly protection of which he was unwilling to quit to walk in the rain to Camberwell, to prove to me that Richard Pinch was neither a fives player nor a pleasing singer. Sir, said he, I deny that Mr. Pinch plays the game. He is a cunning player, but not a good one. I grant his tricks, his little mean dirty ways, but he is not a manly antagonist. He has no hit and no left hand. How then can he set up for a superior player? And then, as to his always striking the ball against the side wings at Copenhagen House, Kavanagh, sir, used to say, the wall was made to hit at. I have no patience with such pitiful shifts and advantages. They are an insult upon so fine and athletic a game. And as to his setting up for a singer, it's quite ridiculous. You know, Mr. Hazlitt, that to be a really excellent singer, a man must lay claim to one of two things. In the first place, sir, he must have a naturally fine ear for music, or secondly, an early education exclusively devoted to that study. But no one ever suspected Mr. Pinch of refined sensibility, and his education, as we all know, has been a little at large. Then again, why should he, of all others, be always singing Rosy Anne and Scots were hay where Wallace bled till one is sick of hearing them? It's preposterous, and I mean to tell him so. You know, I'm sure, without my hinting it, that in the first of these admired songs the sentiment is voluptuous and tender, and in the last, patriotic. Now, Pinch's romance never wandered from behind his counter, and his patriotism lies in his breeches pocket. Sir, the utmost he should aspire to would be to play upon the Jew's harp. This story of the Jew's harp tickled some of Pinch's friends, who gave him various hints of it, which nearly drove him mad till he discovered what it was. For though no jest or sarcasm ever had the least effect upon him, yet he cannot bear to think that there should be any joke of this kind about him, and he not in the secret. It makes against that knowing character which he so much affects. Pinch is in one respect a complete specimen of a cockney. He never has anything to say, and yet is never at a loss for an answer. That is, his pertness keeps exact pace with his dullness. His friend, the doctor, used to complain of this in good set terms. "'You can never make anything of Mr. Pinch,' he would say. "'Apply the most cutting remark to him, and his only answer is the same to you, sir.' If Shakespeare were to rise from the dead to confute him, I firmly believe it would be to no purpose. I assure you I have found it so. I once thought, indeed, I had him at a disadvantage, but I was mistaken. You shall hear, sir. I had been reading the following sentiment in a modern play, The Road to Ruin, by the late Mr. Holcroft. For how should the soul of Socrates inhabit the body of a stocking-weaver? This was pat to the point. You know our friend is a hosier and haberdasher. I came full with it to keep an appointment I had with Pinch, B. 
began a game, quarrelled with him in the middle of it on purpose, went upstairs to dress, and as I was washing my hands in the slop basin, watching my opportunity, turned coolly round and said, It's impossible there should be any sympathy between you and me, Mr. Pinch, for as the poet says, How should the soul of Socrates inhabit the body of a stocking weaver? I, says he, does the poet say so? Then the same to you, sir. I was confounded. I gave up the attempt to conquer him in wit or argument. He would pose the devil, sir, by his the same to you, sir. We had another joke against Richard Pinch, to which the doctor was not a party, which was that, being asked after the respectability of the hole in the wall at the time that Randall took it, he answered quite unconsciously, Oh, it's a very genteel place. I go there myself sometimes. Dr. Goodman was descended by the mother's side from the poet Jago, was a private gentleman in town and a medical dilettante in the country, dividing his time equally between business and pleasure, had an inexhaustible flow of words and an imperturbable vanity and held stout notions on the metaphysical score. He maintained the free agency of man with the spirit of a martyr and the gaiety of a man of wit and pleasure about town, told me he had a curious tract on that subject by A.C. Anthony Collins, which he carefully locked up in his box, lest anyone should see it but himself, to the detriment of their character and morals, and put it to me whether it was not hard on the principles of philosophical necessity for a man to come to be hanged, to which I replied I thought it hard on any terms. A knavish marker who had listened to the dispute laughed at this retort, and seemed to assent to the truth of it, supposing it might one day be his own case. End of section 8section number 9 of the plain speaker this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox.org recording by patrick wallace the plain speaker opinions on books men and things by william hazlitt section 9 on londoners and country people part 2 Mr. Smith and the Brangtons in Evelina are the finest possible examples of the spirit of Cockneyism. I once knew a linen draper in the city who owned to me he did not quite like this part of Miss Burney's novel. He said, I myself lodge in a first floor where there are young ladies in the house. They sometimes have company, and if I am out they ask me to lend them the use of my apartment, which I readily do out of politeness, or if it is an agreeable party I perhaps join them. All this is so like what passes in the novel that I fancy myself a sort of second Mr. Smith, and am not quite easy at it. This was mentioned to the fair authoress, and she was delighted to find that her characters were so true that an actual person fancied himself to be one of them. The resemblance, however, was only in the externals, and the real modesty of the individual stumbled on the likeness to a city coxcomb. It is curious to what a degree persons brought up in certain occupations in a great city are shut up from a knowledge of the world, and carry their simplicity to a pitch of unheard of extravagance. London is the only place in which the child grows completely up into the man. I have known characters of this kind, which, in the way of childish ignorance and self-pleasing delusion, exceeded anything to be met with in Shakespeare, or Ben Jonson, or the old comedy. For instance, the following may be taken as a true sketch. Imagine a person with a florid, shining complexion like a ploughboy, large staring teeth, a merry eye, his hair stuck into the fashion with curling irons and pomatum, a slender figure, and a decent suit of black. Add to which the thoughtlessness of the schoolboy and the forwardness of the thriving tradesman, and the plenary consciousness of the citizen of London, and you have... Mr. Dunster before you, the fishmonger in the poultry. You shall hear how he chirps over his cups and exults in his private opinions. I'll play no more with you, I said. Mr. Dunster, you are five points in the game better than I am. I had just lost three half-crown rubbers at cribbage to him, 
which loss of mine he presently thrust into a canvas pouch, not a silk purse, out of which he had produced just before, first a few halfpence, then half a dozen pieces of silver, then a handful of guineas, and lastly, lying perdu at the bottom, a fifty-pound banknote. "'I'll tell you what,' I said. "'I should like to play you a game at marbles.' This was at a sort of Christmas party, or Twelfth Night Merrymaking. "'Marbles?' said Dunster, catching up the sound, and his eye brightening with childish glee. "'What? You mean ring-tor?' "'Yes.' "'I should beat you at it to a certainty. "'I was one of the best in our school. "'It was at Clapham, sir. "'The Reverend Mr. Denman's at Clapham "'was the place where I was brought up, "'though there were two others there better than me. "'They were the best that ever were. "'I'll tell you, sir. "'I'll give you an idea. "'There was a water-butt or cistern, sir, "'at our school that turned with a cock. "'Now, suppose that brass ring "'that the window-curtain is fastened to "'to be the cock, "'and that these boys were standing where we are "'about twenty feet off.' "'Well, sir, I'll tell you what I've seen them do. "'One of them had a favourite tour, or alley, as we used to call them. "'He'd take aim at the cock of the system with his marble, as I may do now. "'Well, sir, will you believe it? "'Such was his strength and knuckle of certainty of aim. "'He'd hit it, turn it, let the water out, "'and then, sir, when the water had run out as much as it was wanted, "'the other boy, he'd just the same strength and knuckle and certainty of eye, "'he'd aim at it too. "'Be sure to hit it, turn it round, and stop the water from running out. Yes, what I tell you is very remarkable, but it's true. One of these boys was named Cock and t'other Butler. They might have been named Spigot and Fawcett, my dear sir, from your account of them. I shouldn't mind playing you at fives, neither, though I'm out of practice. I think I should beat you in a week. I was a real good one at that. A pretty game, sir. I had the finest ball that I suppose ever was seen. Made it myself. I'll tell you how, sir. You see, I put a piece of cork at the bottom, then I wound some fine worsted yarn round it, then I had to bind it round with some fine pack thread, and then sew the case on. You'd hardly believe it, but I was the envy of the old school for that ball. They all wanted to get it from me, but, Lord, sir, I would let none of them come near it. I kept it in my waistcoat pocket all day, and at night I used to take it to bed with me and put it under my pillow. I couldn't sleep easy without it. The same idle vein might be found in the country, but I doubt whether it would find a tongue to give it utterance. Cockneyism is a ground of native shallowness mounted with pertness and conceit. Yet with all this simplicity and extravagance in dilating upon his favourite topics, Dunster is a man of spirit, of attention to business, knows how to make out and get in his bills, and is far from being henpecked. One thing is certain, that such a man must be a true Englishman and a loyal subject. He has a slight tinge of letters, with shame I confess it, has in his possession a volume of the European magazine for the year 1761, and is an humble admirer of Tristram Shandy, particularly the story of the King of Bohemia and his seven castles, which is something in his own endless manner, and of Gilles Blas of saint -Yanne. Over these, the last thing before he goes to bed at night, he smokes a pipe and meditates for an hour. After all, what is there in these harmless half-lies, these fantastic exaggerations, but a literal, prosaic, cockney translation of the admired lines in Gray's Ode to Eton College? What idle progeny succeed to chase the rolling circle's speed or urge the flying ball? A man shut up all his life in his shop, without anything to interest him from one year's end to another but the cares and details of business, with scarcely any intercourse with books or opportunities for society, distracted with the buzz and glare and noise about him, turns for relief to the retrospect of his childish years, and there, through the long vista, at one bright loophole, leading out of the thorny mazes of the world into the clear morning light, he sees the idle fancies and gay amusements of his boyhood dancing like motes in the sunshine. Shall we blame or shall we laugh at him, if his eye glistens and his tongue grows wanton in their praise? None but a Scotchman would, that pragmatical sort of personage who thinks it a folly ever to have been young, and who, instead of dallying with the frail past, bends his brows upon the future and looks only to the main chance.
Forgive me, dear Dunster, if I have drawn a sketch of some of thy venial foibles, and delivered thee into the hands of these cockneys of the north, who will fall upon thee and devour thee like so many cannibals, without a grain of salt. If familiarity in cities breeds contempt, ignorance in the country breeds aversion and dislike. People come too much in contact in town, in other places they live too much apart to unite cordially and easily. Our feelings in the former case are dissipated and exhausted by being called into constant and vain activity. In the latter they rust and grow dead for want of use. If there is an air of levity and indifference in London manners, there is a harshness, a moroseness, and disagreeable restraint in those of the country. We have little disposition to sympathy when we have few persons to sympathise with. We lose the relish and capacity for social enjoyment the seldomer we meet. A habit of sullenness, coldness, and misanthropy grows upon us. If we look for hospitality and a cheerful welcome in country places, it must be in those where the arrival of a stranger is an event, the recurrence of which need not be greatly apprehended, or it must be on rare occasions, on some high festival of once a year. Then, indeed, the stream of hospitality, so long dammed up, may flow without stint for a short season, or a stranger may be expected with some sort of eager impatience, as a caravan of wild beasts, or any other natural curiosity that excites our wonder and fills up the craving of the mind after novelty. By degrees, however, even this last principle loses its effect. Books, newspapers, whatever carries us out of ourselves into a world of which we see and know nothing, become distasteful, repulsive, and we turn away with indifference or disgust from everything that disturbs our lethargic animal existence, or takes off our attention from our petty local interests and pursuits. Man, left long to himself, is no better than a mere clod, or his activity, for want of some other vent, preys upon himself, or is directed to splenetic, peevish dislikes, or vexatious, harassing persecution of others. I once drew a picture of a country life. It was a portrait of a particular place, a caricature, if you will, but with certain allowances I fear it was too like in the individual instance, and that it will hold too generally true. If these, then, are the faults and vices of the inhabitants of town or of the country, where should a man go to live so as to escape from them? I answer that in the country we have the society of the groves, the fields, the brooks, and in London a man may keep to himself or choose his company as he pleases. It appears to me that there is an amiable mixture of these two opposite characters in a person who chances to have passed his youth in London, and who has retired into the country for the rest of his life. We may find in such a one a social polish, a pastoral simplicity. He rusticates agreeably, and vegetates with a degree of sentiment. He comes to the next post-town to see for letters, watches the coaches as they pass, and eyes the passengers with a look of familiar curiosity, thinking that he too was a gay fellow in his time. He turns his horse's head down the narrow lane that leads homewards, puts on an old coat to save his wardrobe, and fills his glass nearer to the brim. As he lifts the purple juice to his lips and to his eye, and in the dim solitude that hems him round, thinks of the glowing line, This bottles the sun of our table, another sun rises upon his imagination. The sun of his youth, the blaze of vanity, the glitter of the metropolis, glares around his soul and mocks his closing eyelids. The distant roar of coaches is in his ears. The pit stare upon him with a thousand eyes. Mrs. Siddons, Bannister, King are before him. He starts as from a dream and swears he will to London. But the expense, the length of way deters him, and he rises the next morning to trace the footsteps of the hare that has brushed the dewdrops from the lawn, or to attend a meeting of magistrates. Mr. Justice Shallow answered in some sort to this description of a retired cockney and indigenous country gentleman. He knew the inns of court where they would talk of mad Shallow yet, and where the bona rovers were and had them at commandment, aye, and had heard the chimes at midnight. It is a strange state of society, such as that in London, 
where a man does not know his next-door neighbour, and where the feelings, one would think, must recoil upon themselves and either fester or become obtuse. Mr. Wordsworth, in the preface to his poem of The Excursion, represents men in cities as so many wild beasts or evil spirits, shut up in cells of ignorance without natural affections and barricadoed down in sensuality and selfishness. The nerve of humanity is bound up, according to him, the circulation of the blood stagnates. And it would be so if men were merely cut off from intercourse with their immediate neighbours, and did not meet together generally and more at large. But man in London becomes, as Mr. Burke has it, a sort of public creature, he lives in the eye of the world, and the world in his. If he witnesses less of the details of private life, he has better opportunities of observing its larger masses and varied movements. He sees the stream of human life pouring along the streets, its comforts and embellishments piled up in the shops. The houses are proofs of the industry, the public buildings of the art and magnificence of man, while the public amusements and places of resort are a centre and support for social feeling. A playhouse alone is a school of humanity, where all eyes are fixed on the same gay or solemn scene, where smiles or tears are spread from face to face, and where a thousand hearts beat in unison. Look at the company in a country theatre, in comparison, and see the coldness, the sullenness, the want of sympathy, and the way in which they turn round to scan and scrutinise one another. In London there is a public, and each man is part of it, we are gregarious and affect the kind. We have a sort of abstract existence, and a community of ideas and knowledge, rather than local proximity, is the bond of society and good fellowship. This is one great cause of the tone of political feeling in large and populous cities. There is here a visible body politic, a type and image of that huge leviathan, the state. We comprehend that vast denomination, the people, of which we see a tenth part daily moving before us. And by having our imaginations emancipated from petty interests and personal dependence, we learn to venerate ourselves as men and to respect the rights of human nature. Therefore it is that the citizens and freemen of London and Westminster are patriots by prescription, philosophers and politicians by the right of their birthplace. In the country, men are no better than a herd of cattle or scattered deer, they have no idea but of individuals, none of rights or principles, and a king as the greatest individual is the highest idea they can form. He is a species alone, and as superior to any single peasant as the latter is to the peasant's dog or to a crow flying over his head. In London, the king is but one to a million, numerically speaking, is seldom seen, and then distinguished only from others by the superior graces of his person. A country squire, or a lord of the manor, is a greater man in his village or hundred. End of section 9 Recording by Patrick Wallace Section 10 of The Plain Speaker This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Marianne. The Plain Speaker. Opinions on Books, Men, and Things. By William Hazlitt. Section 10. On the Spirit of Obligations. The two rarest things to be met with are good sense and good nature. For one man who judges right, there are twenty who can say good things, as there are numbers who will serve you, or do friendly actions, for one who really wishes you well. It has been said, and often repeated, that mere good nature is a fool, but I think that the dearth of sound sense, for the most part, proceeds from the want of a real, unaffected interest in things, except as they react upon ourselves, or from the neglect of the maxim of that good old philanthropist who said, Nihil humani, a me alienum puto. The narrowness of the heart warps the understanding, and makes us weigh objects in the scales of our self-love, instead of those of truth and justice. We consider not the merits of the case, or what is due to others, 
but the manner in which our own credit or consequence will be affected, and adapt our opinions and conduct to the last of these rather than the first. The judgment is seldom wrong where the feelings are right, and they generally are so, provided they are warm and sincere. He who intends others well is likely to advise them for the best. He who has any cause at heart seldom ruins it by his imprudence. Those who play the public, or their friends' slippery tricks, have in secret no objection to betray them. One finds out the folly and malice of mankind by the impertinence of friends, by their professions of service and tenders of advice, by their fears for your reputation and anticipation of what the world may say to you, by which means they suggest objections to your enemies, and at the same time absolve themselves of the task of justifying your errors, by having warned you of the consequences, by the care with which they tell you ill news, and conceal from you any flattering circumstance, by their dread of your engaging in any creditable attempt, and mortification if you succeed, by the difficulties and hindrances they throw in your way, by their satisfaction when you happen to make a slip or get into a scrape, and their determination to tie your hands behind you, lest you should get out of it, by their panic terrors at your entering into a vindication of yourself, lest in the course of it you should call upon them for a certificate of your character, by their lukewarmness in defending, by their readiness in betraying you, by the high standard by which they try you, and to which you can hardly ever come up, by their forwardness to partake your triumphs, by their backwardness to share your disgrace, by their acknowledgment of your errors out of candor, and suppression of your good qualities out of envy, by their not contradicting, or by their joining in the cry against you, lest they, too, should become objects of the same abuse, by their playing the game into your adversary's hands, by always letting their imaginations take part with their cowardice, their vanity, and their selfishness against you, and thus realizing or hastening all the ill consequences they affect to deplore by spreading abroad that very spirit of distrust, obloquy, and hatred which they predict will be excited against you. In all these pretended demonstrations of an over-anxiety for our welfare, we may detect a good deal of spite and ill-nature lurking under the disguise of a friendly and officious zeal. It is wonderful how much love of mischief and rankling spleen lies at the bottom of the human heart, and how a constant supply of gall seems as necessary to the health and activity of the mind as of the body. Yet perhaps it ought not to excite much surprise that this gnawing, morbid, acrimonious temper should produce the effect it does, when, if it does not vent itself on others, it preys upon our own comforts, and makes us see the worst side of everything, even as it regards our own prospects and tranquillity. It is the not being comfortable in ourselves that makes us seek to render other people uncomfortable. A person of this character will advise you against a prosecution for a libel, and shake his head at your attempting to shield yourself from a shower of calumny. It is not that he is afraid you will be non-suited, but that you will gain a verdict. They caution you against provoking hostility, in order that you may submit to indignity. They say that, if you publish a certain work, it will be your ruin, hoping that it will, and by their tragic denunciations, bringing about this very event as far as it lies in their power, or at any rate, enjoying a premature triumph over you in the meantime. What I would say to any friend who may be disposed to foretell a general outcry against any work of mine, would be to request him to judge and speak of it for himself, as he thinks it deserves, and not by his overweening scruples and qualms of conscience on my account, to afford those very persons whose hostility he depreciates the cue they are to give to party prejudice, and which they may justify by his authority. Suppose you are about to give lectures at a public institution. These friends and well-wishers hope you will be turned out if you preserve your principles. They are sure you will. Is it that your consistency gives them any concern? No, but they are uneasy at your gaining a chance of a little popularity. They do not like this new feather in your cap. They wish to see it struck out, for the sake of your character. And when this was once the case, 
it would be an additional relief to them to see your character following the same road the next day. The exercise of their bile seems to be the sole employment and gratification of such people. They deal in the miseries of human life. They are always either hearing or foreboding some new grievance. They cannot contain their satisfaction. If you tell them any mortification or cross accident that has happened to yourself, and if you complain of their want of sympathy, they laugh in your face. This would be unaccountable, but for the spirit of perversity and contradiction implanted in human nature. If things go right, there is nothing to be done. These active-minded persons grow restless, dull, vapid. Life is asleep, a sort of euthanasia. Let them go wrong, and all is well again. They are once more on the alert, have something to pester themselves and other people about, may wrangle on, and make mouths at the invisible event. Luckily there is no want of materials for this disposition to work upon. There is plenty of grist for the mill. If you fall in love, they tell you, by way of consolation, it is a pity that you do not fall downstairs and fracture a limb. It would be a relief to your mind, and show you your folly. So they would reform the world. The class of persons I speak of are almost uniform grumblers, and croakers against governments. And it must be confessed, governments are of great service in fostering their humors. Born for their use, they live but to oblige them. While kings are left free to exercise their proper functions, and poet laureates make out their mittimus to heaven without a warrant, they will never stop the mouths of the censorious by changing their dispositions. The juices of faction will ferment, and the secretions of the state will be duly performed. I do not mind when a character of this sort meets a minister of state like an east wind round a corner, and gives him an ague fit. But why should he meddle with me? Why should he tell me that I write too much? and say that I should gain reputation if I could contrive to starve for a twelve-month, or if I applied to him for a loan of fifty pounds for present necessities, send me word back that he has too much regard for me to comply with my request. It is unhandsome irony. It is not friendly. Tis not pardonable. I like a real good nature and good will, better than I do any offers of patronage or plausible rules for my conduct in life. I may suspect the soundness of the last, and I may not be quite sure of the motives of the first. People complain of ingratitude for benefits, and of the neglect of wholesome advice. In the first place, we pay little attention to advice, because we are seldom thought of in it. The person who gives it either contents himself to lay down, ex cathedra, certain vague general maxims and wise saws which we knew before, or, instead of considering what we ought to do, recommends what he himself would do. He merely substitutes his own will, caprice, and prejudices for ours, and expects us to be guided by them. Instead of changing places with us, to see what is best to be done in the given circumstances, he insists on our looking at the question from his point of view, and acting in such a manner as to please him. This is not at all reasonable, for one man's meat, according to the old adage, is another man's poison. And is it not strange that starting from such opposite premises we should seldom jump in a conclusion, and that the art of giving and taking advice is little better than a game at cross-purposes? I have observed that those who are the most inclined to assist others are the least forward or peremptory with their advice, for having our interest really at heart, they consider what can, rather than what cannot, be done and aid our views and endeavor to alert ill consequences by moderating our impatience and allaying irritations, instead of thwarting our main design, which only tends to make us more extravagant and violent than ever. In the second place, benefits are often conferred out of ostentation or pride, rather than from true regard, and the person obliged is too apt to perceive this. People who are fond of appearing in the light of patrons will perhaps go through fire and water to serve you, who yet would be sorry to find you no longer wanted their assistance, and whose friendship cools and their goodwill slackens, as you are relieved by their active zeal from the necessity of being further beholden to it. Compassion and generosity are their favorite virtues, and they countenance you, as you afford them opportunities for exercising them. The instant you can go alone, or can stand upon your own ground, 
you are discarded as unfit for their purpose. This is something more than mere good nature or humanity. A thoroughly good-natured man, a real friend, is one who is pleased at our good fortune, as well as prompt to seize every occasion of relieving our distress. We apportion our gratitude accordingly. We are thankful for good will rather than for services, for the motive than the quantum of favor received. A kind word or look is never forgotten, while we cancel prouder and weightier obligations. And those who esteem us or evince a particularity to us are those whom we still consider as our best friends. Nay, so strong is this feeling, that we extend it even to those counterfeits in friendship, flatters and sycophants. Our self-love, rather than our self-interest, is the master key to our affections. I am not convinced that those are always the best-natured or best-conditioned men who busy themselves most with the distresses of their fellow-creatures. I do not know that those whose names stand at the head of all subscriptions to charitable institutions, and who are perpetual stewards of dinners and meetings to encourage and promote the establishment of asylums for the relief of the blind, the halt, and the orphan poor, are persons gifted with the best tempers or the kindliest feelings. I do not dispute their virtue. I doubt their sensibility. I am not here speaking of those who make a trade of the profession of humanity, or set their names down out of mere idle pride and vanity. I mean those who really enter into the details and drudgery of this sort of service, con amore, and who delight in surveying and in diminishing the amount of human misery. I conceive it possible that a person who is going to pour oil and balm into the wounds of afflicted humanity at the meeting of the Western Dispensary, by handsome speeches and by a handsome donation, not grudgingly given, may be thrown into a fit of rage that very morning by having his toast too much buttered, may quarrel with the innocent prattle and amusements of his children, cry pish at every observation his wife utters, and scarcely feel a moment's comfort at any period of his life, except when he hears or reads of some case of pressing distress that calls for his immediate interference, and draws off his attention from his own situation and feelings by the act of alleviating it. Those martyrs to the cause of humanity, in short, who run the gauntlet of the whole catalogue of unheard-of crimes and afflicting casualties, who ransack prisons, and plunge into laser-houses and slave-ships as their daily amusement and highest luxury, must generally, I think, though not always, be prompted to the arduous task by uneasy feelings of their own, and supported through it by iron nerves. Their fortitude must be equal to their pity. I do not think Mr. Wilberforce a case in point in this argument. He is evidently a delicately framed, nervous, sensitive man. I should suppose him to be a kind and affectionately disposed person in all the relations of life. His weakness is too quick a sense of reputation, a desire to have the good word of all men, a tendency to truckle to power and fawn to opinion. But there are some of these philanthropists that a physiognomist has hard work to believe in. They seem made of pasteboard. They look like mere machines. Their benevolence may be said to go on rollers, and they are screwed to the sticking place by the wheels and pulleys of humanity. If to their share some splendid virtues fall, look in their face, and you forget them all. They appear so much the creatures of the head, and so little of the heart. They are so cold, so lifeless, so mechanical, so much governed by calculation, and so little by impulse, that it seems the toss-up of a halfpenny, a mere turn of a feather, whether such people should become a Granville Sharp, or a Hubert in King John, a Howard, or a Sir Hudson Lowe. Charity covers a multitude of sins. Wherever it is, there nothing can be wanting. Wherever it is not, all else is vain. The merest peasant on the bleakest mountain is not without a portion of it, says Stern. He finds the lacerated lamb of another's flock, etc. I do not think education or circumstance can ever entirely eradicate this principle. Some professions may be supposed to blunt it, but it is perhaps more in appearance than in reality. Butchers are not allowed to sit on a jury for life and death, but probably this is a prejudice. If they have the destructive organ in an unusual degree of expansion, 
They vent their sanguinary inclinations on the brute creation. And besides, they look too jolly, rosy, and in good case, they and their wives, to harbor much cruelty in their dispositions. Neither would I swear that a man was humane merely for abstaining from animal food. A tiger would not be a lamb, though it fed on milk. Surgeons are in general thought to be unfeeling, and steeled by custom to the sufferings of humanity. They may be so, as far as it relates to broken bones and bruises, but not to other things. Nor are they necessarily so in their professions, for we find different degrees of callous insensibility in different individuals. Some practitioners have an evident delight in alarming the apprehensions and cutting off the limbs of their patients. These would have been ill-natured men in any situation in life, and merely make an excuse of their profession to indulge their natural ill-humor and brutality of temper. A surgeon who is fond of giving pain to those who consult him will not spare the feelings of his neighbors in other respects. He has a tendency to probe other wounds besides those of the body, and is altogether a harsh and disagreeable character. A jack ketch may be known to tie the fatal noose with trembling fingers, or a jailer may have a heart softer than the walls of his prison. There have been instances of highwaymen who were proverbially gentlemen. I have seen a Bow Street officer, not but that the transition is ungracious and unjust, reading Racine and following the recitation of Talma at the door of a room where he was set to guard. Police magistrates, from the scenes they have to witness and the characters they come in contact with, may be supposed to lose the fine edge of delicacy and sensibility. Yet they are not all alike, but differ, as one star differs from another in magnitude. One is as remarkable for mildness and lenity, as another is notorious for harshness and severity. The late Mr. Justice Fielding was a member of this profession, which, however little accordant with his own feelings, he made pleasant to those of others. He generally sent away the disputants in that unruly region, where he presided, tolerably satisfied. I have often seen him escaped from the noisy repulsive scene, sunning himself in the adjoining walks of St. James's Park, and with mild aspect and lofty but unwielding mien, eyeing the verdant glades and lengthening vistas where perhaps his childhood loitered, he had a strong resemblance to his father, the immortal author of Tom Jones. I never passed him that I did not take off my hat to him in spirit. I could not help thinking of Parson Adams, of Booth and Amelia. I seemed to belong by intellectual adoption to the same family, and would willingly have acknowledged my obligations to the father, to the son. He had something of the air of Colonel Bath. When young, he had very excellent prospects in the law, but neglected a brief sent him by the Attorney General in order to attend a glee club, for which he had engaged to furnish a rondeau. This spoiled his fortune. A man whose object is to please himself, or to keep his word to his friends, is the last man to thrive at court. Yet he looked serene and smiling to his latest breath, conscious of the goodness of his own heart, and of not having sullied a name that had thrown a light upon humanity. There are different modes of obligation, and different avenues to gratitude and favor. A man may lend his countenance who would not part with his money, and may open his mind to us who will not draw out his purse. How many ways are there in which our peace may be assailed, besides actual want? How many comforts do we stand in need of, besides meat and drink and clothing? Is it nothing to administer to a mind diseased, to heal a wounded spirit? After all other difficulties are removed, we still want some one to bear with our infirmities, to impart our confidence to, to encourage us in our hobbies, nay, to get up and ride behind us, and to like us with all our faults. True friendship is self-love at second hand, where, as in a flattering mirror, we may see our virtues magnified and our errors softened, and where we may fancy our opinion of ourselves confirmed by an impartial and faithful witness. He, of all the world, creeps closest to our bosoms, into our favor and esteem, who thinks of us most nearly as we do of ourselves. Such a one is indeed the pattern of a friend, another self. 
and our gratitude for the blessing is as sincere as it is hollow in most other cases. This is one reason why entire friendship is scarce to be found except in love. There is a hardness and severity in our judgments of one another. The spirit of competition also intervenes, unless where there is too great an inequality of pretension or difference of taste to admit mutual sympathy and respect. But a woman's vanity is interested in making the object of her choice the god of her idolatry, and in the intercourse with that sex there is the finest balance and reflection of opposite and answering excellencies imaginable. It is in the highest spirit of the religion of love in the female breast that Lord Byron has put that beautiful apostrophe in the mouth of Anna, in speaking of her angel lover. Alas, are not the sons of men, too, when they are deified in the hearts of women, only a little lower than the angels? And when I think that his immortal wings shall one day hover o'er the sepulchre of the poor child of clay that so adored him, as he adored the highest, death becomes less terrible. This is a dangerous string, which I ought never to touch upon, but the shattered cords vibrate of themselves. The difference of age, of situation in life, and an absence of all considerations of business have, I apprehend, something of the same effect in producing a refined and abstracted friendship. The person whose doors I enter with the most pleasure, and quit with the most regret, never did me the smallest favor. I once did him an uncalled-for service, and we nearly quarreled about it. If I were in the utmost distress, I should just as soon think of asking his assistance as of stopping a person in the highway. Practical benevolence is not his forte. He leaves the profession of that to others. His habits, his theory, are against it as idle and vulgar. His hand is closed, but what of that? His eye is ever open, and reflects the universe. His silver accents, beautiful, venerable as his silver hairs, but not scanted, flow as a river. I never ate or drank in his house, nor do I know or care how the flies or spiders fare in it, or whether a mouse can get a living. But I know that I can get there what I get nowhere else, a welcome, as if one was expected to drop in at just that moment, a total absence of all respect of persons, and of airs of self-consequence, endless topics of discourse, refined thoughts, made more striking by ease and simplicity of manner, the husk, the shell of humanity is left at the door, and the spirit mellowed by time resides within. All you have to do is to sit and listen, and it is like hearing one of Titian's faces speak. To think of worldly matters is a profanation, like that of the money changers in the temple, or it is to regard the bread and wine of the sacrament with carnal eyes. We enter the enchanter's cell and converse with the divine inhabitant. To have this privilege always at hand, and to be circled by that spell whenever we choose, with an enter sasami, is better than sitting at the lower end of the tables of the great, than eating awkwardly from gold plate, than drinking fulsome toasts, or being thankful for gross favors, and gross insults. A few things tend more to alienate friendship than a want of punctuality in our engagements. I have known the breach of a promise to dine or sup to break up more than one intimacy. A disappointment of this kind rankles in the mind. It cuts up our pleasures, those are rare events in human life, which ought not to be wantonly sported with. It not only deprives us of the expected gratification, but renders us unfit for, and out of humor with, every other. It makes us think our society not worth having which is not the way to make us delighted with our own thoughts. It lessens our self-esteem and destroys our confidence in others. And having leisure on our hands, by being thus left alone, and sufficient provocation withal, we employ it in ripping up the faults of the acquaintance who has played us this slippery trick, and in forming resolutions to pick a quarrel with him the very first opportunity we can find. I myself once declined an invitation to meet Talma, who was an admirer of Shakespeare, and who idolized Bonaparte, to keep an appointment with a friend who had forgot it. One great art of women, who pretend to manage their husbands and keep them to themselves, 
is to contrive some excuse for breaking their engagements with their friends for whom they entertain any respect, or who are likely to have any influence over them. There is, however, a class of persons who have a particular satisfaction in falsifying your expectations of pleasure in their society, who make appointments for no other ostensible purpose than not to keep them, who think their ill behavior gives them an air of superiority over you, instead of placing them at your mercy, and who, in fact, in all their overtures of condescending kindness towards you, treat you exactly as if there was no such person in the world. Friendship is with them a monodrama, in which they play the principal and sole part. They must needs be very imposing or amusing characters to surround themselves with a circle of friends, who find that they are to be mere ciphers. The egotism would in such instances be offensive and intolerable, if its very excess did not render it entertaining. Some individuals carry this hard, unprincipled, reckless unconsciousness of everything but themselves and their own purposes to such a pitch that they may be compared to automata, whom you never expect to consult your feelings or alter their movements out of compliance to others. They are wound up to a certain point by an internal machinery which you do not very well comprehend, but they perform their accustomed evolutions so as to excite your wonder or laughter. It is all very well, you do not quarrel with them, but look on at the pantomime of friendship while it lasts or is agreeable. There are, I may add here, a happy few, whose manner is so engaging and delightful, that, injure you how they will, they cannot offend you. They rob, ruin, ridicule you, and you cannot find in your heart to say a word against them. The late Mr. Sheridan was a man of this kind. He could not make enemies. If any one came to request the repayment of a loan from him, he borrowed more. A cordial shake of his hand was a receipt in full for all demands. He could coin his smile for drachmas, cancelled bonds with bon mots, and gave jokes in discharge of a bill. A friend of his said, If I pull off my hat to him in the street, it costs me fifty pounds, and if he speaks to me, it's a hundred. Only one other reflection occurs to me on this subject. I used to think better of the world than I do. I thought its great fault, its original sin, was barbarous ignorance and want, which would be cured by the diffusion of civilization and letters. But I find, or fancy I do, that as selfishness is the vice of unlettered periods and nations, envy is the bane of more refined and intellectual ones. Vanity springs out of the grave of sordid self-interest. Men were formerly ready to cut one another's throats about the gross means of subsistence, and now they are ready to do it about reputation. The worst is, you are no better off if you fail than if you succeed. You are despised if you do not excel others, and hated if you do. Abuse or praise equally weans your friends from you. We cannot bear eminence in our own department or pursuit, and think it an impertinence in any other. Instead of being delighted with the profits of excellence and the admiration paid to it, we are mortified with it, thrive only by the defeat of others, and live on the carcass of mangled reputation. By being tried by an ideal standard of vanity and affection, real objects and common people become odious or insipid. Instead of being raised, all is prostituted, degraded, vile. Everything is reduced to this feverish, importunate, harassing state. I am heartily sick of it, and I'm sure I have reason, if any one has. End of section 10section 11 of the plain speaker this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox.org recording by nicole lee the plain speaker opinions on Books, Men, and Things by William Hazlitt Section 11 On the Old Age of Artists 
Mr. Nollikens died the other day at the age of eighty and left two hundred and forty thousand pounds behind him and the name of one of our best English sculptors. There was a great scramble among the legatees, a codicil to a will with large bequests unsigned, and that last triumph of the dead or dying over those who survive, hopes raised and defeated without a possibility of retaliation, or the smallest use in complaint. The king was at first said to be left residuary legatee. This would have been a fine instance of romantic and gratuitous homage to majesty in a man who all his lifetime could never be made to comprehend the abstract idea of the distinction of ranks or even of persons. He would go up to the Duke of York or Prince of Wales in spite of warning, take them familiarly by the button like common acquaintance, ask them how their father did, and express pleasure at hearing he was well, saying, When he was gone, we should never get such another. He once, when the old king was sitting to him for his bust, fairly stuck a pair of compasses into his nose to measure the distance from the upper lip to the forehead, as if he had been measuring a block of marble. His late majesty laughed heartily at this, and was amused to find that there was a person in the world, ignorant of that vast interval which separated him from every other man. Nollikens, with all his loyalty, merely liked the man and cared nothing about the king, which was one of those mixed modes, as Mr. Locke calls them, of which he had no more idea than if he had been one of the cream-coloured horses, handled him like so much common clay, and had no other notion of the matter, but that it was his business to make the best bust of him he possibly could, and to set about it in the regular way. There was something in this plainness and simplicity that savoured, perhaps, of the hardness and dryness of his art, and of his own peculiar severity of manner. He conceived that one man's head differed from another's only as it was a better or worse subject for modelling, that a bad bust was not made into a good one by being stuck upon a pedestal or by any painting or varnishing, and that by whatever name he was called, a man's a man for all that. A sculptor's ideas must, I should guess, be somewhat rigid and inflexible, like the materials in which he works. Besides, Nollikens' style was comparatively hard and edgy. He had as much truth and character, but none of the polished graces or transparent softness of Chantry. He had more of the rough, plain, downright honesty of his art. It seemed to be his character. Mr. Northcote was once complimenting him on his acknowledged superiority. Aye, you made the best busts of anybody. I don't know about that, said the other, his eyes, though their orbs were quenched, smiling with a gleam of smothered delight. I only know I always tried to make them as like as I could. I saw this eminent and singular person one morning in Mr. Northcote's painting-room. He had then been for some time blind, and had been obliged to lay aside the exercise of his profession. But he still took a pleasure in designing groups, and in giving directions to others for executing them. He and Northcote made a remarkable pair. He sat down on a low stool, from being rather fatigued, rested with both hands on a stick, as if he clung to the solid and tangible, had an habitual twitch in his limbs and motions, as if catching himself in the act of going too far, in chiselling a lip or a dimple in a chin, was bolt upright, with features hard and square, but finely cut, a hooked nose, thin lips, an indented forehead, 
and the defect in his sight completed his resemblance to one of his own masterly busts. He seemed, by time and labour, to have wrought himself to stone. Northcote stood by his side, all air and spirit, stooping down to speak to him. The painter was in a loose morning gown, with his back to the light. His face was like a pale, fine piece of colouring, and his eye came out and glanced through the twilight of the past, like an old eagle looking from its eyrie in the clouds. In a moment they had lighted from the top of Mount Chenis in the Vatican, as when a vulture on Emmaus bread flies towards the springs of Ganges and Hydaspes Indian streams. These two fine old men lighted with winged thoughts on the banks of the Tiber, and there bathed and drank of the spirit of their youth. They talked of Titian and Bernini, and Northcote mentioned that when Rubiac came back from Rome, after seeing the works of the latter, and went to look at his own in Westminster Abbey, he said, By God, they look like tobacco pipes. They then recalled a number of anecdotes of Day, a fellow student of theirs, of Barry and Fuseli. Sir Joshua and Burke and Johnson were talked of. The names of these great sons of memory were in the room, and they almost seemed to answer to them. Genius and fame flung a spell into the air, and by the force of blear illusion had drawn me on to my confusion, had I not been long ere this siren-proof. It is delightful, though painful, to hear two veterans in art thus talking over the adventures and studies of their youth. When one feels that they are not quite mortal, that they have one imperishable part about them, and that they are conscious as they approach the furthest verge of humanity in friendly intercourse and tranquil decay, that they have done something that will live after them. The consolations of religion apart, this is perhaps the only salve that takes out the sting of that sore evil death, and by lessening the impatience and alarm at his approach, often tempts him to prolong the term of his delay. It has been remarked that artists, or at least academicians, live long. It is but a short while ago that Northcote, Nollikens, West, Flaxman, Cosway and Fuseli were all living at the same time, in good health and spirits, without any diminution of faculties, all of them having long passed their grand climacteric, and attained to the highest reputation in their several departments. From these striking examples, the diploma of a royal academician seems to be a grant of a longer lease of life, among its other advantages. In fact, it is tantamount to the conferring a certain reputation in his profession and a competence on any man, and thus supplies the wants of the body and sets his mind at ease. Artists in general, poor devils, I am afraid, are not a long-lived race. They break up commonly about forty, their spirits giving way, with the disappointment of their hopes of excellence, or the want of encouragement for that which they have attained, their plans disconcerted, and their affairs irretrievable, and in this state of mortification and embarrassment, more or less prolonged and aggravated, they are either starved or else drink themselves to death. But your academician is quite a different sort of person. He bears a charmed life that must not yield to duns or critics or patrons. He is free of Parnassus and claims all the immunities of fame in his lifetime. He has but to paint, as the sun has but to shine, to baffle envious maligners. He has but to send his pictures to the exhibition of Somerset House in order to have them hung up. He has but to dine once a year with the Academy, the Nobility, the Cabinet Minister and the members of the Royal Family 
in order not to want a dinner all the rest of the year. Shall hunger come near the man that has feasted with princes? Shall a bailiff tap the shoulder on which a marquis has familiarly leaned? That has been dubbed with knighthood? No. Even the fell sergeant death stands, as it were, aloof, and he enjoys a kind of premature immortality in recorded honours and endless labours. Oh, what golden hours are his! In the short days of winter, he husbands time. The long evenings of summer still find him employed. He paints on, and takes no thought for to-morrow. All is right in that respect. His bills are regularly paid. His drafts are duly honoured. He has exercise for his body, employment for his mind, in his profession, and without ever stirring out of his painting-room. He studies as much of other things as he pleases. He goes into the best company, or talks with his sitters, attends at the academy meetings, and enters into their intrigues and cabals, or stays at home, and enjoys the otium cum dignitate. If he is fond of reputation, fame watches him at work, and weaves a woof like Iris over his head. If he is fond of money, Plutus digs a mine under his feet. Whatever he touches becomes gold. He is paid half price before he begins, and commissions pour in upon commissions. His portraits are like, and his historical pieces fine, for to question the talents or success of a royal academician is to betray your own want of taste. Or if his pictures are not quite approved, he is an agreeable man and converses well, or he is a person of elegant accomplishments, dresses well, and is an ornament to a private circle. A man is not an academician for nothing. His life spins round on its soft axle. And in a round of satisfied desires and pleasing avocations, without any of the wear and tear of thought or business, there seems no reason why it should not run smoothly on to its last sand. Of all the academicians, the painters, or persons I have ever known, Mr. Northcote is the most to my taste. It may be said of him truly, age cannot wither nor custom stale his infinite variety. Indeed, it is not possible he should become tedious, since, even if he repeats the same thing, it appears quite new from his manner that breathes new life into it, and from his eye that is as fresh as the morning. How you hate any one who tells the same story, or anticipates a remark of his, it seems so coarse and vulgar, so dry and inanimate. There is something like injustice in this preference, but no, it is a tribute to the spirit that is in the man. Mr. Northcote's manner is completely extempore. It is just the reverse of Mr. Canning's oratory. All his thoughts come upon him unawares, and for this reason they surprise and delight you, because they have evidently the same effect upon his mind. There is the same unconsciousness in his conversation that has been pointed out in Shakespeare's dialogues. Or you are startled with one observation after another, as when the mist gradually withdraws from a landscape and unfolds objects one by one. His figure is small, shadowy, emaciated, but you think only of his face, which is fine and expressive. His body is out of the question. It is impossible to convey an adequate idea of the naivete and unaffected but delightful ease of the way in which he goes on, now touching upon a picture, now looking for his snuff-box, now alluding to some book he has been reading, now returning to his favourite art. He seems just as if he was by himself, or in the company of his own thoughts and makes you feel quite at home. If it is a member of Parliament, or a beautiful woman, or a child, or a young artist that drops in, it makes no difference. He enters into conversation with them in the same unconstrained manner 
as if they were inmates in his family. Sometimes you find him sitting on the floor like a schoolboy at play, turning over a set of old prints. And I was pleased to hear him say the other day, coming to one of some men putting off in a boat from a shipwreck, that is the grandest and most original thing I ever did. This was not egotism, but had all the beauty of truth and sincerity. The print was indeed a noble and spirited design. The circumstance from which it was taken happened to Captain Englefield and his crew. He told Northcote the story, sat for his own head, and brought the men from Wapping to sit for theirs. And these he had arranged into a formal composition, till one Geoffrey, a conceited but clever artist of that day, called in upon him and said, Oh, that commonplace thing will never do. It is like West. You should throw them into an action something like this. Accordingly, the head of the boat was reared up, like a seahorse riding the waves, and the elements put into commotion. And when the painter looked at it, the last thing, as he went out of his room, in the dusk of the evening, he said that it frightened him. He retained the expression in the faces of the men, nearly as they sat to him. It is very fine, and truly English, and being natural, it was easily made into history. There is a portrait of a young gentleman striving to get into the boat, while the crew are pushing him off with their oars, but at last he prevailed with them by his perseverance and entreaties to take him in. They had only time to throw a bag of biscuits into the boat before the ship went down, which they divided into a biscuit a day for each man, dipping them into water which they collected by holding up their handkerchiefs in the rain and squeezing it into a bottle. They were out sixteen days in the Atlantic and got ashore at some place in Spain where the great difficulty was to prevent them from eating too much at once, so as to recover gradually. Captain Englefield observed that he suffered more afterwards than at the time, that he had horrid dreams of falling down precipices for a long while after, that in the boat they told merry stories and kept up one another's spirits as well as they could, and on some complaint being made of their distressed situation, the young gentleman who had been admitted into their crew remarked, Nay, we are not so badly off neither. We are not come to eating one another yet. Thus, whatever is the subject of discourse, the scene is revived in his mind, and every circumstance brought before you without affectation or effort, just as it happened. It might be called picture-talking. He has always some pat allusion or anecdote. A young engraver came into his room the other day with a print which he had put into the crown of his hat in order not to crumple it, and he said it had been nearly blown away several times in passing along the street. You put me in mind, said Northcote, of a bird-catcher at Plymouth, who used to put the birds he had caught into his hat to bring them home, and one day, meeting my father in the road, he pulled off his hat to make him a low bow, and all the birds flew away. Sometimes Mr. Northcote gets to the top of a ladder to paint a palm tree or to finish a sky in one of his pictures, and in this situation he listens very attentively to anything you tell him. I was once mentioning some strange inconsistencies of our modern poets, and on coming to one that exceeded the rest, he descended the steps of the ladder one by one, laid his palette and brushes deliberately on the ground, and coming up to me said, You don't say so, it's the very thing I should have supposed of them. Yet these are the men that speak against Pope and Dryden. Never any sarcasms were so fine, so cutting, so careless as his. The grossest things from his lips seem an essence of refinement. The most refined become more so than ever. Hear him talk of Pope's epistle to Jervis, and repeat the lines, Yet should the graces all thy figures place, And breathe an air divine on every face, Yet should the muses bid my numbers roll, Strong as their charms, and gentle as their soul. 
with Zeus's Helen, thy bridge water by, and these be sung till Granville's Myra die. Alas, how little from the grave we claim! Thou but preserves a face, and I a name. Or let him speak of Boccaccio, and his story of Isabella, and her pot of basil, in which she kept her lover's head, and watered it with her tears, and how it grew, and it grew, and it grew. And you see his own eyes glisten, and the leaves of the basil tree tremble to his faltering accents. Mr. Fuseli's conversation is more striking and extravagant, but less pleasing and natural than Mr. Northcote's. He deals in paradoxes and caricatures. He talks allegories and personifications as he paints them. You are sensible of effort without any repose, no careless pleasantry, no traits of character or touches from nature. Everything is laboured or overdone. His ideas are gnarled, hard, and distorted, like his features, his theories stalking and straddle-legged, like his gait, his projects aspiring and gigantic, like his gestures, his performance uncouth and dwarfish, like his person. His pictures are also like himself, with eyeballs of stone stuck in rims of tin, and muscles twisted together, like ropes or wires. Yet Fuseli is undoubtedly a man of genius, and capable of the most wild and grotesque combinations of fancy. It is a pity that he ever applied himself to painting, which must always be reduced to the test of the senses. He is a little like Dante or Ariosto, perhaps, but no more like Michelangelo, Raphael, or Correggio than I am. In nature, he complains, puts him out. Yet he can laugh at artists who paint ladies with iron lapdogs, and he describes the great masters of old in words or lines full of truth, and glancing from a pen or tongue of fire. I conceive any person would be more struck with Mr. Fuseli at first sight, but would wish to visit Mr. Northcote oftener. There is a bold and startling outline in his style of talking, but not the delicate finishing or bland tone that there is in that of the latter. Whatever there is harsh or repulsive about him is, however, in a great degree carried off, by his animated foreign accent and broken English, which give character where there is none, and soften its asperities where it is too abrupt and violent. Compared to either of these artists, West, the late president of the Royal Academy, was a thoroughly mechanical and commonplace person, a man of no mark or likelihood. He too was small, thin, but with regular, well-formed features, and a precise, sedate, self-satisfied air. This in part arose from the conviction in his own mind that he was the greatest painter, and consequently the greatest man, in the world. Kings and nobles were common, everyday folks, but there was but one West in the many peopled globe. If there was any one individual with whom he was inclined to share the palm of undivided superiority. It was with Bonaparte. When Mr. West had painted a picture, he thought it was perfect. He had no idea of anything in the art but rules, and these he exactly conformed to. So that, according to his theory, what he did was quite right. He conceived of painting as a mechanical or scientific process, and had no more doubt of a face or a group in one of his high ideal compositions being what it ought to be, than a carpenter has that he has drawn a line straight with a ruler and a piece of chalk, or than a mathematician has that the three angles of a triangle are equal to two right ones. When Mr. West walked through his gallery, the result of fifty years' labour, 
he saw nothing, either on the right or the left, to be added or taken away. The account he gave of his own pictures, which might seem like ostentation or rodomontade, had a sincere and infantine simplicity in it. When someone spoke of his St. Paul shaking off the serpent from his arm, at Greenwich Hospital, I believe, he said, A little burst of genius, sir. West was one of those happy mortals who had not an idea of anything beyond himself or his own actual powers and knowledge. I once heard him say in a public room that he thought he had quite as good an idea of Athens from reading the travelling catalogues of the place as if he lived there for years. I believe this was strictly true, and that he would have come away with the same slender, literal, unenriched idea of it as he went. Looking at a picture of Rubens, which he had in his possession, he said with great indifference, What a pity that this man wanted expression! This natural self-complacency might be strengthened by collateral circumstances of birth and religion. West, as a native of America, might be supposed to own no superior in the commonwealth of art. As a Quaker, he smiled with sectarian self-sufficiency at the objections that were made to his theory or practice in painting. He lived long in the firm persuasion of being one of the elect among the sons of fame, and went to his final rest in the arms of immortality. Happy error! Enviable old man! Flaxman is another living and eminent artist, who is distinguished by success in his profession and by a prolonged and active old age. He is diminutive in person, like the others. I know little of him, but that he is an elegant sculptor and a profound mystic. This last is a character common to many other artists in our days. Lutherborg, Cosway, Blake, Sharp, Varley, etc., who seem to relieve the literalness of their professional studies by voluntary excursions into the regions of the preternatural, pass their time between sleeping and waking, and whose ideas are like a stormy night, with the clouds driven rapidly across, and the blue sky and stars gleaming between. Cosway is the last of these I shall mention. At that name I pause, and must be excused, if I consecrate to him a petit souvenir in my best manner, for he was Fancy's child. What a fairy palace was his, of specimens of art, antiquarianism, and vertu, jumbled all together in the richest disorder. Dusty, shadowy, obscure, with much left to the imagination, how different from the finical, polished, petty, modernised air of some collections we have seen, and with copies of the old masters, cracked and damaged, which he touched and retouched with his own hand, and yet swore they were the genuine, the pure originals. All other collectors are fools to him. They go about with painful anxiety to find out the realities. He said he had them, and in a moment made them of the breath of his nostrils and of the fumes of a lively imagination. His was the crucifix that Abelard prayed to, a lock of Eloise's hair, the dagger with which Felton stabbed the Duke of Buckingham, the first finished sketch of the Jocunda, Titian's large colossal profile of Peter Aretine, a mummy of an Egyptian king, a feather of a phoenix, a piece of Noah's ark. Were the articles authentic? What matter? His faith in them was true. He was gifted with a second sight in such matters. He believed whatever was incredible. Fancy bore sway in him, and so vivid were his impressions that they included the substances of things in them. The agreeable and the true with him were one. He believed in Swedenborgianism. He believed in animal magnetism. He had conversed with more than one person of the Trinity. He could talk with his lady at Mantua through some fine vehicle of sense as we speak to a servant downstairs 
through a conduit pipe. Richard Cosway was not the man to flinch from an ideal proposition. Once, at an academy dinner, when some question was made whether the story of Lambert's leap was true, he started up and said it was, for he was the person that performed it. He once assured me that the knee-pan of King James I in the ceiling at Whitehall was nine feet across. He had measured it in concert with Mr. Cipriani, who was repairing the figures. He could read in the book of the Revelations without spectacles, and foretold the return of Bonaparte from Elba and from St. Helena. His wife, the most ladylike of English women, being asked in Paris what sort of a man her husband was, made answer, Toujours riant, toujours gay. This was his character. He must have been of French extraction. His soul appeared to possess the life of a bird, and such was the jauntiness of his air and manner, that to see him sit to have his half-boots laced on, you would fancy, by the help of a figure, that instead of a little withered elderly gentleman, it was Venus attired by the graces. His miniatures and whole-length drawings were not merely fashionable, they were fashion itself. His imitations of Michelangelo were not the thing. When more than ninety he retired from his profession, and used to hold up the palsied hand that had painted lords and ladies for upwards of sixty years, and smiled, with unabated good humour, at the vanity of human wishes. Taken with all his faults and follies, we scarce shall look upon his like again. Why should such persons ever die? It seems hard upon them, and us. Care fixes no sting in their hearts, and their persons present no mark to the foeman. Death in them seizes upon living shadows, they scarce consume vital air. Their gross functions are long at an end. They live but to paint, to talk, or think. Is it that the vice of age, the miser's fault, gnaws them? Many of them are not afraid of death, but of coming to want, and having begun in poverty, are haunted with the idea that they shall end in it, and so die to save charges. Otherwise they might linger on for ever, and defy augury. End of section 11《Section 12 of the Plain Speaker》This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Nicole Lee The Plain Speaker Opinions on Books, Men and Things by William Hazlitt Section 12 On Envy A Dialogue Hazlitt. I had a theory about envy at one time, which I have partly given up of late, which was that there was no such feeling, or that what is usually considered as envy, or dislike of real merit, is, more properly speaking, jealousy of false pretensions to it. I used to illustrate the argument by saying that this was the reason we were not envious of the dead because their merit was established beyond the reach of cavil or contradiction, whereas we are jealous and uneasy at sudden and upstart popularity, which wants the seal of time to confirm it, and which, after all, may turn out to be false and hollow. There is no danger that the testimony of ages should be reversed, and we add our suffrages to it with confidence and even with enthusiasm. But we doubt, reasonably enough, whether that which was applauded yesterday may not be condemned to-morrow, and are afraid of setting our names to 
a fraudulent claim to distinction. However satisfied we may be in our own minds, we are not sufficiently borne out by general opinion and sympathy to prevent certain misgivings and scruples on the subject. No one thinks, for instance, of denying the merit of Tenier in his particular style of art, and no one consequently thinks of envying him. The merit of Wilkie, on the contrary, was at first strongly contested, and there were other painters set up in opposition to him, till now that he has become a sort of classic in his way. He has ceased to be an object of envy or dislike, because no one doubts his real excellence, as far as it goes. He has no more than justice done him, and the mind never revolts at justice. It only rejects false or superficial claims to admiration, and is incensed to see the world take up with appearances when they have no solid foundation to support them. We are not envious of Rubens or Raphael, because their fame is a pledge of their genius. But if any one were to bring forward the highest living names as equal to these, it immediately sets the blood in a ferment, and we try to stifle the sense we have of their merits, not because they are new or modern, but because we are not sure they will ever be old. Could we be certain that posterity would sanction our award, we should grant it without scruple, even to an enemy and a rival. Northcote, that which you describe is not envy. Envy is when you hate and would destroy all excellence that you do not yourself possess. So they say that Raphael, after he had copied the figures on one of the antique vases, endeavoured to deface them. And Hopner, it has been said, used to get pictures of Sir Joshua's into his possession, on purpose to paint them over and spoil them. Hazlitt. I do not believe the first, certainly. Raphael was too great a man, and with too fortunate a temper, to need or to wish to prop himself up on the ruins of others. As to Hopner, he might perhaps think that there was no good reason for the preference given to Sir Joshua's portraits over his own, that his women of quality were the more airy and fashionable of the two, and might be tempted, once perhaps, in a fit of spleen, of caprice or impatience, to blot what was an eyesore to himself from its old-fashioned, faded, dingy look, and at the same time dazzled others from the force of tradition and prejudice. Why, he might argue, should that old fellow run away with all the popularity, even among those who, as he well knew, in their hearts preferred his own insipid, flaunting style to any other? Though it might be true that Sir Joshua was the greater painter, yet it was not true that lords and ladies thought so. He felt that he ought to be their favourite, and he might naturally hate what was continually thrust in his dish, and, as far as those about him were concerned, unjustly set over his head. Besides, Hopner had very little of his own to rely on, and might wish by destroying to conceal the source from whence he had borrowed almost everything. Northcote. Did you never feel envy? Hazlitt. Very little, I think. In truth, I am out of the way of it, for the only pretension of which I am tenacious is that of being a metaphysician, and there is so little attention paid to this subject to pamper one's vanity, and so little fear of losing that little from competition, that there is scarcely any room for envy here. One occupies the niche of eminence in which one places oneself very quietly and contentedly. If I have ever felt this passion at all, it has been where some very paltry fellow has by trick and management contrived to obtain much more credit than he was entitled to. There was blank, to whom I had a perfect antipathy. He was the antithesis of a man of genius, and yet he did better by mere dint of dullness than many men of genius. This was intolerable. 
there was something in the man and in his manner with which you could not possibly connect the idea of admiration or of anything that was not merely mechanical his look made the still air cold he repelled all sympathy and cordiality what he did though amounting to mediocrity was an insult on the understanding it seemed that he should be able to do nothing for he was nothing either in himself or in other people's idea of him mean actions or gross expressions too often unsettle one's theory of genius we are unable as well as unwilling to connect the feeling of high intellect with low moral sentiment the one is a kind of desecration of the other i have for this reason been sometimes disposed to disparage turner's fine landscapes and be glad when he failed in his higher attempts in order that my conception of the artist and his pictures might be more of a piece this is not envy or an impatience of extraordinary merit but an impatience of the incongruities in human nature and of the drawbacks and stumbling blocks in the way of our admiration of it who is there that admires the author of waverley more than i do who is there that despises sir walter scott more i do not like to think there should be a second instance of the same persons being the wisest meanest of mankind and should be heartily glad if the greatest genius of the age should turn out to be an honest man the only thing that renders this misalliance between first-rate intellect and want of principle endurable is that such an extreme instance of it teaches us that great moral lesson of moderating our expectations of human perfection and enlarging our indulgence for human infirmity northcote you start off with an idea as usual and torture the plain state of the case into a paradox there may be some truth in what you suppose but malice or selfishness is at the bottom of the severity of your criticism not the love of truth or justice though you may make it the pretext you are more angry at sir walter scott's success than at his servility you would give yourself no trouble about his poverty of spirit if he had not made a hundred thousand pounds by his writings the sting lies there though you may try to conceal it from yourself hazlitt i do not think so i hate the sight of the duke of wellington for his foolish face as much as for anything else i cannot believe that a great general is contained under such a pasteboard visor of a man this you'll say is party spite and rage at his good fortune i deny it i always liked lord castlereagh for the gallant spirit that shone through his appearance and his fine bust surmounted and crushed fifty orders that glittered beneath it nature seemed to have meant him for something better than he was but in the other instance fortune has evidently played nature a trick to throw a cruel sunshine on a fool northcote the truth is you were reconciled to lord castlereagh's face and patronized his person because you felt a sort of advantage over him in point of style his blunders qualified his success and you fancied you could take his speeches in pieces whereas you could not undo the battles that the other had won hazlitt so i have been accused of denying the merits of pitt from political dislike and prejudice but who is there that has praised burke more than i have it is a subject that i am never weary of because i feel it northcote you mean because he is dead and is now little talked of and you think you show superior discernment and liberality by praising him if there was a burke club you would say nothing about him you deceive yourself as to your own motives and weave a wrong theory out of them for human nature the love of distinction is the ruling passion of the human mind we grudge whatever draws off attention from ourselves to others and all our actions are but different contrivances either by sheer malice or affected liberality to keep it to ourselves or share it with others goldsmith was jealous even of beauty in the other sex 
When the people at Amsterdam gathered round the balcony to look at the Miss Hornecks, he grew impatient and said peevishly, There are places where I also am admired. It may be said, What could their beauty have to do with his reputation? No, it could not tend to lessen it, but it drew admiration from himself to them. So Mr. Croker the other day, when he was at the Academy dinner, made himself conspicuous by displaying the same feeling. He found fault with everything, damned all the pictures, landscapes, portraits, busts, nothing pleased him, and not contented with this, he then fell foul of the art itself, which he treated as a piece of idle foolery, and said that Raphael had thrown away his time in doing what was not worth the trouble. This, besides being insincere, was a great breach of good manners, which none but a low-bred man would be guilty of. But he felt his own consequence annoyed. He saw a splendid exhibition of art, a splendid dinner set out, the nobility, the cabinet ministers, the branches of the royal family invited to it, the most eminent professors were there present. It was a triumph and a celebration of art, a dazzling proof of the height to which it had attained in this country, and of the esteem in which it was held. He felt that he played a very subordinate part in all this, and in order to relieve his own wounded vanity, he was determined, as he thought, to mortify that of others. He wanted to make himself of more importance than anybody else, by trampling on Raphael and on the art itself. It was ridiculous and disgusting, because everyone saw through the motive, so that he defeated his own object. Hazlitt and he would have avoided this exposure, if with all his conceit and ill-humour he had had the smallest taste for the art, or perception, of the beauties of Raphael. He has just knowledge enough of drawing to make a whole-length sketch of Bonaparte, verging on caricature, yet not palpably outraging probability, so that it looked like a fat, stupid, commonplace man, or flattering likeness of some legitimate monarch, he had skill, cunning, servility enough to do this with his own hand, and to circulate a print of it with zealous activity, as an indirect means of degrading him in appearance to that low level to which fortune had once raised him in reality. But the man who could do this deliberately, and with satisfaction to his own nature, was not the man to understand Raphael, and might slander him or any other, the greatest of earth's born, without injuring or belying any feeling of admiration or excellence in his own breast, for no such feeling had ever entered there. Northcote, come, this is always the way. Now you are growing personal. Why do you so constantly let your temper get the better of your reason? Hazlitt, because I hate a hypocrite, a time-server, and a slave. But to return to the question, and say no more about this talking potato, I do not think that, except in circumstances of peculiar aggravation, or of extraordinary ill-temper and moroseness of disposition, any one who has a thorough feeling of excellence has a delight in gainsaying it. The excellence that we feel, we participate in, as if it were our own. It becomes ours by transfusion of mind. It is instilled into our hearts. It mingles with our blood. We are unwilling to allow merit, because we are unable to perceive it. But to be convinced of it, is to be ready to acknowledge and pay homage to it. Illiberality or narrowness of feeling is a narrowness of taste, a want of proper tact. A bigoted and exclusive spirit is real blindness to all excellence but our own, or that of some particular school or sect. I think I can give an instance of this in some friends of mine, on whom you will be disposed to have no more mercy 
than I have on Mr. Croker, I mean the Lake School. Their system of ostracism is not unnatural. It begins only with the natural limits of their tastes and feelings. Mr. Wordsworth, Mr. Coleridge, and Mr. Southey have no feeling for the excellence of Pope or Goldsmith or Gray. They do not enter at all into their merits, and on that account it is that they deny, proscribe, and envy them. Incredulous Odi is the explanation here, and in all such cases. I am satisfied that the fine turn of thought in Pope, the gliding verse of Goldsmith, the brilliant diction of Gray, have no charms for the author of the lyrical ballads. He has no faculty in his mind to which these qualities of poetry address themselves. It is not an oppressive, galling sense of them, and a burning envy to rival them, and shame that he cannot. He would not if he could. He has no more ambition to write couplets like Pope than to turn a barrel organ. He has no pleasure in such poetry, and therefore he has no patience with others that have. The enthusiasm that they feel and express on the subject seems an effect without a cause, and puzzles and provokes the mind accordingly. Mr. Wordsworth, in particular, is narrower in his tastes than other people, because he sees everything from a single and original point of view. Whatever does not fall in strictly with this, he accounts no better than a delusion, or a play upon words. Northcote. You mistake the matter altogether. The acting principle in their minds is an inveterate selfishness or desire of distinction. They see that a particular kind of excellence has been carried to its height, a height that they have no hope of arriving at. The road is stopped up. They must therefore strike into a different path, and in order to divert the public mind and draw attention to themselves, they affect to decry the old models and overturn what they cannot rival. They know they cannot write like Pope or Dryden, or would be only imitators if they did, and they consequently strive to gain an original and equal celebrity by singularity and affectation. Their simplicity is not natural to them. It is the forlorn hope of impotent and disappointed vanity. Hazlitt I cannot think that. It may be so in part, but not principally or altogether. Their minds are cast in a peculiar mould, and they cannot produce nor receive any other impressions than those which they do. They are, as to matters of taste, très borné. Northcote, you make them out stupider than I thought. I have sometimes spoken disrespectfully of their talents, and so I think comparatively with those of some of our standard writers, but I certainly should never conceive them so lost to common sense as not to perceive the beauty or splendour or strength of Pope and Dryden. They are dazzled by it, and willfully shut their eyes to it, and try to throw dust in those of other people. We easily discern and are confounded by excellence, which we are conscious we should in vain attempt to equal. We may see that another is taller than ourselves, and yet we may know that we can never grow to his stature. A dwarf may easily envy a giant. Hazlitt They would like the comparison to Polyphemus in Asis and Galatea better. They think that little men have run away with the prize of beauty. Northcote No one admires poetry more than I do, or sees more beauties in it, though if I were to try for a thousand years, I should never be able to do anything to please myself. Hazlitt Perhaps not in the mechanical part, but still you admire and are most struck 
with those passages in poetry that accord with the previous train of your own feelings, and give you back the images of your own mind. There is something congenial in taste, at least, between ourselves and those whom we admire. I do not think there is any point of sympathy between Pope and the Lake School. On the contrary, I know there is an antipathy between them. When you speak of Titian, you look like him. I can understand how it is that you talk so well on that subject, and that your discourse has an extreme unction about it, a marrowiness like his colouring. But I do not believe that the late Mr. West had the least notion of Titian's peculiar excellences. He would think one of his own copies of him as good as the original, and his own historical compositions much better. He would therefore, I conceive, sit and listen to a conversation in praise of him, with something like impatience, and think it an interruption to more important discussions, on the principles of high art. But if Mr. West had ever seen in nature what there is to be found in Titian's copies from it, he would never have thought of such a comparison, and would have bowed his head in deep humility at the very mention of his name. He might not have been able to do like him, and yet might have seen nature with the same eyes. Northcote. We do not always admire most what we can do best, but often the contrary. Sir Joshua's admiration of Michelangelo was perfectly sincere and unaffected, but yet nothing could be more diametrically opposite than the minds of the two men. There was an absolute gulf between them. It was the consciousness of his own inability to execute such works that made him more sensible of the difficulty and the merit. It was the same with his fondness for Poussin. He was always exceedingly angry with me for not admiring him enough, but this showed his good sense and modesty. Sir Joshua was always on the lookout for whatever might enlarge his notions on the subject of his art and supply his defects, and did not, like some artists, measure all possible excellence by his own actual deficiencies. He thus improved and learned something daily. Others have lost their way by setting out with a pragmatical notion of their own self-sufficiency, and have never advanced a single step beyond their first crude conceptions. Fuseli was to blame in this respect. He did not want capacity or enthusiasm, but he had an overweening opinion of his own peculiar acquirements. Speaking of Van Dyck, he said he would not go across the way to see the finest portrait he had ever painted. He asked, What is it but a little bit of colour? Sir Joshua said, on hearing this, Aye, he'll live to repent it, and he has lived to repent it. With that little bit added to his own heap, he would have been a much greater painter, and a happier man. Hazlitt, yes, but I doubt whether he could have added it in practice. I think the indifference, in the first instance, arises from the want of taste and capacity. If Vasselli had possessed an eye for colour, he would not have despised it in Van Dyck. But we reduce others to the limits of our own capacity. We think little of what we cannot do, and envy it where we imagine that it meets with disproportioned admiration from others. A dull, pompous and obscure writer, has been heard to exclaim, That dunce, Wordsworth! This was excusable in one who is utterly without feeling, for any objects in nature. But those who would make splendid furniture for a drawing-room, or any sentiment of the human heart, but that with which a slave looks up to a despot, or a despot looks down upon a slave, this contemptuous expression 
was an effusion of spleen and impatience at the idea that there should be any one who preferred Wordsworth's descriptions of a daisy or a linnet's nest to his auctioneer poetry about curtains and palls and sceptres and precious stones. But had Wordsworth, in addition to his original sin of simplicity and true genius, been a popular writer, his contempt would have turned into hatred. As it is, he tolerates his idle nonsense. There is a link of friendship in mutual political servility. And besides, he has a fellow feeling with him, as one of those writers of whose merits the world have not been fully sensible. Mr. Crowley set out with high pretensions, and had some idea of rivalling Lord Byron in a certain lofty, imposing style of versification. But he is probably by this time convinced that mere constitutional auteur, as ill supplies the place of elevation of genius as of the pride of birth and that the public know how to distinguish between a string of gaudy, painted, turgid phrases and the vivid creations of fancy or touching delineations of the human heart. Northcote. What did you say the writer's name was? Hazlitt. Crowley. He is one of the Royal Society of Authors. Northcote. I never heard of him. Is he an imitator of Lord Byron, did you say? Hazlitt. I am afraid neither he nor Lord Byron would have it thought so. Northcote. Such imitators do all the mischief, and bring real genius into disrepute. This is in some measure an excuse for those who have endeavoured to disparage Pope and Dryden. We have had a surfeit of imitations of them. Poetry, in the hands of a set of mechanic scribblers, had become such a tame, mawkish thing that we could endure it no longer, and our impatience of the abuse of a good thing transferred itself to the original source. It was this which enabled Wordsworth and the rest to raise up a new school, or to attempt it, on the ruins of Pope. Because a race of writers had succeeded him without one particle of his wit, sense, and delicacy and the world were tired of their everlasting sing-song and namby-pamby. People were disgusted at hearing the faults of Pope, the part most easily imitated, cried up as his greatest excellence, and were willing to take refuge from such nauseous cant in any novelty. Hazlitt. What you now observe comes nearly to my account of the matter. Sir Andrew Wiley will sicken people of the author of Waverley. It was but the other day that someone was proposing that there should be a society formed for not reading the Scotch novels. But it is not the excellence of that fine writer that we are tired of, or revolt at, but vapid imitations or catch-penny repetitions of himself. Even the quantity of them has an obvious tendency to lead to this effect. It lessens instead of increasing our admiration. For it seems to be an evidence that there is no difficulty in the task, and leads us to suspect something like trick or deception in their production. We have not been used to look upon works of genius as of the fungus tribe. Yet these are so. We had rather doubt our own taste than ascribe such a superiority of genius to another that it works without consciousness or effort, executes the labour of a life in a few weeks, writes faster than the public can read, and scatters the rich materials of thought and feeling like so much chaff. Northcote. Aye, there it is. We had rather do anything than acknowledge the merit of another, if we have any possible excuse or evasion to help it. Depend upon it. You are glad Sir Walter Scott is a Tory, because it gives you an opportunity of qualifying your involuntary admiration of him. He would be sorry indeed if he were what you call an honest man. Envy is like a viper coiled up at the bottom of the heart, 
ready to spring upon and poison whatever approaches it. We live upon the vices, the imperfections, the misfortunes and disappointments of others as our natural food. We cannot bear a superior or an equal. Even our pretended cordial admiration is only a subterfuge of our vanity. By raising one, we proportionably lower and mortify others. Our self-love may perhaps be taken by surprise and thrown off its guard by novelty, but it soon recovers itself and begins to cool in its warmest expressions and find every possible fault. Ridicule, for this reason, is sure to prevail over truth, because the malice of mankind thrown into the scale gives the casting weight. We have one succession of authors, of painters, of favourites, after another, whom we hail in their turns, because they operate as a diversion to one another, and relieve us of the galling sense of the superiority of any one individual for any length of time. By changing the object of our admiration, we secretly persuade ourselves that there is no such thing as excellence. It is that which we hate above all things. It is the worm that gnaws us, that never dies. The mob shout when a king or a conqueror appears. They would take him and tear him to pieces, but that he is the scapegoat of their pride and vanity, and makes all other men appear like a herd of slaves and cowards. Instead of a thousand equals, we compound for one superior, and allay all heart-burnings and animosities among ourselves by giving the palm to the least worthy. This is the secret of monarchy. Loyalty is not the love of kings, but hatred and jealousy of mankind. A lackey rides behind his lord's coach and feels no envy of his master. Why? because he looks down and laughs in his borrowed finery at the ragged rabble below. Is it not so in our profession? What academician eats his dinner in peace, if a rival sits near him, if his own are not the most admired pictures in the room, or, in that case, if there are any others that are at all admired, and divide distinction with him? Is not every artifice used to place the pictures of other artists in the worst light. Do they not go there after their performances are hung up, and try to paint one another out? What is the case among players? Does not a favourite actor threaten to leave the stage, as soon as a new candidate for public favour is taken the least notice of? Would not a manager of a theatre, who has himself pretensions, sooner see it burned down, than that it should be saved from ruin? and lifted into the full tide of public prosperity and favour by the efforts of one whom he conceives to have supplanted himself in the popular opinion. Do we not see an author, who has had a tragedy damned, sit at the play every night of a new performance for years after, in the hopes of gaining a new companion in defeat? Is it not an indelible offence to a picture collector and patron of the arts, to hint that another has a fine head in his collection. Will any merchant in the city allow another to be worth a plum? What wit will applaud a bon mot by a rival? He sits uneasy and out of countenance, till he has made another which he thinks will make the company forget the first. Do women ever allow beauty in others? Observe the people in a country town and see how they look at those who are better dressed than themselves. Listen to the talk in country places, and mind if it is composed of anything but slanders, gossip, and lies. Hazlitt. But don't you yourself admire Sir Joshua Reynolds? Northcote. Why, yes. I think I have no envy myself, and yet I have sometimes caught myself at it. I don't know that I do not admire Sir Joshua merely as a screen against the reputation of bad pictures. Hazlitt. Then, at any rate, what I say is true. We envy the good, 
less than we do the bad. Northcote. I do not think so. And I'm not sure that Sir Joshua himself did not admire Michelangelo to get rid of the superiority of Titian, Rubens, and Rembrandt, which pressed closer on him and galled his kybe more. Hazlitt. I should not think that at all unlikely. For I look upon Sir Joshua as rather a spiteful man, and always thought he could have little real feeling for the works of Michelangelo or Raphael, which he extolled so highly, or he would not have been insensible to their effect the first time he ever beheld them. Northcote. He liked Sir Peter Lely better. End of section 12《セクション thirteen of the Plain Speaker》This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Marianne.《The Plain Speaker: Opinions on Books, Men, and Things》by William Hazlitt.《セクション thirteen》On Sitting for One's Picture. There is a pleasure in sitting for one's picture which many persons are not aware of. People are coy on the subject at first, coquette with it, and pretend not to like it, as is the case with other venial indulgences, but they soon get over their scruples and become resigned to their fate. There is a conscious vanity in it, and vanity is the aurorum potabile in all our pleasures, the true elixir of human life. The sitter at first affects an air of indifference, throws himself into a slovenly or awkward position like a clown when he goes a-courting for the first time, but gradually recovers himself, attempts an attitude, and calls up his best looks, the moment he receives intimation that there is something about him that will do for a picture. The beggar in the street is proud to have his picture painted, and would almost sit for nothing. The finest lady in the land is as fond of sitting to a favorite artist, as of seating herself before her looking-glass, and the more so, as the glass in this case is sensible of her charms, and does all it can to fix or heighten them. Kings lay aside their crowns to sit for their portraits, and poets their laurels to sit for their busts. I am sure my father had as little vanity and as little love for the art as most persons, yet when he had sat to me a few times, now some twenty years ago, he grew evidently uneasy when it was a fine day, that is, when the sun shone into the room, so that we could not paint and when it became cloudy, he began to bustle about, and asked me if I was not getting ready. Poor old room! Does the sun still shine into thee, or does hope fling its colors round thy walls, gaudier than the rainbow? No, never. While thy oak panels endure, will they enclose such fine movements of the brain as pass through mine, when the fresh hues of nature gleamed from the canvas, and my heart silently breathed the names of Rembrandt and Correggio. Between my father's love of sitting and mine of painting, we hit upon a tolerable likeness at last. But the picture is cracked and gone, and McGilp, that bane of the English school, has destroyed as fine an old nonconformist head as one could hope to see in these degenerate times. The fact is, that having one's picture painted is like the creation of another self, and that is an idea of the repetition or reduplication of which no man is ever tired to the thousandth reflection. It has been said that lovers are never tired of each other's company, because they are always talking of themselves. This seems to be the bond of connection, a delicate one it is, between the painter and the sitter. They are always thinking and talking of the same thing, of the picture, in which their self-love finds an equal counterpart. There is always something to be done, or to be altered, that touches that sensitive chord, this feature was not exactly hit off. Something is wanting to the nose or to the eyebrows. It may perhaps be as well to leave out this mark or that blemish. If it were possible to recall an expression that was remarked a short time before, it would be an indesirable advantage to the picture. A squint or a pimple on the face handsomely avoided may be a link of attachment ever after. He is no mean friend who conceals from ourselves, or only gently indicates, our obvious defects to the world. The sitter, by his repeated, minute, fidgety inquiries about himself, 
may be supposed to take an indirect and laudable method of arriving at self-knowledge. And the artist, in self-defense, is obliged to cultivate a scrupulous tenderness towards the feelings of his sitter, lest he should appear in the character of a spy upon him. I do not conceive there is a stronger call upon secret gratitude than the having made a favorable likeness of any one, nor a surer ground of jealousy and dislike than the having failed in the attempt. A satire or a lampoon in writing is bad enough, but here we look doubly foolish, for we are ourselves parties to the plot, and have been at considerable pains to give evidence against ourselves. I have never had a plaster cast taken of myself. In truth, I rather shrink from the experiment, for I know I should be very much mortified if it did not turn out well, and I should never forgive the unfortunate artist who had lent his assistance to prove that I looked like a blockhead. The late Mr. Opie used to remark that the sensible people made the best sitters, and I incline to his opinion, especially as I myself am an excellent sitter. Indeed, it seems to me a piece of more impertinence not to sit as still as one can in these circumstances. I put the best face I can upon the matter, as well out of respect to the artist as to myself. I appear on my trial in the court of physiognomy, and am as anxious to make good a certain idea I have of myself as if I were playing a part on a stage. I have no notion how people go to sleep who are sitting for their pictures. It is an evident sign of want of thought and of internal resources. There are some individuals, all whose ideas are in their hands and feet. Make them sit still, and you put a stop to the machine altogether. The volatile spirit of quicksilver in them turns to a caput mortuum. The children are particularly sensible of this constraint from their thoughtlessness and liveliness. It is the next thing with them to wearing the fool's cap at school. Yet they are proud of having their pictures taken, ask when they are to sit again, and are mightily pleased when they are done. Charles I's children seem to have been good sitters, and the great dog sits like a Lord Chancellor. The second time a person sits, and the view of the features is determined, the head seems fastened in an imaginary vice, and he can hardly tell what to make of his situation. He is continually overstepping the bounds of duty, and is tied down to certain lines and limits chalked out upon the canvas, to him invisible or dimly seen, on the throne where he is exalted. The painter has now a difficult task to manage, to throw in his gentle admonitions, a little more this way, sir, or, you bend rather too forward, madam, and ought to have a delicate white hand, that he may venture to adjust a straggling lock of hair, or by giving a slight turn to the head, cooperate in the practical attainment of a position. These are the trickish and tiresome places of the work before much progress is made, where the sitter grows peevish and abstracted, and the painter more anxious and particular than he was the day before. Now is the time to fling in a few adroit compliments, or to introduce general topics of conversation. The artist ought to be a well-informed and agreeable man, able to expatiate on his art, and abounding in lively and characteristic anecdotes. Yet he ought not to talk too much, or to grow too animated, or the picture's apt to stand still, and the sitter to be aware of it. Accordingly, the best talkers in the profession have not always been the most successful portrait painters. For this purpose, it is desirable to bring a friend, who may relieve guard, or fill up the pauses of conversation occasioned by the necessary attention of the painter to his business, and by the involuntary reveries of the sitter on what his own likeness will bring forth, or a book, a newspaper, or a portfolio of prints, may serve to amuse the time. When the sitter's face begins to flag, the artist may then properly start a fresh topic of discourse, and while his attention is fixed on the graces called out by the varying interest of the subject, and the model anticipates, pleased and smiling, their being transferred every moment to the canvas, nothing is wanting to improve and carry to its height the amicable understanding and mutual satisfaction and good will subsisting between these two persons so happily occupied with each other. Sir Joshua must have had a fine time of it with his sitters. Lords, ladies, generals, authors, opera singers, musicians, the learned and the polite, besieged his doors and found an unfailing welcome. What a rustling of silks! What a fluttering of flounces and brocades! What a cloud of powder and perfumes! What a flow of periwigs! 
What an exchange of civilities and of titles! What a recognition of old friendships, and an introduction of new acquaintances and sitters! I must, I think, be allowed that this is the only mode in which genius can form a legitimate union with wealth and fashion. There is a secret and sufficient tie in interest and vanity. Abstract topics of wit or learning do not furnish a connecting link. But the painter, the sculptor, come in close contact with the persons of the great. The lady of quality, the courtier, and the artist meet and shake hands on this common ground. The latter exercises a sort of natural jurisdiction and dictatorial power over the pretensions of the first to external beauty and accomplishment, which produces a mild sense of tone and equality, and the opulent sitter pays the taker of flattering likenesses handsomely for his trouble, which does not lessen the sympathy between them. There is even a satisfaction in paying down a high price for a picture. It seems as if one's head was worth something. During the first sitting, Sir Joshua did little but chat with the new candidate, for the frame of the portraiture, try an attitude, or remark an expression. His object was to gain time, by not being in haste to commit himself, until he was master of the subject before him. No one ever dropped in but the friends and acquaintances of the sitter. It was a rule with Sir Joshua, that from the moment the latter entered, he was at home, the room belonged to him. But what secret whisperings would there be among these, what confidential, inaudible communications? It must be a refreshing moment when the cake and wine had been handed round, and the artist began again. He, as it were, by this act of hospitality, assumed a new character, and acquired a double claim to confidence and respect. In the meantime, the sitter would perhaps glance his eye round the room, and see a titan, or a van dyke, hanging in one corner, with a transient feeling of scepticism whether he should make such a picture. How the ladies of quality and fashion must bless themselves for being made to look like Dr. Johnson or Goldsmith! How proud the first of these would be, how happy the last, to fill the same armchair where the Burnburys and Hornicks had sat! How superior the painter would feel to them all! By happy alchemy of mind, he brought out all their good qualities and reconciled their defects, gave an air of studious case to his learned friends, or lighted up the face of folly and fashion with intelligence and graceful smiles. Those portraits, however, that were most admired at the time, do not retain their preeminence now. The thought remains upon the brow, while the color has faded from the cheek, or the dress grown obsolete, and, after all, Sir Joshua's best pictures are those of his worst sitters, his children. They suited best with his unfinished style, and are like the infancy of the art itself, happy, bold, and careless. Sir Joshua formed the circle of his private friends from the elite of his sitters, and Van Dyck was, it appears, on the same footing with his. When any of those noble or distinguished persons whom he has immortalized with his pencil were sitting to him, he used to ask them to dinner, and afterwards it was their custom to return to the picture again, so that it is said that many of his finest portraits were done in this manner, ere the colors were yet dry, in the course of a single day. Oh, ephemeral works to last for ever! Van Dyck married a daughter of Earl Gower, of whom there is a very beautiful picture. She was the Anone, and he his own Paris. A painter of the name of Astley married a Lady Blank, who sat to him for her picture. He was a wretched hand, but a fine person of a man, and a great coxcomb, and on his strutting up and down before the portrait when it was done with a prodigious air of satisfaction, she observed, if he was so pleased with the copy, he might have the original. This Astley was a person of magnificent habits and a sumptuous taste in living, and is the same of whom the anecdote is recorded, that when some English students walking out near Rome were compelled by the heat to strip off their coats, Astley displayed a waistcoat with a huge waterfall streaming down the back of it, which was a piece of one of his own canvases that he had converted to this purpose. Sir Joshua fell in love with one of his fair sitters, a young and beautiful girl, who ran out one day in a great panic and confusion, hid her face in her companion's lap who was reading in an outer room, and said, Sir Joshua had made her an offer. This circumstance perhaps deserves mentioning the more because there is a general idea that Sir Joshua Reynolds was a confirmed old bachelor. Goldsmith conceived a fruitless attachment to the same person, and addressed some passionate letters to her. Alas, 
It is the fate of genius to admire and celebrate beauty, but not to enjoy it. It is a fate, perhaps, not without its compensations. Had Petrarch gained his Laura for a wife, would he have written sonnets all his life? This distinguished beauty is still living, and handsomer than Sir Joshua's picture of her when a girl, and inveighs against the freedom of Lord Byron's pen with all the charming prudery of the last age. The relation between the portrait painter and his amiable sitters is one of established custom, but it is also one of metaphysical nicety, and is a running double entendre. The fixing of an inquisitive gaze on beauty, the heightening of momentary grace, the dwelling on the heaven of an eye, the losing oneself in the dimple of a chin, is a dangerous employment. The painter may chance to slide into the lover. The lover can hardly turn painter. The eye indeed grows critical, the hand is busy, but are the senses unmoved? We are employed to transfer living charms to an inanimate surface, but they may sink into the heart by the same way, and the nerveless hand be unable to carry its luscious burden any farther. St. Prue wonders at the rash mortal who has dared to trace the features of his Julia, and accuses him of insensibility without reason. Perhaps he, too, had an enthusiasm and pleasures of his own. Mr. Burke, in his Sublime and Beautiful, has left a description of what he terms the most beautiful object in nature, the neck of a lovely and innocent female, which is written very much of, as if he had himself formerly painted this object, and sacrificed at this formidable shrine. There is no doubt that the perception of beauty becomes more exquisite, till the sense aches at it, by being studied and refined upon as an object of art. It is at the same time fortunately neutralized by this means, or the painter would run mad. It is converted into an abstraction, an ideal thing, into something intermediate between nature and art, hovering between a living substance and a senseless shadow. The health and spirit that but now breathe from a speaking face, the next moment breathe with almost equal effect from a dull piece of canvas, and thus distract attention. The eye sparkles, the lips are moist there too, and if we can fancy the picture alive, the face in its turn radiates into a picture, a mere object of sight. We take rapturous possession with one sense, the eye, but the artist's pencil acts as a non-conductor to the grosser desires. Besides, the sense of duty, of propriety, interferes. It is not the question at issue, we have other work on our hands, and enough to do. Love is the product of ease and idleness, but the painter has an anxious, feverish, never-ending task, to rival the beauty to which he dare not aspire even in thought, or in a dream of bliss. Paints and brushes are not armorous tools of light-winged Cupid. A rising sigh evaporates in the aroma of some fine oil color or varnish. A kindling blush is transfixed in a bed of vermilion on the palette. A blue vein meandering in a white wrist invites the hand to touch it, but it is better to proceed and not spoil the picture. The ambiguity becomes more striking in painting from the naked figure. If the wonder occasioned by the object is greater, so is the despair of rivaling what we see. The sense of responsibility increases with the hope of creating an artificial splendor to match the real one. The display of unexpected charms foils our vanity and mortifies passion. The painting, a Diana and nymphs, is like plunging into a cold bath of desire. To make a statue of Venus transforms the sculptor himself to stone. The snow on the lap of beauty freezes the soul. The heedless, unsuspecting license of foreign manners gives the artist abroad an advantage over ours at home. Sir Joshua Reynolds painted only the head of Iphigene, from a beautiful woman of quality. Canova had innocent girls to sit for him for his graces, the Princess Borghese, whose symmetry of form was admirable, sat to him for a model, which he considered as his masterpiece and the perfection of the female form, and when asked if she did not feel uncomfortable while it was taking, she replied with great indifference, No, it was not cold. I have but one other word to add on this part of the subject. If having to paint a delicate and modest female is a temptation to gallantry, on the other hand, the sitting to a lady for one's picture is a still more trying situation, and amounts, almost of itself, to a declaration of love. 
Landscape painting is free from these tormenting dilemmas and embarrassments. It is full of the feeling of pastoral simplicity and ease, as portrait painting is of personal vanity and egoism. Away, then, with these encumbrances to the true liberty of thought, the sitter's chair, the bag-wig and sword, the drapery, the lay figure, and let us to some retired spot in the country, take out our portfolio, plant our easel, and begin. We are all at once shrouded from observation, the world forgetting, by the world forgot. We enjoy the cool shade, with solitude and silence, or hear the dashing waterfall, or stock dove plain amid the forest deep, that drowsy rustics to the sighing gale. It seems almost a shame to do anything, we are so well content without it. But the eye is restless, and we must have something to show when we get home. We set to work, and failure or success prompts us to go on. We take up the pencil, or lay it down again, as we please. We muse or paint, as objects strike our senses or our reflection. The perfect leisure we feel turns labor to a luxury. We try to imitate the gray color of a rock or of the bark of a tree. The breeze wafted from its broad foliage gives us fresh spirits to proceed. We dip our pencil in the sky, or ask the white clouds sailing over its bosom to sit for their pictures. We are in no hurry, and have the day before us. Or else, escaping from the close embowered scene, we catch fading distances on airy downs, and seize on golden sunsets, with the fleecy flocks glittering in the evening ray, after a shower of rain has fallen. Or from Norwood's ridgy heights, survey the snake-like Thames, or its smoke-crowned capital. Think of its crimes, its cares, its pain, then shield us in the woods again. No one thinks of disturbing a landscape painter at his task. He seems a kind of magician, the privileged genius of the place. Wherever a Claude, a Wilson, has introduced his own portrait in the foreground of a picture, we look at it with interest, however ill it may be done, feeling that it is the portrait of one who was quite happy at the time, and how glad we should be to change places with him. Mr. Burke has brought in a striking episode in one of his latter works in allusion to Sir Joshua's portrait of Lord Keppel, with those of some other friends painted in their better days. The portrait is indeed a fine one, worthy of the artist and the critic, and perhaps recalls Lord Keppel's memory oftener than any other circumstance at present. Footnote. No man lives too long, who lives to do with spirit, and suffer with resignation, what providence pleases to command or inflict. But indeed they are sharp incommodities which beset old age. It was but the other day, that in putting in order some things which had been brought here on my taking leave of London for ever, I looked over a number of fine portraits, most of them of persons now dead, but whose society, in my better days, made this a proud and happy place. Amongst these was a picture of Lord Keppel. It was painted by an artist worthy of the subject, the excellent friend of that excellent man from their earliest youth, and a common friend of both of us, with whom we lived for many years without a moment of coldness, or peevishness, of jealousy, or of jar, to the day of our final separation. I ever looked on Lord Keppel as one of the greatest and best men of his age, and I loved and cultivated him accordingly. He was much in my heart, and I believe I was in his to the very last beat. It was after his trial at Portsmouth that he gave me this picture. With what zeal and anxious affection I attended him through that agony of glory! What part, my son, in early flush and enthusiasm of his virtue, and the pious passion with which he attached himself to all my connections, with what prodigality we both squandered ourselves in courting almost every sort of enmity for his sake, I believe he felt, just as I should have felt, such friendship on such an occasion. Letter to a Noble Lord, page 29, second edition, printed for T. Williams. I have given this passage entire here because I wish to be informed, if I could, what is the construction of the last sentence of it. It has puzzled me all my life. One difficulty might be got over by making a pause after, I believe he felt, and leaving out the comma between have felt and such friendship. That is, the meaning would be, I believe he felt with what zeal and anxious affection, and etc., just as I should have felt such friendship on such an occasion. But then, again, 
what is to become of the what part, my son, and etc. With what does this connect, or to what verb is my son the nominative case, or by what verb is what part governed? I should really be glad if, from any manuscript, printed copy, or marginal correction, this point could be cleared up, and so fine a passage resolved, by any possible ellipsis, into ordinary grammar. End of footnote. Portrait painting is in truth a sort of cement of friendship, and a clue to history. That blockhead, Mr. Crocker, of the Admiralty, the other day blundered upon some observations of mine relating to this subject, and made the house stare by asserting that portrait painting was history or history portrait, as it happened, but went on to add that those gentlemen who had seen the ancient portraits lately exhibited in Pall Mall must have been satisfied that they were strictly historical, which showed that he knew nothing at all of the matter, and merely talked by rote. There was nothing historical in the generality of those portraits, except that they were portraits of people mentioned in history. There was no more the spirit of history in them, which is a passion, or action, than in their dresses. But this is the way in which that person, by his pettifogging habits and literal understanding, always mistakes a verbal truism for sense, and a misnomer for wit. I was going to observe that I think aiding the recollection of our family and friends in our absence may be a frequent and strong inducement to sitting for our pictures, but that I believe the love of posthumous fame, or of continuing our memories after we are dead, has very little to do with it. And one reason I should give for that opinion is this, that we are not naturally very prone to dwell with pleasure on anything that may happen in relation to us after we are dead, because we are not fond of thinking of death at all. We shrink equally from the prospect of that fatal event, or from any speculation on its consequences. The surviving ourselves in our pictures is but a poor compensation. It is rather adding mockery to a calamity. The perpetuating of our names in the wide page of history, or to a remote posterity, is a vague calculation, that may take out the immediate sting of mortality, whereas we ourselves may hope to the last, by a fortunate extension of the term of human life, almost as long as an ordinary portrait. And the wounds of lacerated friendship it heals must be still green, and our ashes scarcely cold. I think, therefore, that the looking forward to this mode of keeping alive the memory of what we were, by lifeless hues and discoloured features, is not among the most approved consolations of human life, or favourite dalliances of the imagination. Yet I own, I should like some part of me, as the hair or even nails, to be preserved entire, or I should have no objection to lie like Whitfield in a state of petrification. This smacks of the bodily reality at least, acts like a deception to the spectator, and breaks the fall from this sensible warm motion to a kneaded clod, from that to nothing, even to the person himself. I suspect that the idea of posthumous fame, which has so unwelcome a condition annexed to it, loses its general relish as we advance in life, and that it is only while we are young that we pamper our imaginations with this bait, with a sort of impunity. The reversion of immortality is then so distant that we may talk of it without much fear of entering upon immediate possession. Death is itself a fable, a sound that dies upon our lips, and the only certainty seems the only impossibility. Fame, at that romantic period, is the first thing in our mouths, and death the last in our thoughts. End of section 13「Section 14 of The Plain Speaker – This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Avai in November 2011. The Plain Speaker – Opinions on Books, Men, and Things by William Hazlitt. Section 14 – whether genius is conscious of its powers. No really great man ever thought himself so. The idea of greatness in the mind answers but ill to our knowledge, or to our ignorance, of ourselves. What living prose writer, for instance, would think of comparing himself with Burke? 
yet would it not have been equal presumption or egotism in him to fancy himself equal to those who had gone before him bolingbroke or johnson or sir william temple because his rank in letters is become a settled point with us we conclude that it must have been quite as self-evident to him and that he must have been perfectly conscious of his vast superiority to the rest of the world alas not so no man is truly himself but in the idea which others entertain of him the mind as well as the eye sees not itself but by reflection from some other thing what parity can there be between the effect of habitual composition in the mind of the individual and the surprise occasioned by first reading a fine passage in an admired author between what we do with ease and what we thought it next to impossible ever to have done between the reverential awe we have for years encouraged without seeing reason to alter it for distinguished genius and the slow reluctant unwelcome conviction that after infinite toil and repeated disappointments and when it is too late and to little purpose we have ourselves at length accomplished what we at first proposed between the insignificance of our petty personal pretensions and the vastness and splendour which the atmosphere of imagination lends to an illustrious name he who comes up to his own idea of greatness must always have had a very low standard of it in his mind what a pity said someone that milton had not the pleasure of reading paradise lost he could not read it as we do with the weight of impression that a hundred years of admiration have added to it a phoenix gazed by all with the sense of the number of editions it has passed through with still increasing reputation with the tone of solidity time-proof which it has received from the breath of cold envious maliners with the sound which the voice of fame has lent to every line of it the writer of an ephemeral production may be as much dazzled with it as the public it may sparkle in his own eyes for a moment and be soon forgotten by every one else but no one can anticipate the suffrages of posterity every man in judging of himself is his own contemporary he may feel the gale of popularity but he cannot tell how long it will last his opinion of himself wants distance wants time wants numbers to set it off and confirm it he must be indifferent to his own merits before he can feel a confidence in them besides every one must be sensible of a thousand weaknesses and deficiencies in himself whereas genius only leaves behind it the monuments of its strength a great name is an abstraction of some one excellence but whoever fancies himself an abstraction of excellence so far from being great may be sure that he is a blockhead equally ignorant of excellence or defect of himself or others mr burke besides being the author of the reflections and the letter to a noble lord had a wife and son and had to think as much about them as we do about him the imagination gains nothing by the minute details of personal knowledge on the other hand it may be said that no man knows so well as the author of any performance what it has cost him and the length of time and study devoted to it this is one among other reasons why no man can pronounce an opinion upon himself the happiness of the result bears no proportion to the difficulties overcome or the pains taken materiam superabat opus is an old and fatal complaint the definition of genius is that it acts unconsciously and those who have produced immortal works have done so without knowing how or why the greatest power operates unseen and executes its appointed task with as little ostentation as difficulty whatever is done best is done from the natural bent and disposition of the mind it is only where our incapacity begins that we begin to feel the obstacles and to set an undue value on our triumph over them correggio michelangelo rembrandt did what they did without premeditation or effort 
their works came from their minds as a natural birth if you had asked them why they adopted this or that style they would have answered because they could not help it and because they knew of no other so shakespeare says our poesy is as a gum which oozes from whence tis nourished the fire it of flint shows not till it be struck our gentle flame provokes itself and like the current flies each bound its chafes shakespeare himself was an example of his own rule and appears to have owed almost everything to industry or design his poetry flashes from him like the lightning from the summer cloud or the stroke from the sunflower when we look at the admirable comic designs of hogarth they seem from the unfinished state in which they are left and from the freedom of the pencilling to have cost him little trouble whereas the sigismunda is a very laboured and comparatively feeble performance and he accordingly set great store by it he also thought highly of his portraits and boasted that he could paint equal to van dyck give him his time and let him choose his subject this was the very reason why he could not van dyck's excellence consisted in this that he could paint a fine portrait of any one at sight let him take over so much pains or choose ever so bad a subject he could not help making something of it his eye his mind his hand was cast in the mould of grace and delicacy milton again is understood to have preferred paradise regained to his other works this if so was either because he himself was conscious of having failed in it or because others thought he had we are willing to think well of that which we know wants our favourable opinion and to prop the rickety bantling every step taken in vita minerva costs us something and is set down to account whereas we are borne on the full tide of genius and success into the very haven of our desires almost imperceptibly the strength of the impulse by which we are carried along prevents the sense of difficulty or resistance the true inspiration of the muse is soft and balmy as the air we breathe and indeed leaves us little to boast of for the effect hardly seems to be our own there are two persons who always appear to me to have worked under this involuntary silent impulse more than any others i mean rembrandt and correggio it is not known that correggio ever saw a picture of any great master he lived and died obscurely in an obscure village we have few of his works but they are all perfect what truth what grace what angelic sweetness are there not one line or tone that is not divinely soft or exquisitely fair the painter's mind rejecting by a natural process all that is discordant coarse or unpleasing the whole is an emanation of pure thought the work grew under his hand as if of itself and came out without a flaw like the diamond from the rock he knew not what he did and looked at each modest grace as it stole from the canvas with anxious delight and wonder ah gracious god not he alone how many more in all time have looked at their works with the same feelings not knowing but they too may have done something divine immortal and finding in that sole doubt ample amends for pining solitude for want neglect and an untimely fate oh for one hour of that uneasy rapture when the mind first thinks that it has struck out something that may last for ever when the germ of excellence bursts from nothing on the startled sight take take away the gaudy triumphs of the world the long deathless shout of fame and give back that heartfelt sigh with which the youthful enthusiasts first wed immortality as his secret bride and then thou too rembrandt thou wert a man of genius if ever painter was a man of genius did this dream hang over you as you painted that strange pictures of jacob's ladder did your eyes strain over those gradual dusky clouds into futurity 
or did those white-vested, beaked figures babble to you of fame as they approached? Did you know what you were about, or did you not paint much as it happened? Oh, if you had thought once about yourself, or anything but the subject, it would have been all over with, the glory, the intuition, the amenity. The dream had fled, the spell had been broken. The hills would not have looked like those we see in sleep. That tatterdemalion figure of Jacob, thrown on one side, would not have slept as if the breath was fairly taken out of his body. So much do Rembrandt's pictures savour of the soul and body of reality that the thoughts seem identical with the objects. If there had been the least question what he should have done, or how he should do it, or how far he had succeeded, it would have spoiled everything. Lumps of light hung upon his pencil and fell upon his canvas like dewdrops. The shadowy veil was drawn over his backgrounds by the dull obtuse finger of night, making darkness visible by still greater darkness that could only be felt. Cervantes is another instance of a man of genius, whose work may be said to have sprung from his mind like Minerva from the head of Jupiter. Don Quixote and Sancho were kind of twins, and the jests of the latter, as he says, fell from him like drops of rain when he least thought of it. Shakespeare's creations were more multiform, but equally natural and unstudied. Raphael and Milton seem partial exceptions to this rule. Their productions were the composite order, and those of the latter sometimes even amount to centos. Accordingly, we find Milton quoted among those authors who have left proofs of their entertaining a high opinion of themselves, and of cherishing a strong aspiration after fame. Some of Shakespeare's sonnets have been also cited to the same purpose, but they seem rather to convey wayward and dissatisfied complaints of his untoward fortune than anything like a triumphant and confident reliance on his future renown. He appears to have stood more alone and to have thought less about himself than any living being. One reason for this indifference may have been that as a writer he was tolerably successful in his lifetime, and no doubt produced his works with great facility. I hardly know whether to class Claude Lorraine as among those who succeeded most, through happiness or pains. It is certain that he imitated no one, and has had no successful imitator. The perfection of his landscapes seems to have been owing to an inherent quality of harmony, to an exquisite sense of delicacy in his mind. His monotony has been complained of, which is apparently produced from a preconceived idea in his mind, and not long ago I heard a person, not more distinguished for the subtlety than the naivete of his sarcasms, remark, Oh, I never look at Claude. If one has seen one of his pictures, one has seen them all. They are every one alike. There is the same sky, the same climate, the same time of day, the same tree, and that tree is like a cabbage. To be sure, they say he did pretty well, but when a man is always doing one thing, he ought to do it pretty well. There is no occasion to write the name under this criticism, and the best answer to it is that it is true. His pictures always are the same, but we never wish them to be otherwise. Perfection is one thing. I confess I think that Claude knew this, and felt that his were the finest landscapes in the world, that ever had been, or would ever be. I am not in the humour to pursue this argument any farther at present, but to write a digression. If the reader is not already apprised of it, he will please to take notice that I write this at Winterslow. My style there is apt to be redundant and excursive. At other times it may be cramped, dry, abrupt, but here it flows like a river and overspreads its banks. I have not to seek for thoughts or hunt for images. They come of themselves. I inhale them with the breeze, and the silent groves are vocal with a thousand recollections. And visions, as poetic eyes avow, hang on each leaf, and cling to every bough. Here I came fifteen years ago, a willing exile, and as I trod the lengthened greenswood by the low woodside, repeated the old line, 
my mind to me a kingdom is. I found it so then, before, and since, and shall I faint, now that I have poured out the spirit of that mind to the world, and treated many subjects with truth, with freedom and power, because I have been followed with one cry of abuse ever since, for not being a government tool. Here I returned a few years after to finish some works I had undertaken, doubtful of the event, but determined to do my best, and wrote that character of Millimant, which was once transcribed by fingers fairer than Aurora's, but no notice was taken of it, because I was not a government tool, and must be supposed devoid of taste and elegance by all who aspired to these qualities in their own persons. Here I sketched my account of that old honest Signor Orlando Friscobaldo, with which its fine, racy, acrid tone that old crab-apple Gifford would have relished or pretended to relish, had I been a government tool. Here, too, I have written table-talks without number, and as yet without a falling off, till now that they are nearly done, or I should not make this boast. I could swear, were they not mine, the thoughts in many of them are founded as the rock, free as air, the tone like an Italian picture. What then? Had the style been like polished steel, as firm and as bright, it would have availed me nothing, for I am not a government tool. I had endeavoured to guide the taste of the English people to the best old English writers, but I had said that English kings did not reign by right divine, and that his present majesty was descended from an elector of Hanover in the right line, and no loyal subject would after this look into Webster or Decker, because I had pointed them out. I had done something, more than any one except Schlegel, to vindicate the characters of Shakespeare's plays from the stigma of French criticism, but our anti-Jacobin and anti-Gallican writers soon found out that I had said and written that Frenchmen, Englishmen, men were not slaves by birthright. This was enough to damn the work. Such has been the head and front of my offending. While my friend Lee Hunt was writing The Descent of Liberty and strewing the march of the Allied sovereigns with flowers, I sat by the waters of Babylon and hung my harp upon the willows. I knew all along there was but one alternative, the cause of kings or of mankind. This I foresaw, this I feared, the world see it now, when it is too late. Therefore I lamented, and would take no comfort when the mighty fell, because we, all men, fell with him, like lightning from heaven, to grovel in the grave of liberty, in the sty of legitimacy. There is but one question in the hearts of monarchs, whether mankind are their property or not. There was but this one question in mine. I had made an abstract, metaphysical principle of this question. I was not the dupe of the voice of the charmers. By my hatred of tyrants, I knew what their hatred of the free-born spirit of man must be, of the semblance, of the very name of liberty and humanity. And while others bowed their heads to the image of the beast, I spat upon it and buffeted it, and made mouths at it, and pointed at it, and drew aside the veil that then half concealed it, but has been since thrown off, and named it by its right name, and it is not to be supposed that my having penetrated their mystery would go unrequited by those whose darling and whose delight the idol, half brute, half demon, was, and who were ashamed to acknowledge the image and superscription as their own. Two half-friends of mine, who would not make a whole one between them, agreed the other day that the indiscriminate, incessant abuse of what I write was mere prejudice and party spirit, and that what I do in periodicals and without a name does well, pays well, and is cried out upon in the top of the compass. It is this indeed that had saved my shallow skiff from quite foundering on Tory spite and rancour, for when people have been reading and approving an article in a miscellaneous journal, it does not do to say when they discover the author afterwards, whatever might have been the case before, it is written by a blockhead, 
and even Mr. Jordan recommends the volume of characteristics as an excellent little work, because it has no cabalistic name in the title page, and swears there is a first-rate article of forty pages in the last number of the Edinburgh from Geoffrey's own hand, though when he learns against his will that it is mine, he devotes three successive numbers of the Literary Gazette to abuse that strange article in the last number of the Edinburgh Review. Others who had not this advantage have fallen a sacrifice to the obloquy attached to the suspicion of doubting, or of being acquainted with any one who is known to doubt, the divinity of kings. Poor Keats paid the forfeit of this lese majesté with his health and life. What, though his verses were like the breath of spring and many of his thoughts like flowers, would this, with the circle of critics that beset a throne, lessen the crime of their having been praised in the examiner? The lively and most agreeable editor of that paper has in like manner been driven from his country and his friends who delighted in him for no other reason than having written the story of Rimini, and asserted ten years ago that the most accomplished prince in Europe was an Adonis of fifty. Return, Alpheus, the dread voice is past that shrunk thy streams. Return, Sicilian muse. I look out of my window and see that a shower has just fallen. The fields look green after it, and the rosy cloud hangs over the brow of the hill. A lily expands its petals in the moisture, dressed in its lovely green and white. A shepherd boy has just brought some pieces of turf with daisies and grass for his young mistress to make a bed for her skylark, not doomed to dip his wings in the dappled dawn. My cloudy thoughts draw off, the storm of angry politics has blown over. Mr. Blackwood, I am yours. Mr. Crocker, my service to you. Mr. T. Moore, I am alive and well. Really, it is wonderful how little the worse I am for fifteen years' wear and tear, how I came upon my legs again on the ground of truth and nature, and look abroad into universality, forgetting that there is any such person as myself in the world. I have let this passage stand, however critical, because it may serve as a practical illustration to show what authors really think of themselves when put upon the defence. I confess the subject has nothing to do with the title at the head of the essay. And as a warning to those who may reckon upon their fair portion of popularity as the reward of the exercise of an independent spirit and such talents as they possess. It sometimes seems at first sight as if the low scurrility and jargon of abuse by which it is attempted to overlay all common sense and decency by the tissue of lies and nicknames, everlastingly repeated and applied indiscriminately to all those who are not of the regular government party, was peculiar to the present time and the anomalous growth of modern criticism. But if we look back, we shall find the same system acted upon as often as power, prejudice, dullness, and spite found their account in playing the game into one another's hands, in decrying popular efforts, and in giving currency to every species of base metal that had their own conventional stamp upon it. The names of Pope and Dryden were assailed with daily and unsparing abuse, the epithet a. P. E. was levelled at the sacred head of the former, and if even men like those, having to deal with the consciousness of their own infirmities, and the insolence and spurns of wanton enmity, must have found it hard to possess their souls in patience, any living writer amidst such contradictory evidence can scarcely expect to retain much calm, steady conviction of its own merits, or build himself a secure reversion in immortality. However one may, in a fit of spleen and impatience, turn round and assert one's claims in the face of low-bred, hireling malice, I will here repeat what I set out with saying, that there never yet was a man of sense and proper spirit who would not decline, rather than court, a comparison with any of those names whose reputation he really emulates, 
who would not be sorry to suppose that any of the great heirs of memory had as many foibles as he knows himself to possess, and who would not shrink from including himself or being included by others in the same praise that was offered to long-established and universally acknowledged merits as a kind of profanation. Those who are ready to fancy themselves Raphaels and Homers are very inferior men indeed. They have not even an idea of the mighty names that they take in vain. They are as deficient in pride as in modesty, and have not so much as served an apprenticeship to a true and honourable ambition. They mistake a momentary popularity for lasting renown, and a sanguine temperament for the inspirations of genius. The love of fame is too high and delicate a feeling in the mind to be mixed up with realities. It is a solitary abstraction, the secret sigh of the soul. It is all one as we should love a bright particular star and think to wed it. A name fast anchored in the deep abyss of time is like a star twinkling in the firmament, cold, silent, distant, but eternal and sublime, and our transmitting one to posterity is as if we should contemplate our translation to the skies. If we are not contented with this feeling on the subject, we shall never sit in Cassiopeia's chair, nor will our names, studying Ariadne's crown or streaming with Berenice's locks, ever make the face of heaven so bright that birds shall sing and think it were not night. Those who are in love only with noise and show, instead of devoting themselves to a life of study, had better hire a booth at Bartlemy Fair, or march at the head of a recruiting regiment with drums beating and colours flying. It has been urged that however little we may be disposed to indulge the reflection at other times, or out of mere self-complacency, yet the mind cannot help being conscious of the effort required for any great work while it is about it, of the high endeavour and the glad success. I grant that there is a sense of power in such cases, with the exception before stated, but then this very effort and state of excitement engrosses the mind at the time and leaves it listless and exhausted afterwards. The energy we exert, or the high state of enjoyment we feel, puts us out of conceit with ourselves at other times. Compared to what we are in the act of composition, we seem dull, commonplace people, generally speaking, and what we have been able to perform is rather a matter of wonder than of self-congratulation to us. The stimulus of writing is like the stimulus of intoxication, with which we can hardly sympathize in our sober moments, when we are no longer under the inspiration of the demon, or when the virtue is gone out of us. While we are engaged in any work, we are thinking of the subject and cannot stop to admire ourselves, and when it is done, we look at it with comparative indifference. I will venture to say that no one but a pedant ever read his own works regularly through. They are not his, they are become mere words, waste paper, and have none of the glow, the creative enthusiasm, the vehemence and natural spirit with which he wrote them. When we have once committed our thoughts to paper, written them fairly out, and seen that they are right in the printing, if we are in our right wits, we have done with them forever. I sometimes try to read an article I have written in some magazine or review, for when they are bound up in a volume I dread the very sight of them, but stop after a sentence or two, and never recur to the task. I know pretty well what I have to say on the subject, and do not want to go to school to myself. It is the worst instance of the bis repetita crambe in the world. I do not think that even painters have much delight in looking at their works after they are done. While they are in progress, there is a great degree of satisfaction in considering what has been done or what is still to do, but this is hope, is reverie, and ceases with the completion of our efforts. I should not imagine Raphael or Correggio would have much pleasure in looking at their former works, though they might recollect the pleasure they had had in painting them, they might spy defects in them, 
for the idea of unattainable perfection still keeps peace with our actual approaches to it, and fancy that they were not worthy of immortality. The greatest portrait painter the world ever saw used to write under his pictures Titianus Faziebat, signifying that they were imperfect, and in his letter to Charles V, accompanying one of his most admired works, he only spoke of the time he had been about it. Anibal Caracci boasted that he could do like Titian and Correggio, and, like most boasters, was wrong. The greatest pleasure in life is that of reading, while we are young. I have had as much of this pleasure as perhaps anyone. As I grow older it fades, or else the stronger stimulus of writing takes off the edge of it. At present I have neither time nor inclination for it, yet I should like to devote a year's entire leisure to a course of the English novelists, and perhaps clap on that sly old knave, Sir Walter, to the end of the list. It is astonishing how I used formerly to relish the style of certain authors, at a time when I myself despaired of ever writing a single line. Probably this was the reason. It is not in mental as in natural ascent. Intellectual objects seem higher when we survey them from below than when we look down from any given elevation above the common level. My three favourite writers about the time I speak of were Burke, Junius and Rousseau. I was never weary of admiring and wondering at the felicities of the style, the turns of expression, the refinements of thoughts and sentiment. I laid the book down to find out the secret of so much strength and beauty, and took it up again in despair to read on and admire. So I passed whole days, months, and I may add years, and I have only this to say now, that as my life began, so I could wish that it may end. The last time I tasted this luxury in its full perfection was one day after a sultry day's walk in summer between Farnham and Alton. I was fairly tired out. I walked into an inn-yard, I think at a letter place. I was shown by the waiter to what looked at first like common outhouses at the other end of it, but they turned out to be a suit of rooms, probably a hundred years old. The one I entered opened into an old-fashioned garden, embellished with beds of lexpur and a leaden mercury. It was wainscoted, and there was a grave-looking, dark-coloured portrait of Charles II hanging over the tiled chimney-piece. I had love for love in my pocket and began to read. Coffee was brought in in a silver coffee-pot. The cream, the bread and butter, everything was excellent, and the flavour of Congreve's style prevailed over all. I prolonged the entertainment till a late hour, and relished this divine comedy better even than when I used to see it played by Miss Mellon as Miss Prue, Bob Palmer as Tattle, and Bannister as Honest Ben. This circumstance happened just five years ago, and it seems like yesterday. If I count my life so by lustres, it will soon glide away, yet I shall not have to repine if, while it lasts, it is enriched with a few such recollections. End of section 14Section 15 of The Plain Speaker. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Avai in November 2011. The Plain Speaker Opinions on Books, Men, and Things by William Hazlitt. Section 15. On the pleasure of hating. There is a spider crawling along the matted floor of the room where I sit, not the one which has been so well allegorized in the admirable lines to a spider, but another of the same edifying breed. He runs with heedless, hurried haste, he hobbles awkwardly towards me, he stops, 
he sees the giant shadow before him and at a loss whether to retreat or proceed meditates his huge foe but as i do not start up and seize upon the straggling caitiff as he would upon a hapless fly within his toils he takes heart and ventures on with mingled cunning impudence and fear as he passes me i lift up the matting to assist his escape am glad to get rid of the unwelcome intruder and shudder at the recollection after he is gone a child a woman a clown or a moralist a century ago would have crushed the little reptile to death my philosophy has got beyond that i bear the creature no ill will but still i hate the very sight of it the spirit of malevolence survives the practical exertion of it we learn to curb our will and keep our overt actions within the bounds of humanity long before we can subdue our sentiments and imaginations to the same mild tone we give up the external demonstration the brute violence but cannot part with the essence or principle of hostility we do not tread upon the poor little animal in question that seems barbarous and pitiful but we regard it with a sort of mystic horror and superstitious loathing it will ask another hundred years of fine writing and hard thinking to cure us of the prejudice and make us feel towards this ill-omened tribe with something of the milk of human kindness instead of their own shyness and venom nature seems the more we look into it made up of antipathies without something to hate we should lose the very spring of thought and action life would turn to a stagnant pool were it not ruffled by the jarring interests the unruly passions of men the white streak in our own fortunes is brightened or just rendered visible by making all around it as dark as possible so the rainbow paints its form upon the cloud is it pride is it envy is it the force of contrast is it weakness or malice but so it is that there is a secret affinity with a hankering after evil in the human mind and that it takes a perverse but a fortunate delight in mischief since it is a never-failing source of satisfaction pure good soon grows insipid once variety in spirit pain is a bitter sweet which never surfeits love turns with a little indulgence to indifference or disgust hatred alone is immortal do we not see this principle at work everywhere animals torment and worry one another without mercy children kill flies for sport every one reads the accidents and offences in a newspaper as the cream of the jest a whole town runs to be present at a fire and the spectator by no means exults to see it extinguished it is better to have it so but it diminishes the interest and our feelings take part with our passions rather than with our understandings men assemble in crowds with eager enthusiasm to witness a tragedy but if there were an execution going forward in the next street as mr burke observes the theatre would be left empty a strange cur in a village an idiot a crazy woman are set upon and baited by the whole community public nuisances are in the nature of public benefits how long did the pope the bourbons and the inquisition keep the people of england in breath and supply them with nicknames to vent their spleen upon had they done us any harm of late no but we have always a quantity of superfluous bile upon the stomach and we wanted an object to let it out upon how loth were we to give up our pious belief in ghosts and witches because we liked to persecute the one and frighten ourselves to death with the other it is not the quality so much as the quantity of excitement that we are anxious about we cannot bear a state of indifference and ennui the mind seems to abhor a vacuum as much as ever nature was supposed to do even when the spirit of the age that is the progress of intellectual refinement warring with our natural infirmities no longer allows us to carry our vindicative and headstrong humours into effect 
we try to revive them in description and keep up the old bugbears, the phantoms of our terror and our hate, in imagination. We burn Guy Fawkes in effigy, and the hooting and buffeting and maltreating that poor tattered figure of rags and straw makes a festival in every village in England once a year. Protestants and Papists do not now burn one another at the stake, but we subscribe to new editions of Fox's Book of Martyrs, and the secret of the success of the Scotch novels is much the same. They carry us back to the feuds, the heart burnings, the havoc, the dismay, the wrongs and the revenge of a barbarous age and people, to the rooted prejudices and deadly animosities of sects and parties in politics and religion, and of contending chiefs and clans in war and intrigue. We feel the full force of the spirit of hatred with all of them in turn. As we read, we throw aside the trammels of civilization, the flimsy veil of humanity. Off, you landings! The wild beast resumes its sway within us. We feel like hunting animals, and as the hound starts in his sleep and rushes on the chase in fancy, the heart rouses itself in its native lair and utters a wild cry of joy at being restored once more to freedom and lawless, unrestrained impulses. Everyone has his full swing or goes to the devil his own way. Here are no Jeremy Bentham panopticons, none of Mr. Owen's impassable parallelograms, Rob Roy would have spurned and poured a thousand curses on them, no long calculations of self-interest. The will takes its instant way to its object, as the mountain torrent flings itself over the precipice, the greatest possible good of each individual consists in doing all the mischief he can to his neighbour, that is charming and finds a sure and sympathetic chord in every breast. So Mr. Irving, the celebrated preacher, has rekindled the old, original, almost exploded hell-fire in the aisles of the Caledonian Chapel as they introduce the real water of the new river at Sadler's Wells, to the delight and astonishment of his fair audience. "'Tis pretty, though a plague, to sit and peep into the pit of Topfet, to play at snapdragon with flames and brimstone, it gives a smart electrical shock, a lively fillip to delicate constitutions, and to see Mr. Irving, like a huge titan, looking as grim and swarthy as if he had to forge tortures for all the damned. What a strange being man is! Not content with doing all he can to vex and hurt his fellows here, upon this bank and shoal of time, where one would think there were heartaches, pain, disappointment, anguish, tears, sighs and groans enough, the begotted maniac takes him to the top of the high peak of school divinity to hurl him down the yawning gulf of penal fire. His speculative malice asks eternity to wreak its infinite spite in and calls on the Almighty to execute its relentless doom. The cannibals burn their enemies and eat them in good fellowship with one another. Meek Christian divines cast those who differ from them by the hair's breadth, body and soul, into hell-fire for the glory of God and the good of his creatures. It is well that the power of such persons is not coordinate with their wills, Indeed, it is from the sense of their weakness and inability to control the opinions of others that they thus outdo termagant and endeavour to frighten them into conformity by big words and monstrous denunciations. The pleasure of hating, like a poisonous mineral, eats into the heart of religion and turns it to rankling spleen and bigotry. It makes patriotism an excuse for carrying fire, pestilence and famine into other lands. It leaves to virtue nothing but the spirit of censoriousness and the narrow, jealous, inquisitorial watchfulness over the actions and motives of others. What have the different sects, creeds, doctrines in religion been but so many pretexts set upon for men to wrangle, to quarrel, to tear one another in pieces about, like a target as a mark to shoot at? 
Does any one suppose that the love of country in an Englishman implies any friendly feeling or disposition to serve another bearing the same name? No, it means only hatred to the French or the inhabitants of any other country that we happen to be at war with for the time. Does the love of virtue denote any wish to discover or amend our own faults? No, but it atones for an obstinate adherence to our own vices by the most virulent intolerance to human frailties. This principle is of a most universal application. It extends to good as well as evil. If it makes us hate folly, it makes us no less dissatisfied with distinguished merit. If it inclines us to resent the wrongs of others, it impels us to be as impatient of their prosperity. We revenge injuries, we repay benefits with ingratitude. Even our strongest partialities and likings soon take this turn. That which was luscious as locusts, anon becomes bitter as colocintida, and love and friendship melt in their own fires. We hate old friends, we hate old books, we hate old opinions, and at last we come to hate ourselves. I have observed that few of those whom I have formerly known most intimate continue on the same friendly footing or combine the steadiness with the warmth of attachment. I have been acquainted with two or three knots of inseparable companions who saw each other six days in the week that have broken up and dispersed. I have quarrelled with almost all my old friends. They might say this is owing to my bad temper, but they have also quarrelled with one another. What is become of that set of whist players celebrated by Eliah in his notable Epistle to Robert Southey, Esquire, and now I think of it that I myself have celebrated in this very volume, that for so many years called Admiral Burney friend. They are scattered like last year's snow. Some of them are dead, or gone to live at a distance, or pass one another in the street like strangers, or, if they stop to speak, do it as coolly and try to cut one another as soon as possible. Some of us have grown rich, others poor. Some have got places under government, others a niche in the quarterly review. Some of us have dearly earned a name in the world, whilst others remain in their original privacy. We despise the one, and envy and are glad to mortify the other. Times are changed, we cannot revive our old feelings, and we avoid the sight and are uneasy in the presence of those who remind us of our infirmity, and put us upon an effort at seeming cordiality which embarrasses ourselves, and does not impose upon our quondam associates. Old friendships are, like meats served up repeatedly, cold, comfortless, and distasteful. The stomach turns against them. Either constant intercourse and familiarity breed a weariness and contempt, or, if we meet again after an interval of absence, we appear no longer the same. One is too wise, another too foolish, for us, and we wonder we did not find this out before. We are disconcerted and kept in a state of continual alarm by the wit of one, or tired to death of the dullness of another. The good things of the first, besides leaving stings behind them, by repetition grow stale and lose their startling effect, and the insipidity of the last becomes intolerable. The most amusing or instructive companion is at best like a favourite volume that we wish after a time to lay upon the shelf, but as our friends are not willing to be laid there, this produces a misunderstanding and ill blood between us. Or, if the zeal and integrity of friendship is not abated, nor its career interrupted by any obstacle arising out of its own nature, we look out for other subjects of complaint and sources of dissatisfaction. We begin to criticize each other's dress, looks, and general character. Such a one is a pleasant fellow, but it is a pity he sits so late. Another fails to keep his appointments, and that is a sore that never heals. We get acquainted with some fashionable young man or with a mistress, and wish to introduce our friend, 
but he is awkward and a sloven, the interview does not answer, and this throws cold water on our intercourse. Or he makes himself obnoxious to opinion, and we shrink from our own convictions on the subject as an excuse for not defending him. All or any of these causes mount up in time to a ground of coolness or irritation, and at last they break out into open violence as the only amends we can make ourselves for suppressing them so long, or the readiest means of banishing recollections of former kindness so little compatible with our present feelings. We may try to temper with the wounds or patch up the carcass of departed friendship, but the one will hardly bear the handling, and the other is not worth the trouble of embalming. The only way to be reconciled to old friends is to part with them for good. At a distance we may chance to be thrown back, in a waking dream, upon old times and old feelings. Or, at any rate, we should not think of renewing our intimacy till we have fairly spit our spite, or said, thought, and felt all the ill we can of each other. Or, if we can pick a quarrel with someone else and make him the scapegoat, this is an excellent contrivance to heal a broken bone. I think I must be friends with Lamb again, since he has written that magnanimous letter to Southey, and told him a piece of his mind. I don't know what it is that attaches me to H so much, except that he and I, whenever we meet, sit in judgment on another set of old friends, and carve them as a dish fit for the gods. There was Lee Hunt, John Scott, Mrs. Montagu, whose dark raven locks made a picturesque background to our discourse. B, who is grown fat and is, they say, married. Rickman. These had separated long ago, and their foibles are the common link that holds us together. We do not affect to condole or whine over their follies. We enjoy, we laugh at them, till we are ready to burst our sides, sans intermission, for hours by the dial. We serve up a chorus of anecdotes, traits, master strokes of character, and cut and hack at them till we are weary. Perhaps some of them are even with us. For my own part, as I once said, I like a friend the better for having faults that one can talk about. Then, said Mrs. Montagu, he will never cease to be a philanthropist. Those in question were some of the choice spirits of the age, not fellows of no mark or likelihood, and we so far did them justice, but it is well that they did not hear what we sometimes said of them. I care little what anyone says of me, particularly behind my back, and in the way of critical and analytical discussion. It is looks of dislike and scorn that I answer with the worst venom of my pen. The expression of the face wounds me more than the expression of the tongue. If I have in one instance mistaken this expression, or resorted to this remedy where I ought not, I am sorry for it. But the face was too fine over which it mantled, and I am too old to have misunderstood it. I sometimes go up to Hume's, and as often as I do, resolve never to go again. I do not find the old homely welcome. The ghost of friendship meets me at the door, and sits with me all dinner-time. They have got a set of fine notions and new acquaintance. Allusions to past occurrences are thought trivial, nor is it always safe to touch upon more general subjects. Age does not begin as he formerly did every five minutes, Fawcett used to say, etc. That topic is something worn. The girls are grown up and have a thousand accomplishments. I perceive there is a jealousy on both sides. They think I give myself airs, and I fancy the same of them. Every time I am asked, if I do not think Mr. Washington Irving a very fine writer, I shall not go again till I receive an invitation for Christmas Day in company with Mr. Liston. The only intimacy I never found to flinch or fade was a purely intellectual one. There was none of the cant of candor in it, none of the wine of mawkish sensibility. Our mutual acquaintance were considered merely as subjects of conversation and knowledge, not at all of affection. We regarded them no more in our experiments than mice in an air-pump, 
or, like malefactors, they were regularly cut down and given over to the dissecting knife. We spared neither friend nor foe. We sacrificed human infirmities at the shrine of truth. The skeletons of character might be seen, after the juice was extracted, dangling in the air like flies in cobwebs, or they were kept for future inspection in some refined acid. The demonstration was as beautiful as it was new. There is no surfeiting on gall, nothing keeps so well as a decoction of spleen. We grow tired of everything but turning others into ridicule and congratulating ourselves on their defects. We take a dislike to our favorite books, after a time, for the same reason. We cannot read the same works forever. Our honeymoon, even though we wed the muse, must come to an end, and is followed by indifference, if not by disgust. There are some works, those indeed that produce the most striking effect at first by novelty and boldness of outline, that will not bear reading twice, others of a less extravagant character, and that excite and repay attention by a greater nicety of details, have hardly interest enough to keep alive our continued enthusiasm. The popularity of the most successful writers operates to wean us from them, by the cant and fuss that is made about them, by hearing their names everlastingly repeated, and by the number of ignorant and indiscriminate admirers they draw after them. We as little like to have to drag others from their unmerited obscurity, lest we should be exposed to the charge of affectation and singularity of taste. There is nothing to be said respecting an author that all the world would have made up their minds about. It is a thankless as well as hopeless task to recommend one that nobody has ever heard of. To cry up Shakespeare as the god of our idolatry seems like a vulgar national prejudice, to take down a volume of Chaucer or Spencer or Beaumont and Fletcher or Ford or Marlowe has very much the look of pedantry and egotism. I confess it makes me hate the very name of fame and genius when works like these are gone into the wastes of time, while each successive generation of fools is busily employed in reading the trash of the day and women of fashion gravely join with their waiting maids in discussing the preference between the Paradise Lost and Mr. Moore's Loves of the Angels. I was pleased the other day on going into a shop to ask if they had any of the Scotch novels, to be told that they had just sent out the last Sir Andrew Wiley. Mr. Galt will also be pleased with this answer. The reputation of some books is raw and unaired, that of others is worm-eaten and mouldy. Why fix our affectations on that which we cannot bring ourselves to have faith in, or which others have long ceased to trouble themselves about? I am half afraid to look into Tom Jones, lest it should not answer my expectations at this time of day, and if it did not, I should certainly be disposed to fling it into the fire and never look into another novel while I lived. But surely it may be said there are some works that, like nature, can never grow old, and that must always touch the imagination and passions alike. Or there are passages that seem as if we might brood over them all our lives and not exhaust the sentiments of love and admiration they excite, they become favourites, and we are fond of them to a sort of dotage. Here is one. Sitting in my window, printing my thoughts in lawn, I saw a god, I thought, but it was you, enter our gates. My blood flew out and back again, as fast as I had puffed it forth and sucked it in like breath. Then was I called away in haste to entertain you. Never was a man thrust from a sheepcote to a sceptre, raised so high in thoughts as I. You left a kiss upon these lips then, which I mean to keep from you forever. I did hear you talk far above singing. A passage like this, indeed, leaves a taste on the palate like nectar, and we seem in reading it to sit with the gods at their golden tables. But if we repeat it often in ordinary moods, it loses its flavour, becomes vapid, 
the wine of poetry is drunk and but the lees remain or on the other hand if we call in the aid of extraordinary circumstances to set it off to advantage as the reciting it to a friend or after having our feelings excited by a long walk in some romantic situation or while we play with amaryllis in the shade or with the tangles of naira's hair we afterwards miss the accompanying circumstances and instead of transferring the recollection of them to the favourable side regret what we have lost and strive in vain to bring back the irrevocable hour wondering in some instances how we survive it and that the melancholy blank that is left behind the pleasure rises to its height in some moment of calm solitude or intoxicating sympathy declines ever after and from the comparison and a conscious falling off leaves rather a sense of satiety and irksomeness behind it is it the same in pictures i confess it is with all but those from titian's hand i don't know why but an air breathes from his landscapes pure refreshing as if it came from other years there is a look in his faces that never passes away i saw one the other day amidst the heartless desolation and glittering finery of font hill there is a portfolio of the dresden gallery it opens and a young female head looks from it a child yet woman grown with an air of rustic innocence and the graces of a princess her eyes like those of doves the lips about to open a smile of pleasure dimpling the whole face the jewels sparkling in her crisp hair her youthful shape compressed in a rich antique dress as the bursting leaves contain the april buds why do i not call up this image of gentle sweetness and place it as a perpetual barrier between mischance and me it is because pleasure asks a greater effort of the mind to support it than pain and we turn after a little idle dalliance from what we love to what we hate as to my old opinions i am heartily sick of them i have reason for they have deceived me sadly i was taught to think and i was willing to believe that genius was not a bawd that virtue was not a mask that liberty was not a name that love had its seat in the human heart now i would care little if these words were struck out of the dictionary or if i had never heard them they are become to my ears a mockery and a dream instead of patriots and friends of freedom i see nothing but the tyrant and the slave the people linked with kings to rivet on the chains of despotism and superstition i see folly join with knavery and together make up public spirit and public opinions i see the insolent tory the blind reformer the coward whig if mankind had wished for what is right they might have had it long ago the theory is plain enough but they are prone to mischief to every good work reprobate i have seen all that had been done by the mighty yearnings of the spirit and intellect of man of whom the world was not worthy and that promised a proud opening to truth and good through the vista of future years undone by one man with just glimmering of understanding enough to feel that he was a king but not to comprehend how he could be king of a free people i have seen this triumph celebrated by poets the friends of my youth and the friends of man but who were carried away by the infuriate tide that setting in from a throne bore down every distinction of right reasons before it and i have seen all those who did not join in applauding this insult and outrage on humanity proscribed hunted down they and their friends made a byword of so that it has become an understanding thing that no one can live by his talents or knowledge who is not ready to prostitute those talents and that knowledge to betray his species and prey upon his fellow men this was some time a mystery but the time gives evidence of it the echoes of liberty had awakened once more in spain and the morning of hope dawned again but that dawn has been overcast by the foul breath of bigotry and those reviving sounds stifled by fresh cries from the time-rent towers of the inquisition 
man yielding, as it is fit he should, first to brute force, but more to the innate perversity and dastard spirit of his own nature, which leaves no room for further hope or disappointment. And England, that arch-reformer, that heroic deliverer, that mouther about liberty and tool of power, stands gaping by, not feeling the blight and mildew coming over it, nor its very bones crack and turn to a paste under the grasp and circling folds of this new monster, legitimacy. In private life do we not see hypocrisy, servility, selfishness, folly and impudence succeed, while modesty shrinks from the encounter and merit is trodden underfoot? How often is the rose plucked from the forehead of a virtuous love to plant a blister there? What chance is there of the success of real passion? What certainty of its continuance? Seeing all this as I do, and unravelling the web of human life into its various threads of meanness, spite, cowardice, want of feeling and want of understanding, of indifference towards others and ignorance of ourselves, seeing custom prevail over all excellence, itself giving way to infamy, mistaken as I have been in my public and private hopes, calculating others from myself and calculating wrong, always disappointed where I placed most reliance, the dupe of friendship and the fool of love. Have I not reason to hate and despise myself? Indeed I do, and chiefly for not having hated and despised the world enough. Footnote the only exception to the general drift of this essay, and that is an exception in theory, I know of none in practice, is that in reading we always take the right side and make the case properly our own. Our imaginations are sufficiently excited, we have nothing to do with the matter but as a pure creation of the mind, and we therefore yield to the natural unwarped impression of good and evil. Our own passions, interests and prejudices out of the question or in an abstracted point of view, we judge fairly and conscientiously, for conscience is nothing but the abstract idea of right and wrong. But no sooner have we to act or suffer than the spirit of contradiction or some other demon comes into play, and there is an end of common sense and reason. Even the very strength of the speculative faculty, or the desire to square things with an ideal standard of perfection, whether we can or no, leads perhaps to half the absurdities and miseries of mankind. We are hunting after what we cannot find, and quarrelling with the good within our reach. Among the thousands that have read The Heart of Midlothian, there assuredly never was a single person who did not wish Jeanie Dean's success. Even gentle George was sorry for what he had done when it was over, though he would have played the same prank the next day and the unknown author, in this immediate character of contributor to Blackwood and the Sentinel, is about as respectable a personage as Daddy Ratton himself. On the stage, everyone takes part with Othello against Iago. Do boys at school, in reading Homer, generally side with the Greeks or Trojans? End footnote. End of section 15